The Plot Against the Church, by Morris Pinay, 1962, translated from the German and Spanish editions of the same work. Dedication, quote, to the Immaculate Heart of the Virgin Mary, Mother of God, to Saint Joseph, Protector of the Universal Church, to Saint Michael the Archangel, Prince of the Supernatural Host in the Struggle Against Satan, the First Naturalist, to Saint Thomas Aquinas, the Catholic Church's Teacher of Order, and to Saint Anthony of Padua, Hammer of the Heretics. Unquote. Quote, in our time more than ever before, the chief strength of the wicked lies in the cowardice and weakness of good men. All the strength of Satan's reign is due to the easygoing weakness of Catholics. Oh! If I might ask the Divine Redeemer, as the Prophet Zachary did in spirit, what are those wounds in the midst of thy hands? The answer would not be doubtful, with these was I wounded in the house of them that loved me. I was wounded by my friends, who did nothing to defend me, and who, on every occasion, made themselves the accomplices of my adversaries. And this reproach can be leveled at the weak and timid Catholics of all countries." Unquote. Pope St. Pius X, discourse he pronounced on December 13, 1908 at the beatification of Joan of Arc. Quote, o most powerful patriarch, St. Joseph, patron of that universal church which has always invoked thee in anxieties and tribulations from the lofty seat of thy glory lovingly regard the Catholic world. Let it move thy paternal heart to see the mystical spouse of Christ and his vicar weakened by sorrow and persecution by powerful enemies. We beseech thee, by the most bitter suffering thou didst experience on earth, to wipe away in mercy the tears of the revered pontiff, to defend and liberate him, and to intercede with the giver of peace and charity, that every hostile power being overcome and every error being destroyed, the whole Church may serve the God of all blessings in perfect liberty. Amen." Unquote. Leo 13. March 4, 1882 Note to the online edition. The English translation of the Complot contra la Iglesia is not as polished as one would like. Whilst the rendering of many passages may at times appear rather quaint, it often borders on the incoherent. We have remedied some of the more obvious defects and obscure passages, in consultation with the original Spanish edition, and hope that the extraordinary contents of this book will encourage readers to overlook the many that remain, lest readers be deterred from continuing their reading by the long, indigestible lists of communist personnel found in chapters 2 and 3 of part 1. We have relegated much of this material to an appendix, as per the original Spanish edition and have presented the remainder in smaller typeface to indicate its secondary reference-like nature. Timothy Peter Johnson, March 17, 2006 Introduction to the American Edition This historically important book will, in all probability, be attacked as being anti-Semitic. Let nobody be led astray or distracted, however, from a serious and scientific consideration of the incontrovertible facts here set out. We are concerned with a major factor of history, and more especially of the history of the Christian Church. No crude, negative and destructive anti-Semitism comes into question. That the Jews have played a tremendous and not always beneficial role in the whole story of mankind is obvious, that their activities were not always friendly to Christianity and to the non-Jewish peoples is equally obvious and there is an enormous fund of evidence from Jewish as well as other sources of unshakable authority to prove this. This work of great erudition displays not alone a knowledge of events past, but shows also that its compilers had had knowledge of events to come in some immensely important respects, as readers will see from the foreword to a German language edition, the first edition of this work, in Italian began by stating that its authors knew that the purpose of calling the Second Vatican Council was to persuade it to declare that the Jews were not responsible for the crucifixion of our Savior, that is, they were not guilty of deicide, and this book appeared before the first session of the Council. Subsequently, as forecast, this proposal was put forward, great pressures were applied to get it accepted, and something, even if diluted, was agreed upon at the end. Now it cannot be denied, even apart from the essence of the proposal itself, that the fact that any Jews, however representative or otherwise of most of their co-religionists and co-racialists, 
could do what they had done at the very highest levels of the Catholic Church, is a matter of tremendous significance to Catholics and all others, even to non-Christians. And not only was it possible to find men at the summit of the hierarchy to further this project, but the Council appeared to contain a large number of bishops who, at the very least, did not seem to understand the importance of the problem. None can sit in judgment on those concerned, it is understandable that the Jews want to improve their image, especially as they have the power to do so. The lessons to be drawn are, surely, not that the Jews as such or any who have been misled should be the objects of severe criticism, but that the facts, the truth concerning all matters of great importance, and especially when they affect the purity and influence of the Church, should be made widely known. In this all churches should help with a sense of urgency. However, it should be pointed out to the Jews concerned that instead of trying to improve their reputation and increase their influence by fostering deceptions and attacking basic Christian traditions, they would serve their own true interests best by first setting their own hearts and attitude toward others aright. Again and again they have overreached themselves over the centuries, and then complained at the results for which they alone were responsible. In particular, this recent initiative in Rome has merely served to draw the attention of intelligent and decent men to a matter of immediate concern to all. It is the obvious duty of all who may read this book to make its contents known and to encourage all their friends to acquire, read and spread it. The Editor. St. Anthony Press, Los Angeles, California, February 15, 1967. Introduction to the Italian Edition. The most infamous conspiracy is in progress against the Church. Her enemies are working to destroy the most holy traditions and thus to introduce dangerous and evil intended reforms, such as those Calvin, Zwingli and other false teachers once attempted. They manifest a hypocritical zeal to modernize the Church and to adapt it to the present-day situation, but in reality they conceal the secret intention of opening the gates to communism to hasten the collapse of the free world and to prepare the further destruction of Christianity. All this it is intended to put into effect at the coming Vatican Council. We have proofs of how everything is being planned in secret agreement with the leading forces of communism, of world Freemasonry and of the secret power directing these. It is intended to first carry out a probe and to begin with the reforms which encounter less resistance from the defenders of Holy Church, in order to then gradually extend the range as weakening resistance allows this. In addition, we have confirmation of what will still be unbelievable for those who are not initiated, namely that the anti-Christian forces have at their disposal, in the ranks of church dignitaries, a veritable fifth column of agents who are the unconditional tools of communism and of the secret power directing it. For it has been revealed that those cardinals, archbishops and bishops, who form a kind of progressive wing within the council, will attempt to bring about a breakthrough shameful reforms, whereby the good faith and the eagerness for progress of many devout council fathers will be deceived. The assurance has been given that the progressive bloc forming at the beginning of the Synod will be able to count upon the support of the Vatican, in which, so it is said, those anti-Christian forces possess influence. This appears unbelievable to us and sounds more like boastful arrogance by the enemies of the Church than sober reality. However, we mention this, so that one sees how far the enemies of Catholicism and of the free world risk revealing themselves. Apart from the dangerous reforms in the doctrine of the Church and her traditional policy which stand in open contradiction to what was approved by the preceding popes and ecumenical councils, it is desired that the excommunication bulls uttered by His Holiness Pope Pius XII against the Communists and their lackeys be declared nullified. In this manner the effort is made to establish a peaceful coexistence with the Communists, which on the one side would be harmful to the regard for Holy Church in the eyes of Christians who fight against materialistic and atheistic Communism and on the other side weaken the morale of these fighters, hasten their defeat and would have as a consequence dissolution in their own ranks, in order in such a way to ensure the worldwide triumph of red totalitarianism. Concern is taken that Protestants and Orthodox are in no way invited who fight heroically against communism, but rather more only those churches and church councillors who stand under the influence of Freemasonry, of communism and the secret power directing them. In this manner the Freemasons and communists disguised in priestly robes, 
who have usurped the leading posts in such churches, work together concealed and in a subtle way, but also very effectively, with their accomplices who have infiltrated into the Catholic clergy. On its side the Kremlin has already decided to refuse known anti-communist prelates an exit visa, and only to allow their unconditional agents or those who, without being the latter, have bowed out of fear of red reprisals, to travel from the satellite states. Thus at the Second Vatican Council the Church will experience the silence of those who could defend her best of all and could enlighten the Holy Synod concerning what takes place in the communist world. This will undoubtedly seem incredible to those who read it, but the events at the Holy Ecumenical Council will open their eyes and convince them that we are speaking the truth. For it is there that the enemy intends to play a trump card, whereby it, so we are assured, will have on its side unconditional accomplices among the highest church dignitaries. A further disastrous plan, which is being prepared, is that the church shall contradict itself, so as a result to sacrifice its regard with the faithful, for later it will be broadcast that an institution which contradicts itself cannot be divine. With this proof they wish to desolate the churches and achieve that the faithful lose their confidence in the clergy and abandon them. It is intended to cause the church to declare that what it has represented for centuries as bad, is now good. Among such maneuvers spun for this purpose one particularly stands out on account of its importance, and refers in fact to the conduct of Holy Church towards the damned Jews, as St. Augustine calls them, and this in reference both to those who nailed Christ to the cross, as also to their descendants, who are both archenemies of Christianity, the unanimous doctrine of the great church fathers that unanimous consensus patron which the church regards as a source of faith, condemned the unbelieving Jews and declared the struggle against them to be good and necessary. For example, in this struggle, participated, as we will prove by means of irrefutable evidence, the following saints, Saint Ambrose, Bishop of Milan, Saint Jerome, Saint Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, Saint John Chrysostom, Saint Athanasius, Saint Gregory of Natsanzis, Saint Basil, Saint Cyril of Alexandria, Saint Isidore of Seville, Saint Bernhard and even Tertullian as well as Regen, the latter two during the period of their indisputable orthodoxy. In addition, the Church fought energetically for nineteen centuries against the Jews, as we will likewise prove by means of reliable documents, and among which are found the following, papal bulls, protocols of the ecumenical and provincial councils as well as the highly renowned Fourth Lateran Council and many others, the teachings of St. Thomas of Aquinas, of Duns Scotus and of the most important doctors of the Church. In addition we will quote Jewish sources of indisputable authenticity, like the official encyclopedias of Jewry, the works of famous rabbis as well as of the most well-known Jewish historians. The Jewish Freemasonic and Communist plotters now have the intention at the coming council of utilizing, as they assert, the lack of knowledge of most clergy concerning the true history of the Church, to execute a surprise coup by adopting the standpoint at the assembled Holy Ecumenical Council that anti-Semitism must be condemned, as well as every struggle against the Jews who, as we will elaborate, are the wire pullers of Freemasonry and of international communism. They would like the infamous Jews, whom the Church has regarded as evil for the course of nineteen centuries, to be declared good and beloved of God. As a result the unanimous consensus patrum would be contradicted, which laid down exactly the opposite, as well as what also found its expression through various papal bulls and canons of ecumenical as well as provincial councils. Since the Jews and their accomplices pillory every struggle within the Catholic Church against the wickedness of the former, as well as the plots directed against Christ our Lord, as anti-Semitism, we will likewise reveal in this book that Christ himself, the Gospels and the Catholic Church can be included among the sources of anti-Semitism, since they campaigned for nearly two thousand years against those who denied their Messiah. With the condemnation of anti-Semitism, which at times is called anti-Semitic racialism, it is wished to attain that His Holiness the Pope and the Assembled Council in condemnation of anti-Semitism experience the catastrophic event that the Church contradicts itself, and therefore, without giving account to this, silently also condemn Christ our Lord Himself, as well as the Holy Gospels, the Church Fathers and most Popes, among them Gregory VII, Hildebrand, Innocent II, Innocent III, Pius V, 
and Leo XIII, who as we will show in this book, have fought bitterly against the Jews and the synagogue of Satan. With such condemnation it would be successful to simultaneously place countless church councils in the dock, among them the ecumenical councils of Nicaea and the second, third and fourth Lateran councils, whose canons we will subject in this book to a thorough investigation, and which carried on an energetic struggle against the Hebrews. To put it in few words, the infamous plotters have the scheme in mind that Holy Church, by its condemning anti-Semitism, condemns itself, whereby one can easily amplify the disastrous consequences. It was already attempted at the last Vatican Council, even if in disguised form, to alter course in the traditional doctrine of the Church, when it was successful by means of a surprise maneuver and lasting pressure, to influence countless Church Fathers to sign an apostolate in favor of the Jews. Misusing the apostolic zeal of the devout prelates, it was first spoken of a summons to conversion of the Israelites, which regarded from the theological viewpoint as an intention without fault, but later they inoculated the secret poison in form of assertions, which, as we will reveal in the course of this work, stand in open contradiction to the doctrine which Holy Church has laid down in this respect. But upon this occasion, when the synagogue of Satan believed it had secured the approval of the postulate on the part of the Council, God, who always stands by his Church, prevented the mystical body of Christ from contradicting itself and fructifying the plots of its thousand years old enemy. The Franco-Prussian War broke out unexpectedly. Napoleon had to hastily withdraw the troops protecting the pontificate, and the army of Victor Emmanuel prepared to take Rome. Therefore the First Holy Vatican Council had to be hastily dissolved, and the prelates returned to their dioceses, before a general discussion concerning the postulate in question was able to be begun. This was, however, not the first time that divine providence held up such a misfortune by means of something extraordinary. History shows us that it has done it in numerous cases, whereby it mostly made use of the popes and devout prelates as its medium. Among the latter we include Saint Athanasius, Saint Cyril of Alexandria, Saint Lee Nero, Cardinal Amerco, and even such humble monks as Saint Bernhard or Saint John of Capistrinus. In other cases than those previously mentioned, it even made use of ambitious monarchs, as the example of Victor Emmanuel, the King of Italy, reveals. When in the middle of the past year we experienced how the enemy was preparing renewed attempts to unleash a plot which would open the gates to communism, prepare the collapse of the free world and deliver Holy Church into the claws of the synagogue of Satan, we began, without losing any time, to collect documents and to write the following work which is intended to be not so much a book with a certain disputed tendency, but rather an ordered summary of council records papal bulls and all kinds of documents and sources, from which we leave out those whose reliability or truthfulness is doubtful, and select those which possess indisputable truth. In this book, not only is the plot uncovered which communism and the synagogue of Satan have entered upon against the Second Vatican Council, but also the preceding conspiracies, which were recorded in the course of nineteen centuries as cases of precedence, are subject to a thorough illumination. For what is intended to occur at the new assembled Holy Synod, has already occurred repeatedly in the past centuries. In order to grasp what will occur to the full extent, it is therefore essential to know the cases of precedence as well as the nature of that hostile fifth column infiltrated into the bosom of the clergy. This purpose is served by the extensive investigation of the fourth part, which rests upon a faultless proof of sources. Since in addition attention is drawn to the possibility that the Holy See and the Second Vatican Council might abandon certain traditions of the Church in order to grant aid to the triumph of communism and of Freemasonry, we lay at basis of the two first parts of this work minute study, whereby we cite the two most serious sources concerning what one can call the quintessence of Freemasonry and of atheistic communism, and investigate the nature of the secret power directing it. Even if the fourth part of this book is the most important, then nevertheless the first three and above all the third make comprehensible the plot threatening Holy Church in its entire circumference. This plot is not restricted to its activity during the coming Universal Synod but extends far more to the entire feature of the Church. For the enemy has already calculated that, 
if for some reasons at the Holy Synod strong defensive forces awaken against its planned reforms and these should bring about the failure of its intentions at the Second Vatican Council, it will use at a later point any kind of opportunity to return to its plan in which respect it would know how to utilize the strong influence which it pretends to have with the Holy See. We are naturally convinced of the fact that, in spite of the intrigues of the enemy, the support which God always grants his church will also cause their criminal machinations to fail this time. It is also written, the powers of hell shall not triumph over it. Unfortunately, in writing this very documentary book, we have used more than 14 months and there remain only two until the opening of the Second Vatican Council. God will help us to overcome all resistance, in order to have ready the printing of this work either by the beginning of the Synod or at least before the enemy can cause the first harm. Though we are also aware that the Lord God will not permit a catastrophe, nevertheless we must keep before our eyes what an outstanding saint expressed, that, although we know that all depends upon God, we should nevertheless act as if everything depended upon us. And as St. Bernard said in a similar grave crisis to that of the present, pray to God and hit out with the stick. Rome, the 31st of August 1962. The Author Forward to the Austrian edition. Due to the numerous requests that have reached us from the ranks of the Austrian and German clergy, we have decided to print the Austrian edition of the book Plot Against the Church. The fathers of the Second Vatican Council, to whom this work was dedicated, had occasion to establish in the course of the Holy Synod that our warning voice with regard to the existence of a veritable plot against the most holy traditions of the Church and its defensive powers in the face of atheistic communism found their full justification through the course of the first part of the Holy Council. This shows that our assertions correspond to a tragic truth. The events of the coming month will provide our readers with the confirmation that our revelations rest upon an incredible but regrettable reality. The enemies of the Church renewed the attempt at the first sitting of the world embracing Synod, by means of their accomplices in the high clergy, to abnegate or to narrow the tradition of the Church and its character as a source of revelation. This had already been striven for before them by the Waldenses, the Hussites and other medieval heretics, as well as later by Calvin. Zwingli and additional false teachers, only that this time all this is fought for under the cloak of the high ideal, inspiring us all, of Christian unity, whereas the heretics of those times cited for substantiation of the same thesis further diverse and sophistic arguments. To attempt that the Church deny the tradition of its character as a source of doctrine and to admit such an attribute only to the Holy Bible, more or less equates to the intention of causing it to contradict itself. This would accordingly mean that that which had been maintained for almost twenty centuries to be white was now declared to be black, and in fact with the devastating result that the mystical body of Christ, on grounds of contradiction, would forfeit its respect in the eyes of the faithful, since indeed an institution that contradicts itself in its essence can with difficulty be called divine. A step of this kind would bring Holy Church into such an impossible situation that it could not be justified through the wishful image of the longed-for Christian unity, whose realization at the moment would be very problematical. But should this dream become fact upon such an absurd basis, then this would signify that Holy Church recognizes it has been caught up in error and its faithful would as a result turn in masses to Protestantism whose essential postulate has always been from of old to recognize solely and alone the Bible as the source of true revelation and to refuse such a character to the tradition of the Catholic Church. It is incomprehensible that the enemies of Catholicism and their accomplices in the high clergy have possessed the audacity to go so far. This also proves that what was prophesied in our book written before the Holy Council has found its confirmation through the launching of the same and that the enemy possessed infiltrated accomplices in the high clergy, who occupied the highest positions. As we in fact learned from well-informed sources, upon appearance of this book and after its distribution among the Council Fathers, the enemies first made a halt from bringing before the Council more daring proposals which apart from the program of the day they had kept in readiness for the last few days of the council. Among such proposals was found that which had the aim of demanding the lifting of the excommunication bulls directed by Pope Pius XII against the communists and their lackeys, as likewise the establishing of a peaceful coexistence between church and communism, 
and finally the condemnation of anti-Semitism. This step in retreat, which was forced by reason of the accusation in this book, may only be of partial duration. It is hoped that a careful propaganda worked out an agreement with the Kremlin will soften the resistance of those defending Holy Church in favor of the setting up of a peaceful coexistence with atheistic communism. It is intended to attempt to weaken the defensive powers of the Church and of the free world, in which the support of the Red Dictator can be relied upon, who in return would release the prelates imprisoned for many years, address letters of good wishes to His Holiness the Pope and display further signs of visible friendship towards the Church. All this in order to bring weighty arguments in favor of the accomplices of the Kremlin, who have infiltrated into the high clergy, to give power to a lifting of the excommunication bulls, and to bring about a pact of the Holy See with Communism. In alliance with certain accomplices, who have nested themselves in the highest spheres of the Vatican, it is even planned in Moscow to take up diplomatic relations between Holy Church and the atheistic as well as materialistic Soviet state under the pretense that, as a result, an easing of the religious persecution in Russia could be introduced. In reality it is the aim of the Kremlin and its agents from the ranks of the Church hierarchy to demoralize the Catholics as well as the heroic clergy who in Europe and the rest of the world fight heroically against communism in that they wish to provide the impression that the latter are in fact not so bad, after the Holy See has decided to take up diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union and other communist states. It is therefore also intended to cripple the fighting spirit of the North American anti-communists, for through this step they would see themselves weakened in their struggle against the dark forces, which seek to draw even the United States into the communist chaos. In a word it is intended as we have already made clear in the introduction to the Italian edition, to cripple the defensive powers of the free world and to level the way for the final triumph of atheistic Marxism. But the arrogance of communism, of Freemasonry and of the Jews goes so far that they already speak of bringing the next papal election under their control with the intention of placing one of their accomplices in the distinguished college of cardinals on the throne of St. Peter. Therefore they intend, with aid of the influence that they claim to have in the Vatican, to exercise pressure upon His Holiness the Pope, whose health is under much strain, in order to get him to appoint a large number of new cardinals, even if the latter should exceed the highest number provided for. In this manner they will attain the necessary number of supporters, which is intended to secure the election of a pontifex who will transform Holy Church into a satellite in the service of communism. Freemasonry and the Synagogue of Satan. But the forces of the Antichrist do not reckon with the support which our Lord God will grant to his church, in order to prevent that such a maneuver gains upper hand. It suffices to recall that this is not the first time in history that such an attempt has been experienced. As we prove in this book by means of undoubtedly authentic documents, it was successful for the powers of the devilish dragon to enthrone a cardinal as pope who was directed by the forces of Satan and at times made it seem as though the latter might be the lords of the church. Christ, our Lord, who has never abandoned his church, provided, however, such devout men as Saint Bernard, Saint Norbert, Cardinal Amerco, the fathers of the councils of Edhams, Reims and Pisa as well as those of the Second Ecumenical Lateran Council with the courage to act and arm their hands. They all divested Cardinal Pierleone, this wolf in sheep's clothing who for many years was able to usurp the throne of St. Peter, of his papal dignity, excommunicated him and attributed to him the role of anti-pope, which fitted him. The plans of the Kremlin, of Freemasonry and of the Synagogue of Satan are, however advanced they may seem, nevertheless nullified by the visible hand of God. For as in all times men will arise like Saint Athanasius, Saint John Chrysostom, Saint Bernard and Saint John Capistrinus, who hold firm to the inspiration and strength which Christ, our Lord, chooses to provide them with, in order in this or that form to cause the disastrous plot to fail, which once again the dark forces of the Antichrist instigate to aid to victory the worldwide triumph of totalitarian imperialism from Moscow. We saw ourselves compelled, in the first Italian edition, to leave out eleven chapters of the fourth part from this book, and in fact by reason of the haste we had to distribute this work among the fathers of the Second Vatican Council, before the beast could cast forth the first blows of its paws. 
But since we have more time at our disposal in the printing of this edition, we have added the 11 chapters in question, which are of fundamental importance for the better understanding of the devilish plot that threatens Holy Church in our days. Preface to the German edition. The following book was compiled by a group of idealists, who are Catholics of strict belief and who, as Catholics, firmly believe that the Catholic Church is now passing through one of the most dangerous periods in its history. In order to reveal, what dangers threaten the Catholic Church, in particular from international communism and also from other international organizations, this idealist group undertook the enormous task of compiling and editing this book, using numerous documents from the Middle Ages and recent times. The Italian edition has already appeared and is already in the hands of the high clergy and other interested parties. Editions in other languages are in preparation. The authors believe that it is vital that the German Catholic Church has this work in its hands, in order from the documents summarized in this work to be able to gain authentic information concerning historical facts from the struggle and life of the Catholic Church. The authors must beg forgiveness that it was not possible to once again edit the German work stylistically. They know that the style in many chapters leaves much to be desired, and that repetitions also occur, which could have been prevented. The authors can only promise their highly esteemed readers that all these faults will be avoided in an eventual new edition. But they hope, nevertheless, that this work will find recognition and interest, and that their idealistic and selfless work for the well-being of our Catholic Church at least succeeds in informing the German leaders of the Catholic Church about historical facts that are certainly completely unknown to the public. Madrid, 1963. The Authors Introduction to the Spanish Edition. A sensational book. The facts confirm that the term sensational applied to the book plot against the Church, Complot contra la Iglesia, is not exaggerated. Following the first Italian edition, distributed in the fall of 1962 among the fathers of the Second Vatican Council, the press of different countries of the world began to make commentaries on this book, the reading of which is of capital importance not only for Catholics, but also for all free men. It can be stated without fear of exaggeration that no book in the present century has been the object of so many commentaries in the world press. Virulently unfavorable were those of communist newspapers and those controlled by Masons or Jews, and extremely favorable were those commentaries of some Catholic newspapers, which are independent of those obscure forces, and which have had, in addition, the courage and the possibility to express their points of view freely. Even one year after the distribution of the first Italian edition in the Vatican Council, the press of different countries of the world is still occupied with this extraordinary book, a thing truly unusual in matters of publicity. In order that the reader may be informed of the importance of this work, we quote here some interesting paragraphs that the Rome correspondent of the Catholic newspaper Agora of Lisbon, edition of March 1, 1963, page 7, tells his readers. Quote, we are going to refer to a publication which came out some time ago in Rome. In addition to other information, we were able to obtain a copy of this book, which in two months became a bibliographic rarity. The book was printed in a Roman publishing house, but when the present authorities in Italy, the Christian Democrats, favorable to Marxism, took note of its publication, the copies of the thick volume of 617 pages had already been distributed among the fathers of the Ecumenical Council, a fact which produced alarm, both in the Vatican government as well as in the diplomatic world and in parties of the left. For several days the printing house was visited by the highest police authorities, who obtained only the statement that the printing of the book had been ordered and that the cost of the edition had been paid in full. The leftist press attacked it furiously. The exceptional importance of the book resides principally in one fundamental element, and that is, whether the book has one or several authors, any person of elemental culture can divine that the compilation has been made by clerics. Naturally, the most diverse versions have appeared in respect to this matter. There are those that affirm that they, the authors, were Italian prelates, in collaboration, 
with elements of English Catholicism, others speak of a group of priests including some bishops from an unidentified country of Southern America. This work, because of the enormous importance of its scrupulous, erudite, and minutely detailed documentation, is not just one more of those products of anti-Semitism based on the protocols of the learned elders of Zion, which are in no way used in the book, in conclusion, in the pages, in the arguments, and in the style of the book, is revealed. The presence of Catholic clerics, in battle against the eternal heresy, which has always tended to subvert the religious, ethical, and historical bases of Catholicism, employing successively Simon the magician, Arius, Nestor, the Albigenses, and in the present day the leftists of the Ecumenical Council. Unquote. So much for the quotations of the interesting commentary made about the plot against the Church by the Catholic Portuguese newspaper Agora. Nevertheless, the version predominant in Rome as in the world press, is that the sensational book was prepared by no more or less than distinguished elements of the Roman Curia, which is, as is known, the supreme government of the Church, auxiliary of His Holiness the Pope in the highest functions. It is repeatedly affirmed that the work the plot against the Church is one of the greatest efforts of the Roman Curia to cause the destruction of those reforms which the left wing of the Catholic clergy is attempting to bring about, reforms which, if realized, would completely subvert the bases on which the Holy Church rests. There are newspapers which have been even more explicit, which affirm that it was the so-called syndicate of cardinals who prepared the book. It is necessary to explain that the Masons, the Communists, and their accomplices have given the name Syndicate of Cardinals to the heroic group of cardinals of the Roman Curia who are struggling in the Second Vatican Council to prevent a group of the clergy, which in a strange manner is found at the service of Masonry and Communism, from imposing on the Holy Synod a whole series of theses, subversive, and some heretical, designed to cause the ruin of the Church. Such ruin will never be consummated, because it is written, The gates of hell shall not prevail against her although the Apocalypse of St. John also prophesizes that such infernal forces will achieve great temporal triumphs, after which they will be conquered and destroyed. So as not to prolong this prologue, we will only transcribe in continuation that which an important Latin American newspaper has to say regarding Masonic and Communist tendencies. We refer to the weekly team po published in Mexico City by Mr. Martin Luis Guzman, a distinguished hierarch of Masonry who says in referring to the bishops called progressive, the rebellion of the bishops was considered as the beginning of heresy by Ottaviani and other cardinals of the syndicate. Even the possibility that the council would depose the pope if it considered him a heretic, was mentioned in La Servitor Romana. The syndicate, of cardinals, then published, in October 1962, a libel entitled Plot Against the Church, having the pseudonym Morris Pinai. Number 1119, Volume 13, Page 60, October 14, 1963. So much for the comment of the above-mentioned newspaper. What gives this book definite, provable worth is that it deals with a magnificent and imposing compilation of documents and sources of undeniable importance and authenticity, which demonstrates with no room for doubt the existence of a great conspiracy which the traditional enemies of the Church have prepared against Holy Catholic Church, and against the free world. These, enemies, are attempting to convert Catholicism into a blind instrument in the service of Communism, Masonry, and Judaism, in order to weaken free humanity with it and to facilitate its ruin and, with this ruin, the definite victory of atheistic Communism. The most useful instruments in this conspiracy are those Catholic clergymen who, betraying Holy Church, attempt to destroy her most loyal defenders, while at the same time they assist, in every way they can, Communists, Masons and Jews in their subversive activities. In this edition, we attempt to alert not only Catholics, but also all of the anti-Communists of Venezuela and of Latin America, so that they may realize the grave dangers which at present threaten not only the Catholic Church, but Christianity and the free world in general and so that they may offer all their support to that deserving group of cardinals, 
archbishops and bishops who are now fighting in the Vatican Council and in their respective countries against the external and internal enemies of the Holy Church and of the free world, those enemies which, with satanic perseverance, are trying to destroy the most sacred traditions of Catholicism, and to submerge us and our children in frightful communist slavery. The Editor, Caracas, Venezuela, December 15, 1963 Part 1. The Secret Driving Force of Communism. Chapter 1. Communism as Destroyer. Of all revolutionary systems, which throughout human history have been devised for the destruction of our civilized values, communism is without doubt the most perfected, most efficient and most merciless. In fact it represents the most advanced epoch of the world revolution, in whose postulates it therefore not only acts to destroy a definite political, social, economic or moral institution, but also simultaneously to declare null and void the Holy Catholic Church as well as all cultural and Christian manifestations which represent our civilization. All revolutionary currents of Jewish origin have attacked Christianity in its different aspects with particular one-mindedness. Communism, spawned from the same revolutionary stream of thought, seeks to banish Christianity for the purpose of causing it to vanish from the face of the earth without even the slightest trace remaining. The destructive fury of this satanic striving, which brings before the eyes of the world the most terrible pictures of terror and destruction which are possible to imagine, can only be based on the essence of nihilism and the most evil, hateful rejection of everything hitherto existing. For otherwise, one would not be able to understand the indescribable insanity of its criminal acts and the spirit of destruction, of annihilation, of insult of contradiction and of resistance by its leading personalities against everything, which represents fundamental features not only of Catholicism but of religion in general. The purpose of communism is, as we have indeed seen in Russia and in the other lands where it has been introduced, none other than to enslave the people in the economic, political, social, human and superhuman sense, in order to make possible a minority rule through violence. From an international aspect, the goal cannot be clearer. To attain through violence world domination by an insignificant minority, which destroys the rest of humanity by means of materialism, terror and, if necessary, by death, completely indifferent to whether in the process the enormous majority of the population must be murdered. The urge to murder, which has characterized the leading Soviet personages, is known well throughout the world. There are few, who upon learning of the bloody purges, which have been undertaken by the Marxists in Russia, will not be seized by shudders of horror. One needs only to recall a few details to fill the most stout hearts with fear and alarm. In its beginnings the Red Terror strove above all to exterminate the Russian intelligentsia. One is proof of this assertion sp. Melganu affirms the following, in which he refers to the special committees, which appeared in Russia in the first period of the Social Revolution. The special committees are not organs of law, but of merciless extermination according to the decisions of the Communist Central Committee. The special committee is neither a commission of investigation nor a court of justice, but itself determines its own powers. It is an instrument of battle, which acts on the internal front of the civil war. It does not pardon whoever stands on the other side of the barricades, but kills them. It is not difficult to form ideas of how in reality this extermination proceeds, when in place of the nullified legal code only the revolutionary experience and conscience command. This conscience is subjective and experience allows complete free play to the will, which always, according to the position of the judge, takes on more or less furious forms. Let us not carry on war against individual persons dash wrote Latsis, but let us exterminate the bourgeoisie as a class. Do not investigate, through study of documents and proofs, what the accused has done in words and deeds against the Soviet authority. The first question to be placed before him runs as to what class he belongs to, what is his origin, his education, his training and his profession. During the bloody dictatorship of Lenin, the Committee of Investigation under Rahrberg, Rahrberg, C which after the capture of Kiev entered the city with the white volunteers in August 1919, reported the following. The entire concrete floor of the large garage, 
This was the place where the provincial Chika of Kiev had carried out executions, was swimming in blood, which did not flow but formed a layer of several inches. It was a grisly mixture of blood with brain and skull fragments, as well as strands of hair and other human remains. The entire walls, holed by thousands of bullets, were spattered with blood, and fragments of brain as well as head skin adhered to them. A drain ditch of 25 centimeters width and 25 centimeters deep and about 10 m long ran from the middle of the garage to a nearby room, where there was a subterranean outlet pipe. This drain ditch was filled to the top with blood. Usually, immediately after the massacre, the corpses were removed in lorries or horse-drawn wagons from the city and buried in a mass grave. In the corner of a garden we came upon an older mass grave, which contained about 80 corpses, in which we discovered signs of the most varied and unimaginable cruelties and mutilation. There were corpses from which the entrails had been removed. Others had different limbs amputated and others again were cut into pieces. Some had had the eyes poked out, while the head, the face, the neck and the torso were covered with deep wounds. Further on we found a corpse with an axe in the breast, while others had no tongues. In a corner of the mass grave we discovered many legs and arms severed from the trunk. The enormous number of corpses, which have already been laid to the account of communist socialism and which increase terrifyingly all of the while, will perhaps never be exactly known, but it exceeds everything imaginable. It is not possible to learn the exact number of the victims. All estimates lie below the real figure. In the Edinburgh newspaper The Scotsman of 7th November, 1923, Professor Srilia gave the following figures. 28 bishops. 1,219 priests, 6,000 professors and teachers, 9,000 doctors, 54,000 officers, 260,000 soldiers, 70,000 policemen, 12,950 estate owners, 355,250 intellectuals and of the free professions, 193,290 workers and 215,000 peasants. The Information Committee of Denikin on the Bolshevistic Intrigue during the years 1918-1919 records in a treatise about the Red Terror in these two years 1,700,000 victims. In the 3rd of August 1923, Common makes the following observation. During the winter of 1920 there existed in the USSR, 52 governments with 52 special committees, chicas. 52 special departments and 52 revolutionary courts. Besides countless subsidiary chicas, transport networks, courts on the railways as well as troops for internal security, there were mobile courts, which were dispatched to mass executions in the places concerned. To this list of courts of torture must be added the special departments, that is, 16 army and divisional courts. All in all one must estimate 1,000 torture chambers. If it is borne in mind that at that time district committees also existed in addition, then the number rises further. In addition the number of governments of the USSR increased. Siberia, the Crimea and the Far East were conquered. The number of chicas grew in geometrical ratio. According to Soviet data, in the year 1920 when the terror had still not ebbed and the reporting of news was not restricted, it is possible to establish an average figure for every court. The curve of executions rises from 1 to 50, in the great cities, and up to 100 in the regions recently conquered by the Red Army. The crisis of terror was periodic and then ceased, in this manner one can daily estimate the, modest, figure of five victims, which, multiplied with the thousand courts, gives a result of 5,000, and thus for the year roughly one and a half million. We recall this indescribable slaughter. Not because in its totality it was either the most numerous or the most merciless to arise from the special situation and inflamed passions consequent on the first victories of the Bolshevist Revolution, but because today, 45 years after these mass executions took place, all this might otherwise be obliterated from the present communist picture, even for the persons who were contemporaries of the events and who today, still alive have forgotten those tragedies with the ease with which people forget not only unpleasant events which do not directly concern them, but even those to which they fell victim. Unhappily, time has shown us a truly demonic excess of communism in its murderous activity, 
about which we give no details and do not present the monstrous statistics because all this is known to us. Several of these cruel bloodbaths have only taken place recently, so that one still seems to hear the lament of the persecuted, the death rattle of the dying and the dumb, the terrible and haunting complaint of the corpses. It may suffice to recall the recent giant bloodbaths in Hungary, Poland, East Germany and Cuba as well as the earlier mass killings by Stalin and the annihilation of millions of Chinese through the communist regime of Mao Zedong. But also the communist attempts at revolution, which failed to achieve lasting permanence, such as that of Bielikun who occupied Hungary in such a brutal way in the middle of 1919, of Spain in 1936, where the Bolsheviks gained control of Madrid and parts of the Spanish provinces and murdered more than 16,000 priests, monks and nuns, as well as 12 bishops, further the happily unsuccessful attempt in Germany, its most successful realization in the Red Republic of Bavaria in the year 1919. All these attempts were in fact orgies of 1918, which was directed by Hugo Haas, and which had blood and unrestrained bestiality. One must also not forget that this apocalyptic storm, which brings a flood of corpses, blood and tears, falls upon the world with the sole goal, to destroy not only the Catholic Church but the entire Christian civilization. Before this shattering picture the world asks itself with heavy heart, who can hate our Christian features in such a form and try to destroy them with such godless fury? Who has become capable of instigating this bloody mechanics of annihilation? Who can with such insensitivity direct and order this monstrous criminal process? And reality answers us completely without doubt that the Bolshevik Jews are those responsible, as will later be proved. Chapter 2 the creators of the system. There is absolutely no doubt, that the Jews are the inventors of communism, for they have been the instigators of the dogma, upon which that monstrous system is built, which at present with absolute power rules the greatest part of Europe and Asia, which stirs up the lands of America and with progressive certainty floods over all Christian peoples of the world like a deadly cancerous growth, like a tumor, which steadily devours the core of the furry nations without apparently an effective means of cure being found against this disease. But the Jews are also the inventors and directors of the communist methods, of effective tactics of struggle, of the insensitive and totally inhuman government policy and of aggressive international strategy. It is a completely proven fact that the communist theoreticians were all Jews, unheeded of what system the Jews lastingly use, as well as the theoreticians and the experienced revolutionaries which has veiled from the eyes of the people, where they lived, their true origin. 1. Karl Heinrich Marx was a German Jew, whose real name was Kissel Mordecai, born in Trier, Rhineland, son of a Jewish lawyer. Before his famous work Das Kapital which contains the fundamental idea of theoretical communism, whose concepts he strove with inexhaustible activity up to his death in the year 1887 to spread over the world. He had written and published with the Jew Engels in the year 1848 the Communist Manifesto in London. Between 1843 and 1847 he had formulated in England the first modern interpretation of Hebrew nationalism in his articles, as in the publication in the year 1844 in the periodical deutsch Französisch Jahrbücher, German-French yearbooks, under the title Concerning the Jewish Question, which shows an ultranational tendency. 2. Friedrich Engels creator of the first international, and close collaborator of Marx, was a Jew and born in Bremen, Germany. His father was a Jewish cotton merchant of the city. Engels died in the year 1894. 3. Karl Kautsky, whose real name was Krauss, was the author of the book The Beginnings of Christianity, in which he mainly combats the principles of Christianity. He was the most important interpreter of Karl Marx and in 1887 published the economic doctrine of Karl Marx made intelligible for all. The bloodbath of Jzenau and the Jewish question, in the year 1903, the class struggle, which for Mao Zedong in China was the fundamental book for communist instruction, and the work with the title The Vanguard of Socialism, in the year 1921. He was also the author of the socialist program from Erfurt, Germany. This Jew was born in the year 1854 in Prague and died in 1938 in The Hague, Holland. 4. Ferdinand Lassalle, Jew, 
Born in the year 1825 in Breslau, he had interfered in the Democratic Revolution of 1848. In the year 1863 he published his work entitled Open Answers, in which he outlined a plan of revolution for the German workers. Since then he worked tirelessly for a socialist crusade, which was directed at the rebellion of the workers. For this purpose he published a further work under the title Capital and Labor. 5. Edward Bernstein. A Jew born in Berlin in the year 1850. His principal works are Assumptions Concerning Socialism, Forward, Socialism, Documents of Socialism, History and Theory of Socialism, Social Democracy of Today and Theory and Practice, The Duties of Social Democracy, and German Revolution. In all his writings he expounds the communist teaching and bases it on the views of Marx. In the year 1918 he became finance minister of the German socialist state, which, however, could fortunately only maintain itself a few months. 6. Jacob Lastro, Max Hirsch, Edgar Loening, Wershaer, Babe, Schatz, David Ricardo and many other writers of theoretical communism were Jews. In all lands are found writers, almost exclusively Jewish, who preach communism to the masses, although with many opportunities they strive to give the appearance in their writings of a feeling of humanity and brotherhood. We have indeed already seen in practice what this means. Eight. However theoretical law Jews mentioned may have been, they were not satisfied with setting up the doctrinaire bases, but each one of them was an experienced revolutionary, who busied himself in whatever particular land he found himself, to factually prepare the upheaval, to direct or to give it support. As leaders or members of revolutionary associations known only to one another, they took more and more active part in the development or Bolshevism. But apart from these Jews, who in the main were regarded as theoreticians, we find that almost all materialist leaders, who develop communist tactics, also belong to the same race and carry out their task with the greatest efficacy. As indisputable examples two movements of this type can be recorded. A. In the year 1918 Germany was showpiece of a communist. Jew directed revolution. The Red Councils of the Republic of Munich was Jewish, as its instigators prove, Liebknecht, Rosa Luxemburg, Kurt Eisner and many others. With the fall of the monarchy the Jews gained control of the country and the German government. With ministers of state Haas and Landsberg appear Kotsky, Kahn and Herzfeld. The finance minister was likewise a Jew, had his racial fellow Bernstein as assistant and the minister of the interior, likewise a Jew and sought the collaboration of his racial brother, Dr. Freund, who helped him in his work. Kurt Eisner, the president of the Bavarian Council's Republic, was the instigator of the Bolshevist revolution in Munich. Eleven little men made the revolution, said Kurt Eisner in the intoxication of triumph to his colleague, the Minister Auer. It is no more than right to preserve the unforgettable memory of these little men, who were, in fact, the Jews Max Loemberg. Dr. Kurt Rosenfeld, Kaspar Walliam, Max Rothschild, Karl Arnold, Greenold, Rosenheck, Birnbaum, Race and Kaser. These ten with Kurt Eisner van Isro Lowich led the presidency of the Revolutionary Court of Germany. All eleven were Freemasons and belonged to the secret lodge and dot degrees which had its seat in Munich at number 51 Braunerstrasse. The first cabinet of Germany in the year 1918 was composed of Jews. One. Bruce, Minister of the Interior. 2. Freund, Minister of the Interior. 3. Landsberg, Finance Minister. 4. Karl Kotsky, Finance Minister. 5. Schiffer, Finance Minister. 6. Edward Bernstein, Secretary of the State Treasury. 7. Fritz Max Cohen, Director of the Official Information Service. This Jew was earlier correspondent of the Jewish Frankfurter Zeitung. The second German socialist government of 1918 was formed of the following Jews. 1. Hirsch, Minister of the Interior. 2. Rosenfeld, Justice Minister. 3. Futran, Minister of Education. 4. Arndt, Minister of Education. 5. Simon, State Secretary of Finances. 6. Kastenberg, Director of the Department of Science and Art. 7. Strigen. Director of Colonial Department. 9. Worm, Secretary of Food. 10. Mers, 
Weil, Katzenstein, Stern, Lowenberg, Frankel, Schlesinger, Israelowitz, Sellingzone, Lobenheim, etc., took up high posts in the ministries. Among the remaining Jews who controlled the sectors vital to life of the German state, which had been defeated through the American intervention in the war, were found in the year 1918, and later. 1. Cohen, President of the German Workers and Soldiers. Councils, similar to the Soviet Council of Soldiers and Workers. Of Moscow in the same year. 2. Ernst, Police President of Berlin. 3. Sinsheimer, Police President of Frankfurt. 4. Louis, Police President of Hessen. 5. Kurt Eisner, Bavarian State President. 6. Jaffe Bavarian Finance Minister. 7. Brentano, Industry, Trade and Transport Minister. 8. Talimer, Minister in Württemberg. 9. Hyman, another minister in Württemberg. 10. Fulda, in the government of Hesse. 11. Theodor Wolf, chief editor of the newspaper Berliner Tageblatt. 12. Gwinner, director of the Deutsche Bank. B. Hungary in the year 1919. On 20 of March 1919 the Jew Bielik Gun, Kohn, took over power in Hungary and proclaimed the Hungarian Soviet Republic which from that moment on was submerged in a hair-raising sea of blood. 28, 28, commissars formed with him the new government and of these 18 were Israelites. That is an unheard of proportion, when one bears in mind that in Hungary lived one and a half million Israelites compared to 22 million inhabitants. The 18 commissars held the actual control of rulership in their hands and the eight Gentile commissars could do nothing against them. More than 90% of the members of the government and the confidence men of Bielakun were also Jews. Here follows a list of members of the Bielakun government. 1. Bielakun, General Secretary of the Jewish Government. 2. Sander Garbai, Official President of the Government, who was used by the Jews as a Hungarian man of straw. 3. Peter Augustin, Deputy of the General Secretary, Jew. 4. Dr. E. Landler. People's Commissar for Internal Affairs, Jew. 5. Bia Lavago, Deputy of Landler, a Jew with the name Vice. 6. E. Hamburger, Agriculture Commissar, Jew. 7. Vantas, Deputy of Hamburger, Jew. 8. Xismadia, Deputy of Hamburger, Hungarian. 9. Nyester, Deputy of Hamburger, Hungarian. 10. Varga, Commissar for Financial Affairs. Jew by name Way Axel Bohm. 11. Skli, Deputy of Varga, Jew by name Schlesinger. 12. Kunfts, Education Minister, Jew by name Kunstainer. 13. Kukox, Deputy of Kunfi, a Jew, who in reality was Chod Lowener and was the son of the Director General of a banking house in Budapest. 14. D. Bokany, Minister of Labor, Hungarian. 15. Fiedler. Deputy of Bokany, Jew. 16. Josef Pogany, War Commissar, a Jew, who in reality was called Schwartz. 17. Shanto, Deputy of Pogany, a Jew named Schreiber. 18. Tibur Samueli, Deputy of Pogany, a Jew named Samuel. 19. Matthias Rakazi, Trade Minister, a Jew, who in reality was called Matthew Roth Rosenkrantz, present communist dictator. 20. Ron I, Commissar of Law, a Jew named Rosenstegel. 21. Laudai, Deputy of Ron I, Jew. 22. Erdelai, Commissar of Supply, a Jew named Eisenstein. 23. Vilmus Bohm, Socialization Commissar, Jew. 24. Hevesi, Deputy of Bohm, a Jew named Honig. 25. Dovsk, Second Deputy of Bohm, Jew. 26. Oskar Jazzai, Commissar of Nationalities, a Jew named Jakubovitz. 27. Otto Karvin, Political Examining Commissar, a Jew named Klein. 28. Karix, State Lawyer, a Jew named Kraus. 29. Biro, Chief of the Political Police, a Jew named Lau. 30. Cidem, Adjutant of Biro, Jew. 31. Oskar Faber. Commissar for Liquidation of Church Property, Jew. 32. J. 
Zerny, commander of the terrorist bands, which were known by the name Lenin Youth, Hungarian, 33, Isles, Supreme Police Commissar, Ju, 34, Zabados, Supreme Police Commissar, a Jew named Singer, 35, Kalmer, Supreme Police Commissar, German Jew, 36, Shabo, Supreme Police Commissar, Ruth Indian Jew, who, in reality was called Schwartz, 37, Vince, People's Commissar of the City of Budapest, who in reality was called Weinstein, 38, M. Kraus, People's Commissar of Budapest, Jew, 39, A. Dines, People's Commissar of Budapest, Jew, 40, Lengiel, President of the Austro-Hungarian Bank, a Jew, named Levkovitz, 41, Laszlo, President of the Communist Revolutionary Court, a Jew, who in reality was called Loi, in this government which for a time held Hungary in thrall, the chief of the Hungarian Chica Zamueli, besides Bilakun, distinguished himself through countless crimes and plunderings, while the latter rode through the land in his luxury automobile, with the symbol of a large gallows mounted on the vehicle, and accompanied by his capable Jewish woman secretary R.S. Salkind, alias Semliake, the former traveled through Hungary in his special train and sowed terror and death, as a contemporary witness describes. That train of death traveled snorting through the black Hungarian nights, where it stopped, one saw people hanging from trees and blood which ran on the ground. Along the railway line naked and mutilated corpses were to be seen. Zamueli dictated his judgments in his train, and whoever was forced to enter never lived to tell the tale of what he saw. Zamueli lived constantly in this train. Thirty selected terrorists ensured his security. Selected executioners accompanied him. The train consisted of two saloon wagons, two first-class wagons, which were occupied by the terrorists, and two third-class wagons for the victims. In the latter executions were carried out. The floor of this wagon was stiff with blood. The corpses were thrown out of the windows, whilst Zamueli sat comfortably in the elegant workroom of his compartment which was upholstered in rose-colored damask and decorated with polished mirrors. With a movement of the hand he decided over life or death. Chapter 3. The Head of Communism. There exists therefore not the slightest doubt, that the Marxist theory, communism, is a Jewish work, just as is also its every action, which aims at putting this doctrine into practice. Before the final establishing of Bolshevism in Russia the directors and organizers of all communist movements in their entirety were almost solely Jews just as the great majority of the true organizers of the revolutions were to which they gave the impetus. But in Russia, as the first land where Bolshevism finally triumphed, and where it was and still is the fulcrum or driving force for the communizing of the world, the Jewish paternity of the system of organization and of Soviet praxis also allows no doubt or error. According to the irrefutable data, which has been fully and completely proved and recognized by all impartial writers who have dealt with this theme, the communist work of the Jews in the land of the Tsars is so powerful that it would be useless to deny this disastrous triumph as their monopoly. It suffices to recall the names of those who have formed the governments and the principal leading organs in the Soviet Union, in order to know what one has immediately to think of the clear and categorical proof of the evidence. 1. Members of the First Communist Government of Moscow, 1918, Council of People's Commissars 1. Ilyich Yulin, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyan of Or Nikolaus Lenin, President of the Supreme Soviet, Jew on mother's side. His mother was called Blank, a Jewess of German origin. 2. Lou Davinovich Bronstein, Leo Trotsky, Commissar 4. The Red Army in the Navy, Jew. 3. Iosef David Vissarionovich Jagash Vili Kokba, Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin. Nationalities Commissar, Descendant of Jews from Georgia. 4. Chishirin, Commissar for Foreign Affairs, Russian. 5. Abfilbaum, Grigors in Aviv, Commissar for Internal Affairs, Jew. 6. Cohen, Volodarsky, Commissar for Press and Propaganda, Jew. 7. Samuel Kaufman, Commissar for the Landed Property of the State, 
Ju. 8. Steinberg, Law Commissar, Ju. 9. Schmidt, Commissar for Public Works, Ju. 10. Ethel Nigeisen, Liliana, Commissar for Supply, Jules. 11. Fennigstein, Commissar for the Settlement of Refugees, Ju. 12. Schlichter, Vostnolanen, Commissar for Billetings. Confiscation of Private Houses for the Reds, Ju. 13. Lurie, Larin, President of the Supreme Economic Council. Ju. 14. Kucker, Kuckersky, Trade Commissar, Ju. 15. Spitzberg, Culture Commissar, Ju. 16. Risky, Rudomilsky, Commissar for Elections, Ju. 17. Lunakarsky, Commissar for Public Schools, Russian. 18. Simusko, Commissar for Health, Ju. 19. Protsin, Agriculture Commissar, Armenian. In the appendix at the end of this volume can be found the interesting and illustrative lists of the Jewish officials in all the government bodies of the Soviet Union, the Communist Party, the Red Army, the secret police, the trade unions, etc. Of a total of 502 offices of first rank in the organization and direction of the communist revolution in Russia and in the direction of the Soviet state during the first years of its existence, no less than 459 posts are occupied by Jews, while only 43 of these offices have been occupied by Gentiles of different origin, who then has accordingly carried out this terrible revolution. The Gentiles perhaps? Another statistic? which was published in Paris by the counter-revolutionary newspaper Le Russe Nationalist, after the victory of the Jewish communists in Russia, reveals that of 554 communist leaders of first rank in different offices the racial composition was as follows. Jews 447. Lithuanians 43. Russians 30. Armenians 13. Germans 12. Finns 3. Poles 2. Georgians 2. Czechs 1. Hungarians 1. During the Second World War, and from then on up to our present time, the Jewish clique which rules the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics, continues to be very numerous, for at the head of the name stands Stalin himself, who for a long time was regarded as a Georgian of pure descent. But it has been revealed that he belongs to the Jewish race, for Jaugatvili, which is his surname, means son of Jau, and Jau is a small island in Persia with our many banished Portuguese gypsies migrated, who later settled in Georgia. Today it is almost completely proved that Stalin had Jewish blood, although he neither confirmed nor denied the rumors, about which mutterings began in this direction. Let us look at a list of the Soviet officials in the government of Stalin. 1. Stinov, Yedinov, who in reality was called Lifshitz. Foreigner commander in the defense of Leningrad during the Second World War. Member of the Politburo up to 1945 and one of the instigators of the decision which excluded Tito from the common form in the year 1948 and who shortly afterwards died. 2. Lavrenti Beria, chief of the MVD, police and of Soviet heavy industry, member of the Soviet atom industry, who was executed upon orders of Melnikov, and in fact for the same reason for which Stalin liquidated Yagoda. 3. Lazar Kaganovich, Director of Soviet Heavy Industry. Member of the Politburo from 1944 to 1952, then member of the Presidium and at present President of the Supreme Presidium of the USSR. 4. Melnikov, G.R.G. Maximilianovich Molenk, Member of the Politburo and Org Bureau until 1952 then member of the Supreme Presidium, President of the Ministerial Council. After the death of Stalin, Minister in the Government of Bulganin since 1955, he is a Jew from Morin Sendberg, not a Cossack, as is asserted. The name of his father, Maximilian Malink, is typical for a Russian Jew. In addition there is a very important detail, which reveals the true origin of Mayankov and also if Khrushchev, the present wife of Mayankov is the Jewess Pearl Mutter, known as Comrade Shinshchusn who was Minister, Commissar, for the fish industry in the Soviet government in the year 1938. If Mayankov had not been a Jew, 
it is extremely unlikely that he would have married a Jewess, and the latter would also not have married him. There exists no official description of the life of Melnikov. This is certainly to be attributed to the fact that he does not want his Jewish origin to be discovered. 5. Niklaus Salomon Khrushchev, present chief, 1963, of the Soviet Communist Party, member of the Politburo since 1939, that is since the year when Melnikov was chosen member of the Orgboro. He is the brother of Madame Melnikov, that is of the Jewish Pearl Mutter. Khrushchev is a Jew and his real name is Pearl Mutter. Also, the present wife of Khrushchev, Nina, as well as the wives of Mikoyan, Varoshilov, Molotov, etc., are Jewesses. 6. Marshal Nikolaus Bulganin, at present first Soviet minister, former bank official, was one of the ten Jewish members of the Commissariat for the Liquidation of Private Banks in the year 1919. 7. Anastasio Josefovich Mikoyan, member of the Politburo since 1935, member of the Supreme Presidium since 1952 trade minister and vice president in the Melnikov government. He is an Armenian Jew and not a true Armenian as is believed. 8. Kruglov, chief of the MVD after Beria. Upon command of Kruglov the imprisoned Jewish doctors were released who had been imprisoned by Ryuman, sub-chief of the police, during the rulership of Beria, in the year 1953. Likewise Jew. 9. Alexander Kozygin member of the Politburo up to 1952, afterwards deputy in the Supreme Presidium and Minister for Light Industry and Food in the Mayankov government. 10. Niklaus Shvernik, member of the Politburo up to 1952, then member of the Supreme Presidium and member of the Presidium of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, Jew. 11. Andreas Andreevich Andreev, who is known as the Politburocrat of 3A member of the Politburo between 1931 and 1952, Jew from Galicia, Poland. He writes under a Russian pseudonym. 12. P. K. Ponomrino, member of the Orgboro in the year 1952, afterwards member of the highest presidium and culture minister in the Melnikov government. 13. P. F. Yudin, Jew. Deputy member of the highest presidium and titulary of the Ministry for Building Material in the Melnikov government in the year 1953. 14. Mikhail Pervukin, member of the presidium of the Central Committee of the Communist Party since 1953. 15. N. Shatalin, official in the subsecretariat of the Central Committee of the Community Party. 16. K. P. Gorshin in, Justice Minister in the Government. Of Melnikov. 17. D. Ustinov, Zambinovich, Soviet Ambassador in. Athens, Greece, up to the Second World War, Defense Minister. In the Melnikov Government. 18. V. Merkulov, Minister for State Control at the time of. Melnikov. 19. A. Zazyatko. Minister for the Coal Industry under Melnikov, 20, Cherberg, Soviet Propaganda Chief, 21, Milstein, one of the Soviet Espionage Chiefs, 22, Ferenc Kiss, Chief of the Soviet Espionage Service in Europe, 23, Post Ribicher, Posobyshev, former Private Secretary of Stalin, at present Chief of the Secret Archives of the Kremlin, 24, Ilya Ehrenberg, delegate for Moscow in the Supreme Soviet, communist writer, likewise Jew, 25, Mark Spivak, delegate from Stalino, Ukraine, in the Supreme Soviet of Moscow, 26, Rosalia Goldenberg, delegate from Birobudzhin in the Supreme Soviet, 27, Anna E. Kaluger, delegate of Bessarabia in the Supreme Soviet, her brother, not Kliuger, but Kalugaruin. Romanian, is a communist official in the government of Romania, also Kalinin, one of the great Soviet officials under Stalin, who died some time ago, was a Jew. It is only too well known, that the anti-Semitism of Stalin was a misrepresentation of the facts, and that the bloodbath among the Jews, 
Trotskyists, which he carried out in order to assert his power, was performed by other Jews. In the last instance the struggle between the Jew Trotsky and the Jew Stalin was a struggle between parties for control over the communist government, which they created, it was purely a family dispute. As proof, the following list of commissars for foreign affairs, during the period when Stalin got rid of some certain Jews, who had become dangerous for his personal power. 1. Maxim Maximovich Livinov, Minister for Foreign Affairs up to 1939 when he was replaced by Molotov. He afterwards occupied high offices in the same ministry up to his death in February 1952. He was born in Poland as son of the junior Genok Moiseevich Valik, a bank clerk, in order to conceal his real name Maxim Moiseevich Valik. Livdinov used various pseudonyms during his real career. Among them Finkelstein, Ludwig Nietz, Maxim Harrison, David Mordke, Felix, and finally, when he became an official in the communist regime of Russia, he took on the name of Litvinov or Litvinov, when this Jew was replaced by Molotov in the year 1939, the Jews of the Western world and the entire Jewish Freemasonic press began to cry out that he had been removed by Stalin because he was a Jew, but they kept quiet afterwards concerning the fact that up to his death, Litvinov remained in the ministry. Why also say this, if it was not of interest for the conspiracy? In the memoirs of Litvinov, which were published after his death, he wrote that, in his opinion nothing would alter in Soviet Russia after the death of Stalin. In fact, Stalin died a year after Litvinov and Nothing was altered in the Soviet's internal and external policies. What the West calls change in the policy of the USSR is simply nothing further than a skilled propaganda for the necessities of the plan for world rule through the Jews. Nothing has altered since the death of Stalin. A certain unrest may have arisen on account of the lack of a new leader of the stature of Stalin or Lenin, that is all. For this reason the Jewish Freemasonic conspirators of the West wished to paint the Soviet communist black raven over with the glittering colors of pacifism, coexistence, human friendliness, etc., in order to introduce it to the world as something harmless, until a dictator with the same lusts of his predecessors arises. When Litvinov asserted that nothing would alter with the death or Stalin, he knew very well, that this would be so because Stalin was nothing more than one of the handymen of the Jewish band, which rules the USSR, and because after him other Jews would be at hand, to carry on the plan of world domination, for which Bulganin, Baruch, Reading, Therese, Mendes France, David Ben-Gurion and many others are cooperating. In continuing the list of Jews in the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of the USSR, we mention. 2. Andreas Januruvich Vishinsky now dead, who was foreign minister of the USSR before the death of Stalin and afterwards permanent representative of the Soviet Union in the UNO. There he missed no opportunity to sling his obscenities against the non-communist lands, exactly as in the times when he was people's judge. His Jewish name was Abraham Janu Ravine. 3. Jacob Malik, Soviet representative in the UNO and day. Great personality in the Soviet diplomatic hierarchy, Jew. 4. Valerian Zorin, for a time ambassador in London and likewise a great figure of Soviet diplomacy, who changes his post according to necessity. 5. Andrei Gromyko, diplomat, Minister for Foreign Affairs. Since 1958. 6. Alexander Panushkin, former Soviet ambassador in Washington ambassador in Peking during the year 1955, who is regarded as the actual dictator of Red China. 7. Zambinovich, Ustinov, ambassador in Athens up to 1940. 8. Admiral Radionovich, ambassador in Athens between 1945 and 1946, that is, as the communist coup d'etat in Greece was prepared, Jew. 9. Konstantin Amansky, ambassador in Washington. During the Second World War and afterwards official in the 
Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Moscow. 10. Manilsky, former representative in the Ukraine and in the UNO, at present president of the Ukraine, likewise. Ju. 11. Ivan Maisky, ambassador in London during the war. Afterwards high official of the foreign ministry in Moscow. 12. Madame Galante, ambassador in Stockholm until her death in March 1952. Jules. 13. Daniel Solod, ambassador in Cairo in the year 1955. The latter, supported by a Jewish group which belongs to the diplomatic corps in Cairo, directs the Israelite conspiracy inside the Arab world under Soviet diplomatic protection. Without the Egyptian government noticing this, this government should not forget that David Ben-Gurion, first minister of Israel, as well as Golda Meyerson, Israel's minister in Moscow, are Russian Jews like David Solod. At present, according to confirmed data, 80%-90% of the key positions in all ministries in Moscow and the remaining Soviet republics are occupied by Jews. I do not believe that there can be any doubt of the origin of all those who occupy the highest posts in Moscow since the first moment of the revolution. For the Russians it is a lamentable fact that after all this course of time things are much worse, for the number of Jews who live in Russia has increased in frightening degree. All important leading positions are in their hands. As in Russia the countries of Europe where Bolshevism has gained control, are also completely ruled by a Jewish minority, the latter always appears in the direction of the communist government with an iron, criminal and merciless hand, so as to attain the utter enslaving of the native citizens through an insignificant group of Jews. More convincing than any other proof is an exact surveying of the most principal leaders of the Bolshevist governments of Europe which are always found in the hands of the Israelites. We will quote the most principal ones. A. Hungary. 1. The most important communist leader since the occupation of this land by Soviet troops is Matthias Rakhazi, an Israelite, whose real name is Matthew Roth Rosenkrantz, and who was born in the year 1892 in Zabadka. 2. Ferenc Munij, first minister in Hungary in the year 1959 after Janos Kader. 3. Erno Jero, Minister of the Interior until 1954. 4. Zeban, Minister of the Interior before the Jujero. 5. General Laszlo Kiros, Ju, Minister of Interior since July 1954, simultaneously Chief of the AVO, that is the Hungarian Police, which corresponds to the Soviet MVD. 6. General Peter Gabor, chief of the Communist Political Police of Hungary up to 1953, a Jew, who in reality was called Benjamin Auspitz and was earlier a tailor in Saterijudzli, Hungary. 7. Varga, State Secretary for Economic Planning, a Jew, who in reality is called Wei Ixelbom, former minister of the Bielikon government. He was also president of the Supreme Economic Council. 8. Burgi. Minister for Foreign Affairs. 9. Julius Egri, Agriculture Minister of the Hungarian People's Republic. 10. Zoltan Vas, President of the Supreme Economic Council, a Jew, who in reality was called Weinberger. 11. Joseph Rievel, the editor of the Hungarian press and director of the red newspaper Zabod Nep, the Free People, a Jew, who is really called Moses Kohana. 12. Revi, another, Minister for National Education, a Jew named Rabinovitz. 13. Joseph Jero, Transport Minister, a Jew named Singer. 14. Mihili Farkas, Minister for National Defense, a Jew named Friedman. 15. Viewers, Minister of State. 16. Vida, Minister of State. 17. Shanto, Commissar for Purging of Enemies of the State, in the year 1951 sent by Moscow. A Jew named Schreiber, former member of the Biela Kun government. 18. Ga Ilidisi, Justice Minister up to 1955, today Chief of the Secret Police. 19. Emil Weil, Hungarian ambassador in Washington, he is the Jewish doctor who tortured Cardinal Mind Zindi. Among other important Jewish officials to be mentioned are 1. Imris Zum, director of the Hungarian radio company. 2. Jay Ligari, 
Judge of the Communist People's Court of Budapest. 3. Colonel Kaspo, Sub Chief of the Secret Police. 4. Professor Laszlo Benedict, Jewish Dictator for Educational Questions. The sole important communist of Gentile origin was the Freemason Laszlo Rajk, former Minister for Foreign Affairs, who was sentenced and executed by his Jewish brothers for his betrayal. b. Czechoslovakia. 1. Clemens Gottwald, one of the founders of the Communist Party in Czechoslovakia and president of the country between 1948 and 1953, a Jew, who died shortly after Stalin. 2. Vladimir Klementis, former Communist Minister of Czechoslovakia for Foreign Affairs, sentenced and executed in the year 1952, Jew. 3. Vaclav David, present Foreign Minister of Czechoslovakia, 1955, Jew. 4. Rudolf Slasky, former General Secretary of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia, sentenced in the year 1952, a Jew by name of Rudolf Salzman. 5. Firi Hendrik, present General Secretary of the Communist Party, Jew. 6. Andreas Simon, sentenced in the year 1952, a Jew named Otto Katz. 7. Gustav Bears. Assistant of the General Secretary of the Communist Party, Jew. 8. Joseph Frank, former Assistant of the General Secretary of the Communist Party, sentenced in the year 1952, Jew. C. Poland. 1. Bolesław Birut, President of Poland up to 1954, Jew. 2. Jacob Berman, General Secretary of the Communist Party of Poland, Jew. 3. Julius Kozaki. Katz, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Poland, who is well known for his violent speeches in the UNO, Jew. 4. Karl Swierysk, former Vice Minister for National Defense, who was murdered by the anti-communist Ukrainian country population in South Poland, the mass of the people is not always amorphous, Jew. 5. Joseph Syrankwicz, First Minister of Poland since 1954, after Birut, Jew. 6. Hilary Mink, Vice Prime Minister of Poland since 1954, Jew. 7. Zeman Klesko, Minister of Justice, Jew. 8. Tadosz Kokkinowicz, Minister of Labor, Jew. The sole important Polish communist of Gentile origin is Władysław Gomułka who was removed from political leadership since 1949, when he lost his post as First Minister. Sooner or later he will share the same fate as Rajk in Hungary. D. Romania. 1. Anna Pocker, Jewess, former Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Romanian People's Republic, and spy number one in the Kremlin in Romania up to the month of June 1952. Since then she has remained in the shadows in Bucharest up to the present day, naturally in freedom. This Jewish hyena, who was originally called Anna Rabinson, is the daughter of a rabbi, who came to Romania from Poland. She was born in the province of Molda, Romania, in the year 1892. 2. Alka Wasserman, former private secretary of Anna Pocker, at present the real directress of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. 3. Joseph Kaisinski, the present agent number one of the Kremlin in Romania, member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party and vice president of the Council of Ministers. He is a Jew and comes from Bessarabia. His correct name is Jacob Breutmann. Also he is the real chief of the Communist Party of Romania, although officially the general secretary of the party is the Romanian locksmith Gheorghe Gheorghe Udez, who, however, only plays the simple role of a political front. Kai Sinvsky took his present pseudonym from the name of the city of Kaisan on Bessarabia, where before the arrival of the Red Army he owned a tailor's workshop. 4. Tohari Georgescu Minister for Internal Affairs in the Communist Government of Bucharest between 1945 and 1952, at the present time he has been reduced to a second-rank post, although he was officially expelled from the Communist Party. He finds himself in the same position as Anna Pocker. His real name is Baru Peskovic. He is a Jew from the Romanian Danube harbor of Galatz. 5. Avram Bunasiu, likewise a Jew, is the present. 1955, General Secretary of the Presidium of the Great National Assembly of the Romanian People's Republic, that is the real leader of this assembly, 
for the official president Petra Grossa is only an old Freemasonic marionette, who is married to a Jewess and plays only a purely static role. Evram Bunasi who is called in reality Abraham Gutman, Gutman translated into Romanian is the corresponding name for Bunasi that is the pseudonym taken on by this Jew. 6. Lothar Radisinu, another minister of the communist government of Bucharest deposed in the year 1952, but who in 1955 reappeared on the honorary tribune. He is a Jew from Siebenbergen and is called Lothar Wurtzel. Since the Wurtzel in Romanian translates Radisinu, this Jew has simply transferred his Hebraic name into Romanian and is now called Radisinu. 7. Miron Constantinescu, member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party and Minister for Mining and Petroleum. Now and then he changes his ministerial posts. He is a Jew from Galizzi, Romania, who in truth is called Merican, and as is customary among them, uses a Romanian pseudonym. 8. Lt. Gen. Moises Haupt, commander of the military district of Bucharest, Jew. 9. Col. Gen. Zemfir. Communist security chief in Romania and responsible for thousands of murders, which this secret police has perpetrated. He is a Jew and comes from the Danube harbor of Brela. He is called Lorian Richler. 10. Haim Gutman, chief of the civil secret service of the Romanian People's Republic, Jew. 11. Major General William Suter, chief of the information service and of counterespionage of the Romanian Communist Army. He is a Jew by name Will Mansuder and former officer of the Soviet Army. 12. Colonel Roman, former director of the EKP service, education, culture and propaganda, of the Romanian Army up to 1949, and at the present time minister in the communist government. His name as Jew is Walter. 13. Alexander Mogurash, minister for nationalities in the Red Government, Jew from Hungary. 14. Alexander Badal. Chief of the Control Commission for Foreigners in Romania. He is a Jew who originates from the city of Targovist whose real name is Brauustein. Before 1940 his family and Targovist possessed a large trading firm. 15. Major Lewin, Chief of Press Censorship, Jew and former officer of the Red Army. 16. Colonel Holban, Chief of the Communist Security of Bucharest, a Jew named Moskovich, former syndicate, Union, Chief. 17. George Silviu, General Governmental Secretary of the Ministry for Internal Affairs, a Jew named Gersh Galiner. 18. Erwin Voyakulsku, Chief of the Past Department in the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. He is a Jew and is called Erwin Weinberg. 19. Georg Apistol, Chief of the General Labor Union of Romania. He is a Jew named Gershwin. 20. Stupinianu, Chief of Economic Espionage. Jew by name Stapno, 21. M. Eric Stoffel, Ambassador of the Romanian People's Republic in Switzerland, a Jew from Hungary and specialist in bank questions, 22. Harry Fingru, former legation chief of the Romanian Communist Embassy in Washington up to 1954 and at present official in the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Bucharest. He is a Jew named Hirsch Feiner. Before the year 1940 his family possessed a grain business in Galizia. 23. Idis Zilogy, the real directress of the Romanian Embassy in London, Jewish, friend of Anna Pauker. 24. Lazarscu, the charged affairs of the Romanian government in Paris. He is a Jew and is really called Baruch Lazarovich, the son of a Jewish trader from Bucharest. 25. Simon Noiru, state undersecretary of the Romanian state. Jew with name of Schaefer. 26. Oral Branga, Inspector General of Arts. He is a Jew, Ariel Leibovich is his real name. 27. Lyuba Kaisinevsky, President of the UFAR, Association of Anti-Fascist Romanian Women. She is a Jewess from Cernazi slash Bkoina, and is called in reality Lyuba Breutman, wife of Joseph Kaisinevsky of the Central Committee of the Party. 28. Lou Ziger. Director of the Ministry for National Economy, Jew. 29. Dr. Zitter, Jurist of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, Jew. 30. Marcel Breslasu, Director General of Arts, a Jew by name Mark Breslau. 31. Sylvie Ubrukin, 
chief editor of the newspaper Scantia, official party organ. He is a Jew and is called Brutker. He directs the entire campaign of lies that attempts to deceive the Romanian people concerning the true situation created by communism. At the same time the Jew Brucker directs the fake anti-Semitic campaign of the communist press of Romania. 32. Samoitla, governing director of the newspaper Scantia, he is a Jew, Samuel Rubinstein. 33. Horia Lyman, second editor of the communist newspaper Scantia, Jew with the name of Lehman. 34. Engineer Schnapp, governing director of the communist newspaper Romania Libra, Free Romania the second communist newspaper on the basis of its circulation, likewise a Jew. 35. Jan Mihai, chief of the Romanian film industry, communist propaganda by means of films, a Jew, whose name is Jacob Michael. 36. Alexander Grauer, director general of the Romanian Radio Corporation, which stands completely and solely in the service of the communist party. He is a Jewish professor and is called Alder by a Ewer born in Bucharest. 37. Mihail Roller, at present president of the Romanian Academy, is a sinister professor, a Jew, unknown before the arrival of the Soviets in Romania. Today he is president of the Academy and in addition he has written a new history of the Romanian people, in which he falsifies the historical truth. 38. Professor Weigel, one of the tyrants of the University of Bucharest, who directs the constant purging actions among Romanian students who are hostile to the Jewish communist regime. 39. Professor Lewin Berkovich, another tyrant of the Bucharest University, who with his spies controls the activity of Romanian professors and their social connections, an immigrant Jew from Russia. 40. Soviet Josifescu, the official literary critic, who censures the poems of the best poets like Heminsku Alexandri, Vlahutsa, Karlova, etc., who all died centuries ago or more than half a century ago, and alters form and content, because these poems are not in harmony with the communist Marxist ideas. This literary murderer is a Jew, who in truth is called Samizania Zifovich. 41. Joan Vinter, the second Marxist literary critic of the regime and author of a book with the title The Problem of Literary Legacy is likewise a Jew and is called Jacob Winder. The three former secretaries of the General Labor League up to 1950, Alexander Sinkovich, Michelein and Sam Asriel, Serban, were all Jews. E. Yugoslavia. 1. Marshal Tito, who with his real Jewish name is called Joseph Walter Weiss, originates from Poland. He was an agent of the Soviet Secret Service in Kabul, Tehran and Ankara up to 1935. The true Brazovich Tito in origin a Croat, died during the Spanish Civil War in Barcelona. 2. Moses Pijate, General Secretary of the Communist Party and in reality the great eminence of the regime, is a Jew of Spanish origin, Sephardit. 3. Kardelj, member of the Central Committee of the Yugoslav Communist Party and Minister for Foreign Affairs, is a Jew of Hungarian origin and is called in reality Kardel. 4. Rankovic member of the Central Committee of the Yugoslav Communist Party and Minister for Internal Affairs, is an Austrian Jew and was earlier called Ranka. 5. Alexander Bibeler, member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party and permanent representative of Yugoslavia in the UNO, is an Austrian Jew. 6. Iza Vilfan, Joseph Wilfan, economic advisor of Tito, in reality the economic dictator of Yugoslavia, is a Jew from Sarajevo. Since not so many Jews live in Yugoslavia as in other lands, we find a greater number of natives in the communist government of this land, always however in posts of the second rank, for the above-mentioned principal leaders in reality control the Yugoslav government completely and absolutely. Chapter 4. The Financiers of Communism. International Jewry strives in its entirety towards communistic socialism in accordance with the doctrine of Marx which has at present been realized by it and the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics and all its satellites. The direct goal of communism is the striving for world domination and complete power over all peoples of the earth. This standpoint it has always manifested and from the beginning onwards striven for this goal. 
This communist aim is understood with absolute unanimity by all Jews as their own goal, although many non-Jewish persons, who are lacking in knowledge and who are intentionally deceived, think that the great number of Jewish multimillionaires which there are in the world and who even control world finance, must necessarily oppose this current, which attempts to snatch their wealth away from them. At first sight there is nothing more self-evident than to see in a rich financier, a well-to-do trader or an important industrialist, the natural and keenest enemy of communism. But if the industrialists, traders or financiers are Jews, there is not the slightest doubt that they are also communists, for the communistic socialism of Marx has been created and carried out by them, and in fact not in order to lose their goods and chattels which they possess, but to steal everything which does not belong to them and to hoard together in their own hands the entire wealth of the world, which according to their assertion is unlawfully withheld from them by all who do not belong to the Jewish race. The well-known Jewish, writer Werner Sombart says, the fundamental characteristic feature of the Jewish religion consists in the fact that it is a religion which has nothing to do with the other world, but, as one might say, is solely materialistic. Man can experience good or evil only in this world, if God wishes to punish or reward, then he can do this only in the lifetime of man. Therefore the just man, righteous, must attain well-being here on earth and the godless suffer. 18. It is useless to dwell upon the difference which derives from this contrast of two outlooks, relating to the attitude of the devout Jew and of the devout Christian, with regard to the acquisition of wealth. The devout Christian who has got into debt with a usurer, was tortured on his deathbed by pangs of regret, repentance, and was ready to abandon everything which he possessed, for the knowledge of the unjustly acquired goods consumed him. On the other hand the devout Jew, when the end of his life approached, regarded with contentment the trunks and cases filled to bursting point, in which the prophets were accumulated, which during his long life he had taken off the wretched Christians and also the poor Muslims. It was a spectacle on which his devout heart could feast, for every roll of money which lay locked up there, he saw as a sacrifice brought to his God. Simultaneously, Jewish money, which at present represents the greatest part of the money in the world, is the most powerful tool of all, which in vast extent has made possible the financing of revolutionary movements without the help of which the latter would never have been able to triumph and be able in such manner to destroy Christian civilization in all its appearances, be it whether the individual is materialistically influenced by it being taught that money is to be preferred to other worldly values, or be it through the direct methods, which they know how to use so energetically like bribery and embezzlement in public offices and taxation swindling as well as the general buying of consciences. The Jewish idea of accumulating all the money in the world through communism appears in all transparency with many famous Jewish writers like Edmund Flake, Barbus, Andre Spire and others, in particular most expressly in a well-known letter that the famous new Meshaner Baruch Levy sent to Karl Marx which was discovered in the year 1888 and published for the first time in the same year. The text is as follows. The Jewish people as a whole is its own messiah. Its kingdom over the universe is obtained through the uniting of the other human races, through the suppression of frontiers and of monarchies, which are bulwarks for particularism and hinder the erection of a world republic where citizenship is everywhere recognized to the Jew. In this new organization of mankind, the sons of Israel, who at present are scattered over the entire earth's surface, will all be of the same race and of the same traditional culture, without, however, forming another nationality, and will be without contradiction the leading element in all parts, particularly if it is successful in laying upon the masses of workers a permanent leadership by some Jews. The governments of peoples all pass with the formation of the Universal Republic effortlessly into the hands of the Israelites in favor of the victory of the proletariat. Then the personal property of the rulers will be able to be suppressed by the rulers of the Jewish race who will everywhere govern over the property of the peoples. Then the promise of the Talmud will be fulfilled, that when the time of the Messiah has come, the Jews will have the goods of all peoples of the world in their possession. 20. If one follows these tactics of economic accumulation, then it is completely natural that we see how the richest financiers and the most important bankers of the world finance the communist revolutions. It is also not difficult, 
bearing in mind the data mentioned, to explain a situation, which superficially studied appears senseless and absurd, namely that one always sees the richest Jews of the world united with the Israelite leaders of the communist movements. If the explanations of the most well-known Jews suffice to show us this close connection with clarity, then the evident facts are still all the clearer, so that they wipe away even the slightest trace of doubt. After the French defeat of 1870 and the fall of the Emperor Napoleon III, the Marxists, led by Karl Marx from London, formed the Commune from the 18th of March 1871 onwards. During this period of more than two months, in Paris the National Guard, which had been transformed into an armed organization, was through and through dependent on the Marxist International. When the Commune could not resist the attack of the troops of the government, with its seat at Versailles, and the Communists saw their defeat as unavoidable, they devoted themselves to robbery, murder and incendiarism, in order to destroy the capital, in accordance with the plan already proposed by Clausewitz in the year 1869. Ourselves or nothing. I promise you, Paris will belong to us or cease to exist. Upon this occasion was clearly revealed the joint guilt of the French Jewish bankers together with the Communists, when it is established how Sallust in his book Les Origines Secrets du Bolshevism alludes to the fact that Rothschild exercised pressure on one side in Versailles with Thiers, the President of the Republic, in order to prevent a decisive fight against the Marxist Communists, by his talking of a possible understanding and agreements with the Central Committee of the Federals, Marxists and on the other side enjoyed a total protection of his person as also of his property in the city of Paris, which was thrown into a horrible and bloody chaos. In this respect Sallust tells us in his aforementioned work, page 137. It is certain that M. Rothschild had good reasons to hold a conciliation possible. His villa in the Rue Saint Florentin was protected day and night by a guard troop of the Federals, Marxists who had the task of preventing any plundering. This protective troop was maintained for two months, up to the moment when the Great Barricade, which was only a few paces away, was taken by the Versailles troops. While hostages were shot, the most beautiful palaces of Paris went up in flames and thousands of Frenchmen died as victims of the Civil War. It is worth mentioning that the protection granted by the Communists to the great Jewish banker did not cease for a moment. In the year 1916, the lieutenant general of the Imperial Russian Army, A. Nuchvolodov, described secret information which had been received from one of his agents, which on the 15th February of the same year reached the supreme command of the Russian general staff and read as follows. The first secret assembly, which reveals the beginning of the acts of violence, took place on Monday, the 14th February, in the east side of New York, of the 62 representatives gathered. Fifty were veterans of the Revolution of 1905, and the others new members. The greater part of those present were Jews and among them many educated people, as for example, doctors, writers, etc. Some professional revolutionaries were also found amongst them. The first hours of this assembly were almost exclusively devoted to testing the methods and the possibilities of carrying out a great revolution in Russia. It was one of the most favorable moments for this. It was stated that the party had just received information from Russia, according to which the situation was completely and absolutely favorable, for all previously agreed conditions for a favorable rising were present. The one serious hindrance was the question of money, but scarcely was this remark made, when several members at once answered that this circumstance should cause no reflection, for, at the moment when it was necessary, substantial sums would be given by persons who sympathized with the movement for freedom. In this connection the name of Jacob Schiff was repeatedly mentioned. At the beginning of the year 1919, the Secret Service of the United States of America provided high officials of the French Republic who visited America with a memorandum, in which the participation of the most principal bankers in the preparation of the Russian Communist Revolution was categorically revealed. 7618 provided by the General Staff of the 20th Army, No. 912 SR.2, copy. In February 1916 it became known for the first time that a revolution was being promoted in Russia. 
it was discovered that the following named persons and firms were involved in this work of destruction. 1. Jacob Schiff, Jew. 2. Kuhn, Loeb & Co., Jewish firm. Directors. Jacob Schiff, Jew. Felix Warburg, Jew. Otto Kahn, Jew. Mortimer Schiff, Jew. Hieronymus H. Hanauer, Jew. 3. Guggenheim, Jew. 4. Max Brietung, Jew. At the beginning of the year 1917, Jacob Schiff began to protect the Jew and Freemason Trotsky, whose real name is Bronstein. The mission given to him consisted in the directing of the social revolution in Russia. The New York Paper Forward, a Jewish Bolshevist daily paper, likewise protected him for the same purpose. Also he was aided financially by the Jewish firm of Max Warburg, Stockholm, the Rhinish Westphalist Syndicate, the Jew Olaf Askberg of the Nye Banks, Stockholm, and the Jew Joe Votovsky, whose daughter Trotsky married. In this manner relations were established between the Jewish multimillionaires and the proletarian Jew. The Jewish firm of Kuhn, Loeb and Company has links with the Rhinish Westphalian Syndicate, a Jewish firm in Germany just as it has links with Lazard Frères, a Jewish house in Paris, and also with the Jewish firm of Gunsberg of Paris, and with the same Jewish firm of Gunsberg of Petrograd, Tokyo and Paris, if we observe in addition that all affairs are likewise handled with the Jewish firms of Speyer & Co., London, New York and Frankfurt, Maine, exactly as with the firms of Nye Banks, who are the agents for Jewish Bolshevist business affairs in Stockholm. Then we can draw the inference from this that the banking firm has relations with all Bolshevist movements, one can see that in praxis it represents the true expression of a general Jewish movement, and that certain Jewish banking houses are interested in the organization of these movements. In the pamphlet of S. De Bamond we again find something new about the banking house of Kuhn and Company. Jacob Schiff was an Israelite of German origin. His father, who lived in Frankfurt, was in that city a modest local agent of the firm of Rothschild. The son emigrated to the United States. There he rapidly made a career which soon made him chief of the large firm of Kuhn, Locke & Co., the most important Israelite bank of America. In the Jewish banking world Jacob Schiff not only distinguished himself through his knowledge of business and the daredevilry of his inventive power, but he also occasioned very resolute plans and intentions, even if neither new nor original concerning the leading political activity that each banking system should exert over the fates of the world, the spiritual direction of human affairs. Another of the constant concerns of this plutocrat was mixing at all cost in the political affairs of Russia, in order to bring about a change of regime in that land. The political conquest of Russia, which up to then had evaded the influence of Freemasonry thanks to its regime of reason, should be the best circle of effect to secure the power of Israel over the entire universe. In the spring of 1917, Jacob Schiff began to instruct Trotsky, a Jew, how he should carry out the social revolution in Russia. The Jewish Bolshevistic newspaper of New York, Forward, also concerned itself with the same theme. From Stockholm as center, the Jew Max Warburg authorized Trotsky and Co., as did Rhinish Westphalian Syndicate an important Jewish company, as well as Olaf Askberg of the Nye Bank of Stockholm, and Yevotsky, a Jew, whose daughter married Trotsky. At the same time a Jew, Paul Warburg, was found to have such a close connection with the Bolshevists that he was not selected again to the Federal Reserve Board. The Times of London of 9 February 1918 and the New York Times alluded in two articles by Samuel Gompers which were published in the issues of 10 May 1922 and 31 December 1923, to the following. If we bear in mind that the Jewish firm of Kuhn, Loeb and Company is connected with the Rhinish Westphalian Syndicate, a Jewish firm in Germany, with Lazard Frères, a Jewish firm of Paris, and also with the banking house of Gunsberg, a Jewish firm in Petrograd, Tokyo and Paris, and if we in addition point out that the aforementioned Jewish trading firms maintain close relations to the Jewish firm of Speyer & Company in London, New York and Frankfurt, Maine, as likewise with Nye Banks, a Jewish Bolshevist firm in Stockholm, then we can establish that the Bolshevist movement in itself is to a certain degree the expression of a universal Jewish movement, 
and that certain Jewish banking houses are interested in the organization of this movement. General Nichvola doth alludes in his work Lean per Nicholas II at Les Juifs, 1924, to the strong Jewish financing of the Communist Revolution in Russia. During the years which preceded the revolution, Jacob Schiff had supplied the Russian revolutionaries with $12 million. On their side the triumphant Bolshevists, according to M. Bakhmediev, the ambassador of the Russian imperial government in the United States, who died some time ago in Paris, transferred 600 million gold rubles between 1918 and 1922 to the firm of Loeb & Co. According to these convincing proofs I do not believe that it occurs to anyone to arrive at the optimistic conclusion that there exist wicked Jews, the communists, and good Jews, the capitalists, further, that, while the ones strive to cut off the wealth of private persons and to cause private property to vanish, the others strive for the defense of both things, so as not to lose their enormous riches. To the misfortune of our civilization the Jewish conspiracy shows features of unconditional unity. Judaism forms a monolithic power, which is directed at forcing together all riches of the world without exception, by means of communist socialism according to Marx. At the present time one sees in our civilized world the admission of racial discrimination as the greatest sin into which man could fall. It is alleged to be a fault that leaves behind an eternal and ugly world of barbarity and animal nature, always presupposing that the Jewish people does not in practice commit this fault. Thanks to Jewish propaganda, which is controlled almost exclusively in the world by the Israelites, cinema, radio, press, television, publishing, etc., antisemitism is the most disgraceful of all racial manifestations. For the Jews have made out of anti-Semitism a truly destructive weapon, which serves to nullify the efforts of countless persons and organizations who have clearly recognized who the real head of communism is, in spite of the camouflage and cunning that this race uses to conceal its true activity. Particularly such persons and organizations that have tried to sound the alarm, since they were filled with horror at the fatal end which draws nearer and nearer. This network of lies is so successful that the majority of anti-communists who wish to make an end of the Marxist monster, direct their energetic and courageous attacks against the tentacles of the octopus and know nothing of the existence of the terrible head which renews the destroyed limbs, conducts its movements and brings the activities in all parts of its system into harmony. The sole possibility or destroying the communist socialism of Marx consists in attacking the head of the same which at present is Jewry as the undeniable fact and irrefutable evidence of the Jews themselves allow to be discerned. While the Christian lands are anti-racialist, because they build up their ideas on the concept of loving one's neighbor, the Jews were and are at present the most fanatical representatives of racial discrimination, which they base on ideas from the Talmud, because they proceed from the principle that the non-Jew is not even a human being. However, this Christian opposition to racial discrimination is very skillfully utilized by the Jews, and in the shadow of the same they weld their devilish intrigues against the Catholic Church and all Christian order, by their forming the communist system, where there is neither God nor Church nor supersensual norms of any kind. As soon as they are attacked, they protest with crying lamentation and show themselves as victims of inhuman racial discrimination only for the purpose of crippling that work of defense which opposes their destructive attacks. In spite of this, one can regard the real defense against communism, which must be forcefully directed against the Jews, against the head, in no manner as a sinful manifestation of a feeling of revulsion towards a definite race, for the characteristic of racial discrimination is completely alien to our culture and our Christian principles, however, one cannot avoid a problem of such weight and range out of fear of being described as an anti-Semite, which doubtless occurs with those who do not understand the present situation of the world. Thus it is not a question of combating a race out of considerations of racial order. If one at present brings the problem under close inspection, the Jews alone must bear the responsibility of leaving us no other choice because of their racial discrimination in life and death with their absolute disregard of all who are not of their race and with their greed for world domination. For Catholics in particular, and for the civilized world in general, who still firmly believe in their established principles and otherworldly values, the confirmation cannot be simpler, for it is a problem of self-defense, 
which is accepted completely in the moral and just order, if the pure dilemma, which Judaism shows us, is the following, either Jewish communist domination or extermination. Chapter 5. Jewish Testimony. In spite of their accustomed seclusion, and even in spite of their deceptive and clandestine maneuvers, by which they have been successful in remaining concealed, so as not to reveal their communist plan for world conquest, the Jews have had several weak moments, to which they have been induced either through optimism or excessive jubilation in the studying of their successes and which upon different occasions have called forth impetuous but highly factual declarations. Kadmi Cohen, a highly regarded Jewish writer, affirms that, as far as the Jews are concerned, then, their role in world socialism is so important that one cannot pass quietly over it. Does it not suffice to recall the names of the great Jewish revolutionaries of the 19th and 20th centuries, such as Karl Marx, Lissau, Kurt Eisner, Bielikun, Trotsky and Leon Blum, so that in this manner it is clear who are the theoreticians of modern socialism? What a brilliant confirmation do the strivings of the Jews find in communism? Apart from the material cooperation in party organizations, in the deep revulsion which a great Jew and great poet, Heinrich Hein, felt against Roman law, and the personal and passionate motives for the anger of Rabbi Akula and Bar Kashab of the years 70 and 132 after Jesus Christ, against the Roman peace and the Roman law which was understood personally and passionately and felt by a Jew of the 19th century, who had apparently preserved no bond with his own race. The Jewish revolutionaries and Jewish communists, who dispute the basic principle of private property whose firmly established foundation is the civil law book of Justinian, Avulpian, etc., only imitate their forefathers who opposed Vespasian and Titus. In reality it is the dead who speak. The blasphemous Jewish writer Alfred Nossig tells us, Socialism and the Mosaic law no way oppose one another. But there exists on the contrary a surprising similarity between the basic ideas of both teachings. Jewish nationalism may not remove itself, as a danger that threatens the ideal, further from socialism than the Jew from the Mosaic law, for both parallel running ideals must arrive in the same way at execution. From the examination of the facts of the case it is revealed in a completely irrefutable manner that the modern Jews have cooperated in a decisive way and manner in the creation of socialism, their own fathers were already the founders of the Mosaic Law. The seed of the Mosaic Law took effect over the centuries upon doctrine and command, in conscious manner for the one and unconsciously for the other. The modern socialist movement is for the great majority a work of the Jews. The Jews gave it the stamp of their understanding, it was also Jews who had a striking share in the leadership of the first socialist republics. In spite of this, the enormous majority of Jewish socialist leaders were divorced from the Mosaic law, for in an unconscious manner there took effect within them the racial principle of the Mosaic law, and the race of the old apostolic peoples lived in their brain and in their social character. Present world socialism forms the first state and fulfillment of the Mosaic Law, the beginning of the realization of the future world state, which was announced by the prophets. In his book Integral Jews he confirms this idea of socialism as Jewish teaching, when he writes the following. If the peoples really wish to make progress, they must lay aside the medieval fear of the Jews and the red regressive prejudices which they have against the latter. They must recognize what they really are namely the most upright forerunners of human development. At the present day the salvation of Jewry demands that we openly recognize the program facing the world, and the salvation of mankind in the coming centuries depends upon the victory of this program. The reason for this Jewish revolutionary conduct is clearly explained by the well-known Jewish writer E. Eberlin in the following excerpt. The more radical the revolution is, all the more freedom and equality for the Jews comes about as a result. Every current of progress strengthens further the position of the Jews. In the same manner, every setback and every reaction attacks it in first place. Often, only a simple orientation towards the right will expose the Jews to boycott. From this aspect the Jew is the pressure valve for the social, steam, boiler. As a body the Jewish people cannot stand on the side of reaction, for reaction is the return to the past and means for the Jews the continuation of their abnormal conditions of existence. The ill-reputed Jew, 
Jacob von Haas, says to us in the Maccabean quite clearly that the Russian revolution that we experienced is a revolution of Jewry. It signifies a change in the history of the Jewish people. If we speak openly, it was the Jewish revolution, for the Jews were the most energetic revolutionaries in Russia. In the Jewish-French newspaper entitled Le Pupil Jew of February 1919, one can read the following, The Russian Revolution, which we see at present, will be the exclusive work of our hands. One finds the following passage in a book by the famous Jewish writer Samuel Schwartz with a foreword by Ricardo Horque, When we ascend from the heights of pure science to the place of battle, which the passions and the interests of men clash against each other, there rises before us the oracle of the new social political religion, the Jew Karl Marx, the dogmatic leader of war for life and death. He finds in the head and in the arm of Lenin the realization of his confession of belief and sees in him the forefighter for the Soviet state that threatens to overthrow the firm foundations of the traditional institutions of society. In the same way another Jew, Hans Cohen, confirms in the political idea that the socialism of Marx is the purpose of our striving and efforts. In number 12 of the newspaper The Communist which was published in Kharkov on the 12th of April 1919, the Jew M. Cohen writes, Without exaggeration one can make the assurance that the great social revolution in Russia was carried out by the Jews. It is true that in the ranks of the Red Army there are soldiers who are not Jews. But in the committees and in the society organizations, just as with the commissars, the Jews lead the masses of the Russian proletariat to victory with courage. At the head of the Russian revolutionaries marched the pupils of the rabbinic school of Lydia. Jewry triumphed over fire and sword, with our brother Marx, who had the mandate for the fulfillment of all that our prophets have commanded, and who worked out the suitable plan for the demands of the proletariat. All these sentences appeared in the Jewish newspaper Hey Ijit of Warsaw of 3rd of August 1928. The Jewish World, of 10th of January 1929, expressed this blaspheming view, Bolshevism, the very fact of its existence, and that so many Jews are Bolsheviks, further, that the ideal of Bolshevism is in harmony with the most sublime ideal of Jewry, which in part formed the foundation for the best teachings of the founder of Christianity. All this has a deep significance, which the thoughtful Jew carefully examines. In order not to range too widely at this point, we quote in conclusion the allusions which the Israelite Paul Sokolowski makes in his work, entitled The Mission of Europe, where he boasts of the predominant role which the Jews played in the Russian Revolution and reveals details concerning the secret codes which they used to reach understanding with each other, even by means of the press without the attention of the authorities being drawn to themselves, and how they distributed the communist propaganda that they prepared through the Jewish children, whom they carefully schooled for these services in their settlements. The hellish, Jewish communist hate, which is chiefly revealed against Christian civilization, is not unfounded, but it has its very deep causes, which can be judged with full clarity in this following excerpt from the Sefer HaZohar, the holy book of modern Jewry which represents the feelings of all Jews. Jesu, Jesus, the Nazarene, who has brought the world away from belief in Jehovah, who be praised, will each Friday be again restored. At daybreak of Saturday he will be thrown into boiling oil. Hell will pass, but his punishment and his tortures will never end. Jesus and Muhammad are those unclean bones of awful of which the scripture says, ye shall cast before the dogs. They are the dirt of the dog the unclean, and because they have misled men, they are cast into hell, from which they never again come out. Part 2. The Power Concealed Behind Freemasonry. Chapter 1. Freemasonry as Enemy of the Church and of Christianity. In view of the fact that the theme of this second book has been dealt with in such a masterly way and with such depth by outstanding and exactly instructed personages like His Holiness Pope Leo XIII the high-dignified Cardinal José María Caro Rodríguez, Archbishop of Santiago de Chile, Monsignor Leon Murin, S.J., Archbishop, Bishop of Port Louis, and various other illustrious church and secular writers, we can restrict ourselves to writing down literally such authorized excerpts, without in the least enfeebling their great regard. His Holiness Leo XIII says in his encyclical Humanum Genus exactly as follows. The Popes our forefathers, 
who bore conscientious concern for the spiritual salvation of the Christian peoples, soon knew very well who this deadly enemy was and what he wished, even if he hardly ever came out of the darkness of his secret conspiracy into the light, and accordingly, when he had spread his word of revolution, they exhorted princes and peoples to caution that they might not allow themselves to be caught by the malicious arts and traps which were prepared to deceive them. The first announcement of the danger was given in the year 1738 by Pope Clement XII, Constitution in Eminendi, 24th of April 1738, which Order Benedict XIV confirmed and renewed, Constitution Providas, 18th May 1751, Pius VII, Constitution Ecclesia Majesu Christi, 13th September 1821, followed the path of both, and Leo XII, who in the Apostolic Constitution Quo Grave Euro, Constitution given 13th of March 1825, incorporated in this material the decrees passed by his predecessors, authorized and confirmed the same forever. Pius VIII, Encyclical Tradudi, 21st of May 1829, Gregory XVI, Encyclical Mrari, 15th of August 1835, and Pius IX, Encyclical Qui Pluribus, 9th of November 1816, Allocution Multiplices Inter, 25th of September 1865, etc., naturally spoke repeatedly in the same sense. According to the example of our predecessors, we have now resolved to openly turn ourselves against the Freemasonic Society, against the system of their doctrine, against their manner of feeling and acting, to evermore make clear their harmful power and thus to prevent infection by such a destructive plague. The good tree can bring forth no bad fruits, nor can the bad tree bring forth good fruits. Matthew chapter 7. V. 18. And the fruits of the Freemasonry sects are harmful and in addition very sour. For, from the completely reliable proofs that we have mentioned previously, is revealed the ultimate and last and most principle of their intentions, namely, to destroy to their foundations every religious and civic order that has been erected by Christianity and after their own manner to erect a new order with foundations and laws, which they took from the essence of naturalism. The confusing errors, which we have enumerated, must already suffice in themselves to fill the states with anxiety and fear. For, if the fear of God and respect for the laws is abolished, if the authority of the princes is despised, if the madness of revolution is called good and is declared as lawful, if with the greatest unbridledness the passions of the peoples are unchained, without other hindrance than punishment, then universal upheaval and disorder must necessarily follow. And it is particularly this upheaval and disorder that is planned and put forward by many associations of communists and socialists, of whose plans it cannot be said that they are remote from the sect of the Freemasons, since they favor the latter's intentions in great measure and agree with them on the most fundamental principles. However this may be, worthy brothers, as far as concerns us in the face of such a heavy and already widespread evil, we must be diligent with our entire soul in seeking for aid. And since we know, that the best and foremost hope of aid is placed in the power of the divine religion, which is hated by the Freemasons in the same way as it is feared, we hold it to be essential that we stand in service of this healing power against the common enemy. Everything accordingly that all the popes our predecessors have ordered to hold up the attempts and efforts of the Freemasonic sects, everything which they praised to keep men away from such societies or entice them from them, we strengthen and confirm individually and entirely with our papal authority. 1. As one sees, both His Holiness Leo XIII as well as various earlier popes are very clear in their condemnation of Freemasonry and recognize simultaneously the latter's intentions in association with socialists and communists, to destroy Christianity, and who directs Freemasonry. As we wish to explain in the following chapters, it is the same who directs socialism and communism, that is the Jews. Chapter 2. The Jews as Founders of Freemasonry. To unmask Freemasonry, said Leo XIII, means to conquer it. When we lift its mask, then every honest mind and every Christian heart will turn away from it with revulsion, and through this fact alone will it fall, completely destroyed and detested particularly by those who obey it. The learned scholar and Jesuit Monsignor Leon Murin, S.J., Archbishop, Bishop of Port Louis, 
shows us in his so very richly authenticated work, Clarification of Freemasonry, with crushing authority that the Jews are the founders, organizers and leaders of Freemasonry, which they use to attain world domination, in order to destroy the Holy Catholic Church and the remaining existing religions. Among the attested literature that he presents in this connection appear several quotations, which we mention in the following. The first highest Masonic Council was, as we have already said, formed on 31 May 1801 in Charleston, 33 degrees northern latitude, under the chairmanship of the Jew Isaac Long, who was made Inspector General by the Jew Moses Cohen, and who had received his degree from Heise, from Franken, and the Jew Morin. The Jews were thus the founders of the first great council, which was to transform itself into the middle point of world Freemasonry. And they placed it in America, in a city chosen exactly on the 33rd parallel, northern latitude. The successive head has lived in Charleston since 1801. In the year, 1889 this was Albert Pike, whom we have already mentioned in his circular letter of 14th of July 1889, the famed anniversary and tercentenary. He assumes the title of each of the 33 degrees and in addition adds the following. Most mighty and all highest commander, Grand Master of the Supreme Council of Charleston, First Highest Council of the Globe, Grand Master and Preserver of the Holy Palladium, All Highest Pontifex of World Freemasonry. With these pompous titles he published his circular letter in the one and thirtieth year of his pontificate, supported by ten high dignitaries most enlightened and most sublime brothers, rulers, grand general inspectors, chosen magi, who form the most illustrious grand collegium of ancient Freemasons, the Council of the Chosen Troops and of the Holy Battalion of the Order. The circular letter enumerates the twenty-three highest councils, which previously were directly created through that of Charleston and are dispersed over the entire world. Then it lists the hundred grand orients and grand lodges of all rites which are connected with the highest council of Charleston as the all highest power of Freemasonry, the exclusive right of the Jews. For example, the Grand Orient of France, the General Council of the Right of Mizraim, the Grand Council of the Freemason Odd Fellows, etc. From the preceding we must conclude that Freemasonry all over the world is one in countless forms, however, under the supreme direction of the All Highest Pontifex of Charleston. Jewish Origin The rites and symbols of the Freemasons and of the other secret sects remind one constantly of the Kabbalah, secret Jewish mystique, and Jewry, the reconstruction of the Temple of Solomon, the Star of David, the Seal of Solomon, the names of the different degrees, as for example, Knight Katosh. Katosh means in Hebrew holy, Prince of Jerusalem. Prince of Lebanon, Knight of the Serpent of Arain, etc. And does not the prayer of the English Freemasons, which was recorded in an assembly held in 1663, recall Judaism in a most clear manner? 5. Finally the Scottish Freemasons made use of the Jewish calendar, for example, a book, which was written by the American Freemason Pike in the year 1881, is dated Anno Mundi 5641. At present this calendar is retained only in the highest degrees, while the Freemasons in general add 4,000 years to the Christian calendar, and not 3,760 like the Jews. The clever Rabbi Ben Amuzig writes the following. Those who wish to make the effort to examine the questions of relations between Jewry and philosophic Freemasonry, between theosophy and the secret doctrines in general, will lose a little of their arrogant despisal of the Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. They will cease to smile contemptuously at the idea that the Kabbalistic theology perhaps has to fulfill a mission in the religious reshaping of the future. 8. Who are the true leaders of Freemasonry? This is one of the secrets of the sect, which is very carefully kept, but one can assert that Freemasonry all over the world develops in agreement with one and the same plan, that its methods are always and in all parts identical, and that the aims pursued are permanently the same. This occasioned us to believe that a uniform middle point exists, which directs all movements of the sect. Further on we will touch upon this question, however, here let us recall that Carta de Colonia, dated 24th of June 1935, speaks of a director of Freemasonry, the Grand Master or Patriarch, who, although known by very few brothers, 
exists in reality, and Gao Jianat de Musk points out that this choice of the order, these real directors, whom only a very few initiates know, exercise their function in useful and secret dependency upon the Israelite Kabbalists, mystics, page 338-339 and that the true directors of Freemasonry are the friends, the helpers and the vassals of the Jew to whom they do homage as their highest lords. The same judgment is shared by Eckert, Drumont, Deschamps, Monsignor, Juin, Lamblin and other savants of Freemasonic and Jewish questions. Let us leave the dogmatic teachings of the Freemasons and Jewry to one side and let us examine the alliances between both from the purely practical and realistic standpoint. If one proceeds logically, one cannot avoid drawing the conclusion which is formulated by L. de Ponson's in The Secret Powers Behind Revolution. The manifoldness of Freemasonry, its permanence, the inalterability of its goals, which are completely explicable since it is a question of a Jewish creation to serve the Jewish interests, would be completely incomprehensible if its origin were of a Christian nature. Even the purpose in itself of Freemasonry namely the destruction of Christian civilization, reveals to us the Jew, for only the Jew can draw advantage from it, and the Jew alone is inspired by a sufficiently violent hatred towards Christianity to create such an organization. Freemasonry, continues de Ponsons, is a secret society and is directed by an international minority. It has sworn Christianity an irreconcilable hatred. These three characteristics are exactly the same as those that describe Jewry and represent the proof that the Jews are the leading element of the lodges. Already in 1867 the Permanent International League for a Peace came into existence, and its secretary, the Jew Passy, outlined the ideas of the Court of Justice, to settle all conflicts between the nations without appeal. The newspaper The Israelite Archive dreamed of a similar Court of Justice in the year 1864. Is it not natural and necessary, wrote a certain Levy Bing, that as soon as possible we see erected an additional court of justice, and in fact the highest court of justice, to whom the great open conflicts and the quarrels among the nations are submitted, which in the last instance passes judgment, and whose last word is given powerful weight. This will be the word of God, which is uttered by his firstborn sons, the Hebrews and before which the general rest of mankind will bow in respect before our brothers, our friends and our pupils. These are the dreams of Israel. As always they accord with those of Freemasonry. The Freemasons' calendar writes, When the Republic has been set up in the whole of old Europe, Israel, as ruler will rule over this old Europe. At the World Congress of Jewish Youth, which was held on 4th of August 1928, H. Justin Goddard announced that the Jews were the firmest supporters of the League of Nations, which had to thank its existence to them. The Jew Kassin gave more exact information. The rebirth of Zionism is the work of the League of Nations. Through it the Jewish organizations place themselves as defenders of the League of Nations, and therefore Geneva swarms with representatives of the chosen people. The most venerable Cardinal José María Caro R., Archbishop of Santiago and Primate of Chile also proves, in his authoritatively supported work The Secret of Freemasonry, that it is the Jews who direct this sect, in order to rule the world and to destroy Holy Church. In connection with its origin he affirms, The Freemasonic rite clearly betrays its Jewish origin, the symbols, which begin with the Bible itself, the coat of arms upon which an attempt is made to explain the different forms of the cherubim described by Ezekiel in his second poem, An Ox, a Man a lion and an eagle, the two pillars of the Freemasonic Temple in remembrance of the Temple of Solomon, the rebuilding of the Temple which is the work of the Freemasons, etc. The reading matter and the handbooks, which in greater part are taken from the Bible, they turn almost always towards Freemasonic taste, especially the legend of Hiram, which plays an important role in the Freemasonic rite. The customary words and expressions, like the names of the pillars Boaz and Jigen, the words of knowledge and of admittance, to Balkane, Shibboleth, Jiblim or Moan, Nekim or Nekam, a Bibolk, etc., the importance, which is allotted to numbers, a matter very original to the Kabbalah, all these are further proofs of the Kabbalistic influence on Freemasonry. Finally the facts, the rule of terror, the outbreak of satanic hatred against the Church, 
against our Lord Jesus Christ, the terrible blasphemies against God that the revolutionary Freemasons perpetrated in France, are nothing more than the expression and the fulfillment of the Kabbalistic and secret sects, which already for several centuries have fought secretly against Christianity. What the Jewish Bolshevists to greatest part do in Russia against Christianity, is only another edition of the deeds of the Freemasons in the French Revolution. The executioners are others, however the doctrine that motivates and empowers them and the supreme leadership are the same. Chapter 3. The Jews as the Leaders of the Freemasons. The famous and learned Jesuit, Monsignor Leon Murin, Archbishop of Port Louis, confirms in his authoritatively substantiated work philosophy of Freemasonry the following. The first degrees of Freemasonry are intended for the purpose, as we will see further below, of transforming the layman into real men in the Freemasonic sense. The second section, which passes from the 12th to 22nd degree, is intended to dedicate men to the Jewish pontifex, and the third section of the 23rd to 33rd degree must dedicate the pontifex to the Jewish king or Kabbalistic emperor. The first thing that surprises the new disciple of Elodge is the Jewish character of everything which he finds there. From the first to the thirtieth degree he hears only talk of the great work of rebuilding the Temple of Solomon, of the murdering of the architect Hiram Abif, of the two pillars Boaz and Jigen, 3, King 7, 21, of a host of secret symbols, signs, and Hebrew holy words, and of the Jewish calendar, which adds four thousand years to our own so as not to honor the birth of the Divine Savior. After the Jews had set up Freemasonry in different lands, they secured themselves predominance in the Grand Orients by number and in influence. On the other hand, they set up a great number of lodges exclusively for Jews. Even before the Revolution of 1789, the brothers Ecker and Eckhoffen had founded in Hamburg the Lodge of Melchizedek, which was reserved for Jews. The Hebrews von Hirschfeld in Cutter founded towards end of the 18th century in Berlin the Lodge of Tolerance. Since that time, the Jews used the trick of bringing Jews and Christians closer, to ideologically and politically control or lead astray the later. However, at that time they had to take their refuge in the secret leagues since the laws and customs of the Christian states of Europe revealed satisfactory measures which had the aim of protecting the Christians against cheating by the Jews. The secret Freemasons paper of Leipzig said in their October number of 1864 that the middle point of the Jewish lodges in Paris was under the direction of Kremux and the Grand Rabbi. The doctrines, signs and degrees of Freemasonry come from Jewry. The famous Archbishop Bishop of Port Louis says, when he speaks of the Jewish origin of Freemasonic doctrines, the following. The doctrines of Freemasonry are those of the Jewish Kabbalah mysticism, and in particular those of their book Sohar, Light. This is not recorded in any Freemasonic document, for it is one of the great secrets, which the Jews preserve so that only they themselves know it. Nevertheless we have been able to discover it, when we followed the traces of the number 11. Here we have discovered the fundamental doctrines of the Jewish Kabbalah which were taken up into Freemasonry. In the preceding chapters there remained always a certain number of Freemasonic signs that were more or less inapplicable. All of this, which plays a role in Freemasonry and its history, allows itself to be applied with astonishing ease to the Jewish people. What exists in reality in Freemasonry, is all completely, exclusively, and passionately Jewish from beginning to end. What possible interest have the other peoples in rebuilding the Temple of Solomon? Do they do it on their own account or in account of the Jews? Have these peoples or the Jews a use therefrom? What advantages does the fact represent that one destroys the other, so that, in the end all over the world, the princes of Jerusalem, 16th degree, the heads of the tabernacle, 23rd degree, or the princes of the tabernacle, 24th degree, triumph? Have the peoples become united, so as to serve the Jews as a footstool? Psalm 109, Why do they hurry to set upon their head the crown, Kether, and to lay the kingdom, Malkuth, at their feet? It is so evident that Freemasonry is only a tool in the hands of the Jews, which only they in reality lead, that one feels tempted to believe that the non-Jewish Freemasons, on the same day when their eyes are bound for the first time, lose their understanding and their power of judgment. 
the Freemasonic respect for the Jews. The most dignified Cardinal Caro says in his work The Secret of Freemasonry. In Freemasonry a great and quite special respect is always shown for the Jews. If there is talk of superstition, the Jewish religion is never mentioned. Upon outbreak of the French Revolution, French citizenship was urgently demanded for the Jews. Although it was rejected on the first occasion, it was expressly urged that it be granted, and it was allowed. The reader will recall that in those days the Catholics were persecuted to death. When the Commune ruled in Paris and it was necessary to protect the cash of the Bank of France against plundering, no one threatened the Jewish banks. La Franc. Mass. Sec. Juive. Freemasonry has regarded anti-Semitism with revulsion, and in fact so much so that an anti-Semitic brother, who believed honorably in the tolerance of political opinions by Freemasonry, once placed himself as candidate for the Chamber of Deputies in France and was even elected. When the question of re-election arose, instructions were expressly given to the lodges that war was to be waged against him. Such instructions, which one almost never hears openly in the lodges, had to be followed. The Jewish predominance in the lodges. In the year 1862 a Berlin Freemason, who noticed the Jewish predominance in the lodges, wrote in a Munich paper, there exists in Germany a secret sect with Freemasonic forms, which is subject to unknown leaders. The members of this association are in their great majority Israelites. In London, where, as one knows, the revolutionary herd are found around the Grand Master Palmerston, there exist two Jewish lodges that have never seen Christians cross their threshold, it is there that are combined all the threads of the revolutionary elements which nestle in the Christian lodges. In Rome there is a further lodge, which consists completely of Jews, and where all threads as well as plots instigated in the Christian lodges unite, the Supreme Court of Justice of the Revolution. From there outwards the other lodges are directed as by secret leaders, so that the greater part of the Christian revolutionaries are only marionettes who are set in motion by Jews by means of the secret leaders. In Leipzig exists by occasion of the fair which a part of the high Jewish and Christian merchants of all Europe attend, a permanent secret Jewish lodge in which a Christian Freemason is never accepted. This opens the eyes of more than one of us. There are secret envoys, who alone have admittance to the Jewish lodges of Hamburg and Frankfurt. Gaugenat de Musques reports the following occurrence, which confirms the ensuing statements, with the breaking out again of the Revolution of 1848, I had connections with a Jew who out of vanity betrayed the secrets of the secret societies of which he was a member. The latter instructed me eight or ten days in advance of all revolutions that would break out in any point of Europe. I have to thank him for the unshakable conviction that all these great movements of repressed peoples, etc. were instigated by half a dozen persons who imparted their instructions to the secret societies of the whole of Europe. The ground under our feet is through and through undermined and the Jewish people provided an entire contingent of these subterranean agitators. In the year 1870 de Camille wrote in Le Mans that he met a Freemason upon a round trip through Italy, one of his old acquaintances. To his question how things went with the order, he answered, I have finally left the lodge of my order for I have gained the deep conviction that we were only the tools of the Jews, who drive us to the total destruction of Christianity. La FM Sect Juive 4346. As confirmation of the above I will reproduce a report, which is found in the Revue des Societes Secrets, p. 118-119, 1924. 1. The Golden International, International Plutocracy and High Finance, at whose head are found. A. In America, J. P. Morgan, Rockefeller, Vanderbilt and Vanderlip. B in Europe, the firm of Rothschild and others of second rank. 2. The Red International or International Association of Social Democratic Workers. This comprises a. The Second International, that of Belgium, Drew Vanderveld. b. The International No. 21 halves, that of Vienna, Drew Adler. c. The Third International or Communist. International, that of Moscow, the Jews at Philbaum. Andradic. This hydra, with three heads, which, works separately for better effect, has at its disposal. Feprof Indern, 
International Bureau of Professional Associations, which has its seat in Amsterdam and which dictates the Jewish word to the syndicates that have still not been incorporated into Bolshevism. 3. The Black International or Combat Organization of Jewry. The chief roles in it are played by the World Organization of Zionists, London, the Israelite World League, which was founded in Paris by the Jew Kremlux, the Jewish Order of the B'nai Moish, Sons of Moses, and the Jewish Society Zenilsts, Hittakdout, Tarbout, Karen Hesod, and a hundred more or less masked organizations, which are dispersed over all the lands of the Old and New World. 4. The Blue International or International Freemasonry. This unites all Freemasons in the world through the United Lodge of Great Britain, through the Grand Lodge of France and through the Grand Orients of France, Belgium, Italy, Turkey and the remaining lands. The active middle point of this association is, as readers know, the Great Alpina Lodge. 5. The Jewish Freemasonic Order of Nybrith, which, contrary to the principles of the Freemasonic Lodges, accepts only Jews and which numbers over the world more than 426 purely Jewish lodges, serves as links to all the above enumerated internationals. The leaders of the B'nai B'rith are the Jews Morgenthau, former ambassador of the United States in Constantinople, Brandeis, Supreme Judge in the United States, Mack, Zionist, Warburg, Felix, Banker, Elkis, Kraus, Alfred, the first president, Schiff, already dead who supported the movement for emancipation of the Jews in Russia with financial contributions, Marshall, Louis, Zionist. We know definitely, says Nesta Webster, that the five powers, to which we have referred, the Freemasonry of the Grand Orient, Theosophy, Pan-Germanism, International Finance and the Social Revolution, have a very real existence and a very definite influence on the destinies of the world. Hereby we do not proceed from assumptions but from facts, which can be authoritatively substantiated. Since the Revolution, the Jews have most of all appeared in connection with Freemasonry. Jewish Encyclopedia. In order to attempt to overthrow the Christian religion and in particular the Catholic, the Jews took their refuge in work of agitation, by that they dispatched others imperceptibly and they themselves hid behind, in order not to reveal their intentions so greatly are they despised by all, to bring that fortress to collapse in the name of freedom. It was therefore necessary to undermine its granite foundation and to destroy the entire building of Christianity. And they set about the work of this enterprise and placed themselves at the head of this concealed world revolution by means of Freemasonry, which they had controlled. The emancipation of Jewry in France was the gain, pursued in secret, of the revolution which invented its famed human rights, rights of man, in order to place the Jews upon equal rights with all Christians. To this and nothing else extends the much-praised freedom, in whose name that terrible revolution was instigated. Chapter 4. Crimes of Freemasonry. Concerning the monstrous crimes of this masterwork of modern Jewry, which Freemasonry represents, the most dignified Cardinal Caro says, the reading of the Freemasonic ritual allows it to be discerned, at least in the highest degree, that it prepares its disciples for revenge, revolution and hence for crime. In all these rites, says Benoit, the Freemasons are subjected to an education which teaches them cruelty in theory and practice. They are told that the Freemasonic order follows the aim of avenging the death of Hiram before his three faithless companions, or the death of Damale on his murderers, the Pope the king in Nogret. In the first degree the beginner tests his courage on neck and head, which are dressed about with blood-filled entrails. In another degree, he who is accepted, must throw about heads which are placed upon a snake, or also kill a lamb, thirtieth degree of the Scottish Rite AA, with which action he believe that he kills a man. Here he must carry on bloody fights with foes who dispute his return to the fatherland. There are heads on a pole or a corpse in a coffin and the brothers in mourning vow revenge. The murdering of Rossi, the minister of Pius IX, through his former conspiratorial brothers is well known. In the year 1883 four Italians, Emiliani, Scuriati, Latsonsci and Adriani, members of Young Italy who had fled to France, were betrayed to Mazzini and his helpers as traitors. 
On 22nd of October 1916, Count Sturck, the Chancellor of Austria, was murdered. The murderer, Fritz Adler, was a Freemason and son of a Freemason, as well as member of a lodge with high Freemasonic dignitaries in Switzerland. In his declaration he defended the right to exercise justice with his own hand. In France occasioned by the Dreyfus affair the following persons were murdered, Captain Dill, who gave evidence against him, the deputy Chalin Servnier, who had received from them the details of Dreyfus's confession, the district Captain Lawrence, who revealed sums of money which had been sent from abroad to the friends of Dreyfus, in his opinion for bribery, and the prison warden Rocher, who claimed to have heard how Dreyfus partially confessed his crime. Captain Valerio, one of the witnesses against Dreyfus, and President Four who had opposed the revision of the trial, also vanished soon afterwards. All defenders of Dreyfus were Freemasons, and in addition Jews. In Sweden the brother of Gustav III was murdered by H. Ankerstrom, secret envoy of the Grand Lodge, which Condorcet had directed in accordance with the agreement of the Freemasons who have assembled in 1786 in Frankfurt, Maine. In Russia Paul I was murdered, a Freemason, who although he knew the danger from the Brotherhood, strictly forbade it. For the same reason his son, Alexander I, suffered an identical fate, who was murdered in 1825 at Taganrog. The murderers were in their entirety Freemasons. The Great Criminals of Freemasonry. Trans. Murders of laymen. In France the death of Louis XVI is attributed to them. Cardinal Matthew, Archbishop of Besançon, and Monsignor Besson, Bishop of Nîmes, have reported in letters, which are known all over the world, of the revelations which were made to them concerning the resolution taken in the convent of Wilhelmsbad to murder Louis XVI and the King of Sweden. These revelations were made to them by two former members of this convent. The murder of the Duke de Berry. The murder of Lou, the great patriot and enthusiastic Catholic of Lucerne, Switzerland were resolved upon and carried out by members of the sect. In Austria the famous crime of Sarajevo, which was the cause of the First World War, was arranged by the Freemasons, announced in advance and carried out at the given time. A high Freemasonic dignitary, of Swiss nationality, expressed himself in 1912 in this connection in the following manner. The successor to the throne is a personality with much talent, a pity that he is condemned, he will die on the way to the throne. Madame de Thebes predicted his death already two years previously. Those principally guilty were in their entirety Freemasons. All of this, says Wichtel, is no mere suspicion, but legally proven facts, which have been intentionally concealed. In Germany Marshal Eckhorn and his adjutant, Captain von Dressler, were murdered on 30th of July. 1918. The day before, the Paris Freemasons newspaper Le Matin wrote that a patriotic secret society had offered a high price for the head of a corn. One can certainly imagine what kind of society supplied this information to Le Matin. In Italy Umberto I was murdered by the anarchist Pressi, who as a Freemason belonged to a lodge in Patterson, New Jersey, United States, even though he himself had not been to America. Thus the declaration that, in certain degrees, arrogant men gave of the inscription on the cross, was transformed into its opposite, INRI, equals justum necariges Italiae, it is just to murder the kings of Italy. On 26th of March 1885, the Duke Carl III was murdered in Parma, the assassin, Antonio Cara, had the day before been chosen and incited at a secret session, whose chairmanship Lemmy performed. Lemmy was later all highest Grand Master of Italian Freemasonry, and as it appears, also of World Freemasonry. A certain Lippo had prepared a doll in order to illustrate how the most deadly dagger thrusts could be given, and the executioner was chosen by lots. On 22nd May, Ferdinand II of Naples died, he was given a poison in a slice of melon, which caused his terribly painful death. The instigator of this king's death was a Freemason who belonged to one of the most criminal branches of this sect, to that of the so-called sublime and perfect masters. He was a disciple of Mazzini and one of the most respected persons of the royal court. Marjota does not risk giving his name. Marg. A. L. 2134, with this author one can read about further countless crimes that were committed by Freemasonry in Italy. 
In Portugal, King Charles and his son Louis were murdered. The Freemasons prepared the fall of the monarchy. The Venerable H. Magalhães de Lima traveled in December 1907 to Paris, where he was solemnly received by H. Moses, the member of the Grand Lodge. Magalhães held lectures, in which he announced the fall of the monarchy in Portugal and the imminent foundation of the Republic. The well-known opponent of Freemasonry, Abbé Tormenton, wrote then that the Freemasons were clearly preparing a blow against the Portuguese royal family. He gave expression to his fear that within a short time King Charles would be driven out or murdered. Ten weeks later Tormenton's fears were fulfilled, and he openly and clearly accused the Freemasons of this murder. The latter preferred to keep silent. In America, one can read various details by Eckert concerning the persecution and murdering of Morgan in the United States, because he wished to publish a book revealing the secrets of Freemasonry, further, concerning the destruction of printing works and the persecution of the printer as well as other hateful crimes that followed upon this murder, concerning the public alarm that broke out when it was learned what favor the authorities, who as a rule were Freemasons, afforded the murderer and the support with which the lodges regarded them, Eckert, 2, 201 and sequel, also known as the murder of the President of Ecuador. Garcia Moreno. Bloodbaths, Summary Executions and Plunderings. It is necessary to read the description of the free thinker Tain, in order to have an idea of what happened in France, when in the year 1789 and the three following years the Freemasons conducted the government, more than 150,000 refugees and fugitives were imprisoned, 10,000 persons were killed without trial in a single province, that of Anjou. There were 500 dead in only one province of the West. In the year 1796, General Hosh wrote to the Ministry of the Interior. The present ratio to the population of 1789 is 1 to 20. There have been up to 400,000 prisoners at once in the prisons. More than 1,200,000 private persons have suffered injury to their person and several millions, with property, in their goods and chattels. Tain mentioned by Benoit, FM2. 268, Remark. Whoever desires more information should read the work of the most dignified Cardinal Caro, The Secret of Freemasonry. Chapter 5. Freemasonry as Spreader of the Jacobin Revolutions. The Archbishop of Port Louis, Monsignor Leon Murin, says in his work Philosophy of Freemasonry. In the year 1844, Disraeli placed the following words in the mouth of the Juicy Donia, Conings B. Vi. 15. Since English society has begun to stir and its institutions are threatened by powerful associations, they see the formerly so faithful Jews in the ranks of the revolutionaries. This mysterious diplomacy, which so disturbs the Western powers, is organized by Jews and for the greatest part also carried out by them. The monstrous revolution, which is prepared in Germany, and whose effects will be still greater than those of the Reformation, is carried out under the protectorate of the Jews. Leading its preparations and effects in Germany I see a Lithuanian Jew, in the Spanish saying your men dizable, I see a Jew from Aragon, in the president of the French Council, Marshal Soult, I recognize the son of a French Jew, in the Prussian minister, Graf Arnim, I see a Jew, as you already see, dear Koningsby. The world is ruled by personages who are very different from those who are regarded as ruling and do not work behind the scenes. During the Revolution of 1848, which was led by the Grand Orient of France, its Grand Master, the Duke Remux was Minister of Justice. In 1860 this man founded the Israelite International League and announced with incomprehensible insolence in the year 1861, in the Israelite Archives, page 651 that in place of popes and Caesars, a new kingdom, a new Jerusalem, will arise. And our good Freemasons with their blind eyes help the Jews in the great work of building up this new Temple of Solomon, this new Caesarian Papal Kingdom of the Kabbalists. In the year 1862, a Berlin Freemason had a leaflet of eight pages printed, in which he complained about the predominance of Jews in the lodges, under the title Signs of the Time. He alludes to the dangerous character of the Berlin elections of 28 April and 6 May of the year in question. An element, he said, 
has appeared on the scene and has exercised a dangerous influence which causes disintegration on all sides, the Jew. The Jews are leading in their writings, words and deeds, they are the most principal leaders and agents in all revolutionary undertakings, even in the building of barricades. One has seen this very clearly in Berlin in the year 1848. How is it possible that, in Berlin, 217 Jewish candidates were elected, and that, in two districts, only Jews were elected with the exclusion of any Christian candidates? This position of things has worsened more and more. The Jews form the majority in the city government, so that Berlin with justice could be called the capital of the Jews. In the press the Jews speak of the people and of the nation, as if there were only Jews and no Christians existed. The explanation for this could be given by the Freemasonic insiders who, following Brother Lamartine, introduced the revolutions of 1789, 1830, 1848, etc. This explanation is confirmed by Brother Garnier Pages, a minister of the Republic, who, in the year 1848, publicly declared that the Revolution of 1848 represents the triumph of the norms of the Freemasons League so that France was dedicated to Freemasonry, and that 40,000 Freemasons had promised their help to conduct to an end the glorious work of the erection of the Republic, which had been chosen to spread out over the whole of Europe and in the end over the entire earth. The high peak of all this is the political and revolutionary power of the Jews, according to the words of J. Vile, leader of the Jewish Freemasons, who in a secret report said, we exercise a powerful influence on the movements of our time and of the progress of civilization in the direction of the republicanizing of the peoples. The Jew Ludwig Boern, another Freemasonic leader, said likewise in a secret document, We have with mighty hand so much shattered the pillars upon which the old building rests that they groan and crack. Mentizable, likewise a Jew and the soul of the Spanish Revolution of 1820, set through the capture of Porto in Lisbon and in 1838, by means of his Freemasonic influence, realized the revolution in Spain, where he became Prime Minister. And His Excellence, the Archbishop, goes on to say, The Jew Mendizable had promised as minister to improve the insecure financial position of Spain, but in a short time the result of his machinations was a frightful increase of the national debt and a great diminishing of the state incomes, while he and his friends accumulated enormous riches. The sale of more than 900 Christian institutions of a religious and charitable kind, which the Cortesa, upon the instigation of the Jews, had declared to be national property, created for them a magnificent opportunity for the unparalleled increase of their personal property. In the same manner church property was dealt with. The unskillful mockery of religious and national feelings went so far that the mistress of Mendizable dared to flaunt herself in public with a wonderful necklace which a short time previously had served to decorate an image of the Holy Virgin Mary in one of the churches of Madrid. The Berlin Freemason, whom we mentioned at the beginning, said further, the danger for the throne and the altar, which are threatened by the Jewish power, has reached its highest point, and it is time to sound alarm, just as the leaders of German Freemasonry did when they said, the Jews have understood that the kingly art, the Freemasonic art, was a principal means to erect their own secret kingdom. The danger threatens not only our order, Freemasonry, but the state in general. The Jews find manifold opportunities in the lodges, to exercise their old familiar systems of briberies, by their sowing confusion in many affairs. If one bears in mind the role that the Jews played in the crimes of the French Revolution and the illegal Corsican seizure of property, if one also bears in mind the tenacious belief of the Jews in a future Israelite kingdom which will rule over the world, as well as their influence on a great number of ministers of state, one will recognize how dangerous their activity can become in Freemasonic affairs. The Jewish people forms a tribe, which hostilely opposes the entire human race, and which believes the God of Israel has only chosen one people, to whom all others must serve as footstools. Let it be borne in mind that among the 17 million inhabitants of Prussia there are only 600,000 Jews, let it be borne in mind with what convulsive zeal this people of oriental and irrepressible activity works to attain the overthrow of the state with all means, to occupy the higher teaching institutions, even by means of money, and to monopolize the government offices in its favor. 
Carlyle, one of the most authoritative Freemasonic personages, says, page 86, the Freemasonry of the Grand Lodge is at present through and through Jewish. The Kreuz Zeitung, the principal organ of the Prussian conservatives, published, from 29th June to 3rd of July 1875, a series of articles, in which it elaborated that the chief ministers in the German and Prussian government, not excluding Prince Bismarck, found themselves in the hands of the Jewish kings of the Bourse, and that the Jewish bankers were those who in practice ruled Prussia and Germany. These facts caused the Jew Gutzko to assert, the true founders of the new German Reich are the Jews, the Jews are the most advanced in all sciences, the press, the stage and politics. In the year 1860 M. Stam wrote a book on this theme in which he proves that the kingdom of all embracing freedom on earth was founded by the Jews. In the same year, Samter published a long letter in the Vox Let, in order to demonstrate that the Jews would very soon take up the place of the Christian nobility, the rule of the nobility was falling and will lose its place in this epoch of all enveloping light and of all embracing freedom, to which we have drawn so near. Do you not understand, he writes, the true meaning of the promise? which was given by the Lord God Sabbath to our father Abraham. This promise, which will be fulfilled with certainty, namely that one day all peoples of earth will be subject to Israel. Do you believe that God referred to a universal monarchy with Israel as king? Oh no! God scattered the Jews over the entire surface of the globe, so that they should form a kind of leaven over all races, and in the end, as the chosen, which they are, extend their rulership over the former. It is not likely that the terrible repression that the Christian peoples of Europe have suffered, who have been made poor through the usurers and the greed of the Jews and lament about this, so that the national wealth is accumulated in the hands of the great bankers, will be satisfied with isolated anti-Semitic upheavals. The monarchies, whose firm foundations are still not shattered through the Freemasonic hammer and whose ruling houses are still not at the position of the ragged and barefooted Freemasons, who have their eyes bound, will join together against this vile sect and destroy the ranks of the anarchists. Carlyle, himself a fanatical Freemason, horrified at the fate of mankind in the hands of the Jews, says, when the legislators busy themselves again with the secret societies, they would do well to make no exception in favor of Freemasonry. The privilege of secrecy is allowed to the Freemasons according to law in England, France, Germany and, according to our recognizing it in most countries. The fact that all revolutions emanate from the depths of Freemasonry would be inexplicable, if we did not know that, with the present exception of Belgium, the ministries of all lands are found in the hands of leading Freemasons, thus fundamentally, of the Jews. One of the most interesting proofs is undoubtedly that of the Freemason Hogwitz, who was inspector of the lodges of Prussia and Poland. In the year 1777 he wrote in his memoirs, I took over the direction of the lodges of Prussia, Poland and Russia. There I have gained the firm conviction that everything which has occurred since 1789 in France, in a word, the revolution, was at that time not only arranged, but was also prepared by means of meetings, instructions, oath-taking and signs, which leaves the intelligence in no doubt as to who thought it all out and directed it. As far as the murder of Louis XVI is concerned, we likewise possess the evidence of the Jesuit Father Abel. In the year 1784, he declared, there took place in Frankfurt an extraordinary assembly of the Grand Eclectic Lodge. One of the members placed for discussion the condemning of Louis XVI, the King of France, and Gustav III, the King of Sweden. This man was called Abel and was my grandfather. After this gathering, one of the participants, the Marquis de Vizieux, declared as follows. What I can say to you is that a finely spun and a most depreaching conspiracy has been instigated, so that your religion and governments will succumb. The existence of this conspiracy and its plan to murder the King of France and the King of Sweden, are likewise confirmed by the greatest number of authors, who have made serious investigations into the Freemasonry question, and the tragic events do the same. On 21st January King Louis XVI died, executed through the guillotine after a mock trial, at which the majority of judges were Freemasons. A year later, King Gustav III of Sweden was murdered by a custom, a pupil of Condorcet. 
In the same year the Emperor Leopold vanished in a mysterious manner. In order to live, France must not sacrifice what is most rational in its existence, the philosophical, political and social ideals of its predecessors of 1789, it must not extinguish the torch of its revolutionary spirit, with which it has illuminated the world. The same speaker adds. The worst humiliation for France would occur if the work of the revolution were cursed. At least it should be possible to perpetuate it without the loss of its ideals. One must never forget that it was the French Revolution which realized the principles of Freemasonry, which were prepared in our temples, said a speaker at the Congress of Freemasons of Brussels. In an assembly of the Lodge of Angers, which took place in 1922, one of the brothers proclaimed, Freemasonry, which played the most important role in the year 1789, must be ready to supply its fighting groups for an always possible revolution. Let us pass over the stage of participation of the Jews in revolutions in general. Already in the year 1648 the great revolutionary leader Cromwell was supported by the Jews, a deputation, which came from remotest Asia and was led by the rabbi Jacob ben Ezebel, appeared before the English dictator. The results of the conversations which took place were not long in coming and Cromwell used his entire power in order to abolish the laws that placed restrictions upon the Jews in England. One of the closest collaborators of Cromwell was the rabbi of Amsterdam, Manas ben Israel. Ernest Renan, who cannot be accused of anti-Semitism, wrote the following. In the French revolutionary movement, the Jewish element plays a chief role and it is very difficult to deny this. It is true that around 1789 the Jews went to work with much caution and concealed themselves behind the Freemasonic organizations and the philosophical associations. However this did not prevent several of the sons of Israel from taking an active part in the revolutionary events and making use of these from the material standpoint. The first shot against the Swiss Guard of the Tilleries was fired, on 10 August 1791, by the Jews Alkendauer Witzland. But since this zeal for war carries with it many dangers, the Jews prefer to devote themselves to other, less dangerous and above all rewarding activities. The old Hebrew, Ben Oltiz, a millionaire of this city, Cadiz, was from now on named as general treasurer of the order and already reckoned to possess a disposable capital of 300,000 thalers. Rule 44 of the Grand Spanish Orient of 10 April 1824. The supplying of the Republican armies was carried out through the Israelites Biderman, Max Beer, Moselman and others. This gave occasion to the complaints which were made by Colonel Bernanville of the Army of the Moselle, because for the troops he had been supplied with boys' shoes with cardboard soles, children's stockings and completely moth-eaten sailcloths for tents. Soon after, the laws that restricted the rights of the Jews were lifted, thanks to the mediation of Abba Grigoire, Murabu. Robespierre and others. This is done on the first occasion by all revolutionary governments, and soon afterwards, when the ideas of 1789 gained the upper hand, a veritable flood, according to the words of Cape Figues, of foreigners discharged themselves over France from the banks of the Rhine. Then appeared in the political arena such names as Klotz, Benjamin Vitel Ephraim, Etta Palm, etc. The Messiah has arrived for us on 28th of February 1790 with the rights of man, wrote the Jew Cohen, and in fact the awarding of all rights of citizenship to the Jews was one of the great victories of Israel. The revolution of 1830, says the Jew Bidaraid, has only perpetuated these happy results. When, in the year 1848, the rule of the peoples reached its last limits, the same author cynically added that Israelite names appeared in the highest realms of power. These chosen ones, these representatives of the people, often took on such French names as Fald, Sariber, Kremux, etc. The custom of there being at least one Jewish representative in the government of the Republic is something that, apart from rare exceptions, has been preserved up to our days. However, not only in France did the Jewish people play a predominant role, but with all revolutionary movements. The revolution that shook Central Europe in the year 1848, right Slambolin, was spread and supported by the Jews, as the countless facts and documents prove. Among the instigators of the revolution of 1870 and among the members of the Commune appear likewise the Jews, 
who were represented through Ravel Isaac Comer, Jacob Pereira, and others. The aforementioned author remarks of the presence of 18 Jews among the principal leaders of the Commune. It is interesting to establish that, during the burning of Paris in the year 1871, the revolutionaries left untouched the 150 buildings that belonged to the Rothschild family. If we proceed with the study of these movements in Europe, we again find Jews, the poet Hein, Karl Marx, Lassalle and many others. In order to destroy the former society, which rejected him, writes Drumont, the Jew has understood how to place himself at the head of the democratic movement. Karl Marx, Lassalle, the most principal nihilists, all leaders of the worldwide revolution are Jews. In this manner the Jews represent the leadership of the movements which suits them. Let us not forget that the founders of the International in the year 1864 were the Jews Marx, Neumeyer, Freiburg, James Cohen, Aaron, Adler, Frankel, and the sole non-Jew, Goppers. In order to direct the revolutionary movement in France, the so-called newspaper Humanite was founded. For this purpose a subscription was opened, which brought in the sum of 780,000 francs. Let us mention the names of the twelve contributors who by chance were all Jews, Levi Brawl, Levi Bram, A. Dreyfus, L. Dreyfus, Eli Rodriguez, Leon Picard, Bloom, Rue, Kasevitz, Salmon Reynac and Sachs. After one has read the proceeding, one cannot wonder that, at the Jewish Synod of Leipzig on 29th of June 1869, the following resolution was accepted. The Synod recognizes, that the development and carrying through of modern, read, revolutionary, principles are the firmest guarantee for the present and the future of Jewry and its members. They are the most important conditions of life for the expanding existence and the greatest development of Jewry. In many respects the revolution has only been the application of the ideal that Israel has brought to the world, as Leroy Bewley, writes, an author who is in no way accused of anti-Semitism. One must give him justice for the importance of Jewish infiltration in the revolutionary war cannot be denied. The Organization of the League of Nations We have seen the League of Nations, which was founded and maintained by the same secret forces, which we have already encountered, when it was a matter of destruction, today Freemasonry, their helpers the left parties, and, behind everything, the Jewish people attempt to destroy national feeling and the sovereignty of the state through the creation of an international super-government and at the same time to demoralize the peoples with an anti-militarist and pacifistic propaganda. If national feeling is lost, we will see those peoples standing completely defenseless against this secret and cunning power, as the Jewish Freemasonic striving for power can be described. Brother Eugen Bertrox has recently proposed to the Grand Lodge of France that Article 17 of the Constitution of the said Grand Lodge should be abolished, which prescribes to all its disciples that they should obey the laws of the land in which they have permission to freely assemble, and that they be ready for all sacrifices which their country desires of them, for, according to the principles of a universal morality, every Freemason is by definition an essentially free man who only acts according to his conscience, and our Freemasonic conscience cannot compulsively demand of its disciples that they be ready for all sacrifices which the country desires. The abolition, which he proposes, will suffice in value in protecting the individual conscience, whereby is to be understood that, in the case of an increase in tragic conflicts, those individual consciences, according to their own responsibility, will obey or disobey the call of their reason and their belief in the highest truth. The Jewish Freemasonic Action in the Face of Catholicism The most dignified Cardinal Caro assures us in this connection, that, it is beyond doubt that the activity of Freemasonry against the Catholic Church is only the continuation of the war against Christ that has been waged by Jewry for 1900 years, naturally adjusted to the situation of the Christian world by which the former has to conduct itself by means of secrecy, cheating and sanctimoniousness. Let us not forget that rabbinic Jewry is the declared and irreconcilable enemy of Christianity, says Webster. The hatred against Christianity and against the person of Christ is no occurrence of recent date, nor can one regard it as the result of persecution. It forms an important component of rabbinical tradition, 
which has arisen before any kind of persecution of Jews through the Christians took place, and which lasted in our land very much later than after this persecution ended. On its side, the British Guardian, 13th of March 1925, makes this assertion, the Christian Church is being attacked as never for centuries, and this attack is almost exclusively the work of the Jews. Reverend of S.S. Sacre, p. 430, 1925. For the rest, the relations of Freemasonry or of Jewry with Bolshevism and Communism in Mexico, in Russia, in Hungary, persecuting the Catholic Church and with it the whole of Christianity, and the threat of doing this all over the world, are a universal occurrence. Chapter 6. Freemasonry favors and spreads communism, which is a Jewish creation. Among the abundant documentation which is most relevant the Cardinal Caro quotes, to show that Jews and communists spread communism, we select the following. According to the Russian Tribune which appears in Munich in the Russian language, Jewry in its fight maintains, according to various plans, the following combat organizations, all for the purpose of preparing the triumph of the Third International. 1. The Golden International, see Chapter 3. 2. The Red International, see Chapter 3. 3. The Black International or Combat Association of Jewry. A very similar work is performed by Russian Jewry. We, the emigrant Russians, have seen with our own eyes the enormous number of Jews who play a role in the ranks of the instigators of revolution. If we pass over the work of preparation of this revolution and the events of 1905, we will at once see what the Vienna Jewish paper Der Hammer wrote on occasion of the Blizz affair, an affair of ritual murder in Kiev. The judgment in favor of Blizz, through the jury, amounted to his exoneration, but the character of the ritual murder was proven. The Russian government had resolved to declare war on the Jews of Kiev. Now, they must know that, upon this war, the fate, not of the Jews, for the Jewish people is unconquerable, but of the Russian people depends. For the Russian government it is a question of life and death. Its victory in this affair will be the beginning of its collapse. May the Russian rulers exercise caution. We will provide proof to the whole world that one cannot meddle unpunished with the Jews, whether the latter are of Kiev or any other place. Der Hammer, number 254, 1911 mentioned by General Nikolodov in Tsar Nicholas II and the Jews, and by Monsignor. Juin in the Jewish Freemasons Danger and the United Front, 1927, edition of Petty Oranis. Unfortunately for Russia and the entire civilized world, this threat was not without consequences. Six years later it was turned into a fact. We will quote some figures. The First Workers and Soldiers Council, Soviet, was composed of 23 members of whom 19 were Jews, the Council of People's Commissars of 1920 had 17 Jews among its 22 members, among the 43 high officials of the War Commission, 34 were Israelites, on the Commissariat of the Interior there were 54 Jews among the officials, in that for foreign affairs, 13 Jews and 17 members. In the financial department of the government the percentage of Jews rose to 86% and in the court system up to 95% etc. In order to briefly summarize this statistic, let us remark that, among the 545 most principal agents of the Russian Revolution in question, 447 belonged to the chosen people, 68 to different nationalities, Latvians, Germans, Poles, etc and only 30 were of Russian nationality. These figures, which are taken from Bolshevist information sources, appeared in a pamphlet under the title Who Rules in Russia, which was published in New York in 1920. See Monsignor Juin, The Jewish Freemasonic Danger, 2, page 108 and We should add that, at present, there are 16 Jews among the 22 trade agents of the Soviets abroad. Report of the Irby Agency of 25th of August 1927, which was quoted by R. Lamelin in The Victory of Israel, page 170. In his book To Mungan Elo Elas Persario, the lay writer Ernesto Rossi disputes violently with the already mentioned periodical Civil to Catolica, from which he reproduces the following paragraph, with the intention of refuting it. We see heroes of the sect, who are not able to resist a gift of two millions, 
perpetuated in all cities through statues. We see the sons of these heroes, who pocket large sums while despising the dominant misery. Mazzini involved himself with the synagogue, whose fruits of love are very well known in the Campi Doglio of Rome, Garibaldi, Caver, Ferrini, Dipratis were modest servants of the synagogue, and so are still many of those great men to whom the good will of the peoples has erected and still erects memorial stones, busts and monuments, in order to glorify their love of freedom and of the fatherland. Many writers of the most different directions have asserted that the Jewish question in Italy did not represent the features of a national disorder. We do not share this opinion and limit ourselves only to recalling that those who introduced communism into our land, Modigliani, Treves, Della Seda, Musatti, Momigliano, Donati, etc., were Jews. And did not the renowned Taglietti, the leader for many years of the Italian Communist Party, Mary the Jewess Montagnana? And was not her brother, Mario Montagnana, in the directorship of the newspaper Leonita in its Milan edition? It should be known, in addition, that likewise those who directed the communist press in Italy were Jews, Longo, Vinuovo, Alatri, Unita of Rome, Tedeschi, Unita of Milan, Cohen directs the Peace Sarah, Levi the Lana Syndical, and Jica the Paper Republica who came from there into the directing of the press of the Communist Party. Part 3. The Synagogue of Satan. Chapter 1. Jewish Striving for Power. The Hebrew people was chosen by God as preserver of the true religion, to whose preservation it was entrusted in the midst of the idolatrous peoples until the arrival of the promised Messiah, in whom the prophecies of the Old Testament should be fulfilled. However, even before the coming of Christ, the Jews began to distort the said prophecies by giving them a false, racial and ambitious interpretation. The promise of a kingdom of the true God upon earth, that is a spiritual kingdom of the true religion, the Jews interpreted as a material kingdom of their race, as the promise of God of world domination to the Israelites and an enslaving of all peoples on earth through them. As examples of these false interpretations one can quote the following, in Genesis, chapter 22 verse 17 and 18, the angel of the Lord says to Abraham, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of thine enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The Jews, lusting for power have given these verses a materialistic interpretation and think that God has offered them, as the full-blooded descendants of Abraham, that they have power over the gates of their foes, that only in them, as the Jewish race, all peoples of earth be blessed. On the other hand, Holy Church interprets these prophecies in a spiritual sense. This is the victory that the spiritual children of Abraham, that is the Christians, shall obtain through the power of Jesus Christ and the gifts of an everlasting righteousness concerning the visible and invisible foes of their salvation. And so was fulfilled according to Scripture this prophecy with the erecting of the Church, when all peoples of the world subjected themselves to Jesus Christ and received from Him blessing and salvation. In Deuteronomy, chapter 2, verse 25, the Lord says, this day will I begin to put the dread of thee and the fear of thee upon the nations that are under the whole of heaven, who shall hear report of thee, and shall tremble, and be in anguish because of thee. This passage is also given a restricted interpretation by Holy Church which differs completely from the ambitious Jewish feeling, which degenerated throughout history into frightful actions, which prove the practical application of this false interpretation. Also, Wherever during the Middle Ages the heretical movements directed by Jews triumphed, although these victories were locally limited and of transitory nature, they were always accompanied by crime, fear and terror. The same occurred with the Freemasonic revolutions, such as those of 1789 in France or that of 1931 to 1936 in Spain. And yet it is said that one must not speak of Jewish communist revolutions. In the Soviet Union, where the Hebrews were successful in introducing their totalitarian dictatorship, they have sowed fear and death in such a cruel manner, that the poor enslaved Russians, have now only to hear the word Jew to tremble with terror. Another example of this kind is obtained for us through the false interpretation by the Jews of verse 16, in chapter 7 of Deuteronomy, 
which says, And thou shalt consume all the people which the Lord thy God shall deliver unto thee, thine eye shall have no pity upon them, neither shalt thou serve their gods, for that will be a snare unto thee. While Holy Church likewise gives this passage a limited spiritual interpretation, the Jews understand it in the sense that God has provided them with the right to consume all peoples of earth and to gain power over their riches. We already saw, in the fourth chapter of this work, what the Rabbi Baruch Levi wrote to his pupil, the young Jew Karl Marx, as the later founder of what was badly described as scientific socialism, where he quoted apparent theological principles to justify the right of the Jews to appropriate to themselves the riches of all peoples on earth through proletarian communist movements, which are controlled by Jewry. The 24th verse of the same chapter 7 of Deuteronomy runs as follows, And he shall deliver their kinds into thine hand, and thou shalt destroy their name from under heaven, there shall no man be able to stand before thee, until thou have destroyed them. This prophecy, which Holy Church relates to the sinful kings who ruled in the land of Canaan, the Jews interpret as having universal character. They therefore regard all their revolutions and conspiracies against the kings of recent time as holy enterprises, which they perform in fulfillment of the biblical prophecies, which they assume further as useful means to obtain domination over the world, which they likewise accept as commanded by God in the Holy Scripture. The constant distortion of the true meaning of the prophecies of the Bible through the Jews we find renewed in reading of verse 27 of chapter 7 of the prophecy of Daniel. And the kingdom and dominion, and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven, shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. While Holy Church interprets this prophecy by accepting it as referring to the eternal rule of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Jews regard it as meaning that a flock is to be formed with a shepherd who naturally comes from the tribe of Israel, that their race shall attain eternal rulership in the world over the other peoples. The prophecy of Isaiah LX, verses 10-12 relates. 10. And the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls, and their kings shall minister unto thee. Therefore thy gates shall be open continually, they shall not be shut day nor night that men may bring unto thee the riches of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, those nations shall be utterly wasted. This prophecy alluding to the spiritual kingdom of Christ and his church too takes on for the Jews a completely altered meaning, which crystallizes in clearly recognizable actions. Wherever the Jewish dictatorship was set up, as for example in the terror in France in the year 1789 or in the Jewish communist dictatorship in the lands which have fallen into the claws of the monster, whoever did not serve the Jews or dared to rebel against their slavery, has been destroyed. The Jews exist only as owners, for they gain power over the wealth of these nations. So one could go on in this way, to quote verses of the Old Testament that have been falsely interpreted by Jewish imperialism. One must bear in mind that many of the prophets were murdered by the Jews, only because they contradicted them and blamed their perversion. However, the most dangerous of these false interpretations of the prophecies of the Bible was that in connection with the arrival of the Messiah as the Redeemer of the human race, who would set up the rule of the true God in this world, here it was that the Jews departed in the worst possible way from the true reality by their giving the most sublime promises in relation to the Messiah a racial and imperialistic character. Already in the times of our Lord Jesus Christ this false interpretation was so general among them that the majority of Hebrews imagined they saw in the promised Messiah a king or a warlord who, with the help of God, would conquer all nations of the earth through bloody wars, and in the end Israel would in fact rule the whole world. When, therefore, Jesus was faced with such demands, and rejected all shedding of blood and revealed that his kingdom was not of this world, the Jewish imperialists felt that all their hopes and demands were being destroyed. They began seriously to fear that the teaching of Christ might in the end even convince the Hebrews, and they might recognize him as the promised Messiah. When Jesus preached the equality of all men before God, the Jews thought, and they did so with good reason that Christ with his teachings would render null or void their false views concerning Israel, as a people chosen by God to actually rule the world. 
Simultaneously he would declare null and void the idea of a people which is superior through the will of God to the others, and which is destined through the commandment of God to subjugate the remaining peoples and gain control of their wealth. Therefore the leaders of Jewry in that time, priests, scholars and Pharisees, etc., feared that Jesus threatened the glorious future that was predestined the people of Israel as future master of the world, for, if all peoples are equal before God, as our Lord Jesus Christ preached, there was no reason upon earth to choose one as preferential in the future and to rule over mankind. In order to defend the ambitious Jewish thesis, Caiaphas, the high priest of Israel, alluded to the suitability that one man should die, namely Jesus Christ, in order to save a people. After the blackest and most world-denying crime that was ever committed in the history of mankind, that is the murder of the Son of God by the Jews, the latter stood stiff-necked upon their demands for power and attempted in a new holy book to compile their false interpretations and to justify these. So appeared the Talmud, which is damned by Holy Church and in which, as the Jews assert, the most perfected interpretation of the Old Testament is contained through divine inspiration. Afterwards appeared the collection of the Jewish Kabbalah, which means prophecy. And this was explained, likewise according to the Jews, through divine inspiration, the secret interpretation, that is the concealed and true interpretation of the Holy Scriptures. In the following we will quote some passages from these secret books of Jewry. You, Israelites, are called men, while the peoples of the world do not deserve the name of men but that of beasts. The generation of a stranger is like the generation of beasts. In the previously quoted passages the false interpreters of the Holy Scripture take a step of great weight, namely to deny the Christians and Gentiles, that is all peoples of earth, their human capacity, by ranking them among the breed of beasts. To do justice to the importance of this criminal step, one must bring to mind that according to the divine revelation of the Old Testament, all animals and beasts have been created by God for the service of men, who eat their flesh, use their skins as clothing, kill them and in general can do with them as they please. On the other hand, he compelled men to keep his commandments in relation to other men. According to the false interpretation of the Holy Scripture, both the Christians as well as other Gentiles are to the Jews simple beasts and not human beings. Therefore the Hebrews have automatically no duty to keep the commandments towards them and feel themselves at the same time completely in their right to kill, fleece and rob them of everything that they possess, like any kind of beast. Never upon earth has there existed or does there exist today, such an irreconcilable and totalitarian striving for power as that of the Jews. This far-reaching view that the other peoples are beasts, explains in clear form the irreconcilable cruel and despicable ignoring of every human law, such as one can observe with the high Jewish personages of international communism. Their disdain towards other peoples goes so far as to assert, what is a prostitute? Every woman who is not a Jewess. 5. This explains the fact, as different writers of diverse nationalities have recently shown, that the Jews have everywhere been the most unscrupulous traitors and girls and the most zealous defenders of the disintegrating teachings of free love and of race mixing, while in their own families they maintain strict discipline and morality. Since Christians and Gentiles are in fact beasts, it is no wonder that they should live in immorality and intermixing. As far as the murderous instincts of the Jews are concerned, which they have displayed over the centuries, they see themselves encouraged by what they hold to be the divine inspiration of the Talmud and of the Kabbalah, but which according to Holy Church is nothing more than a devilish interpretation. Kill the best among the Gentiles. If God commanded them such, whereby it is a question of a cruel and bloodthirsty people, as the sufferings and death of Christ, the tortures and bloodbaths of communist Russia, etc., prove dash. How can it still surprise us that, wherever the Jew can, all those are murdered who oppose in any form his godless intrigues. This devilish hatred, this sadism, which the Jews have always shown towards other peoples, has its origin likewise in the false interpretation of divine revelation, that is in the Kabbalah and in the Talmud. May the next example serve as an illustration. What does Har Sinai, that is Mount Sinai, mean? It means the mountain from which the Sina, that is hatred towards all peoples of the world has radiated. 
one must recall that upon Mount Sinai God revealed to Moses the Ten Commandments. But the modern Jews are of the opinion, equally false and disgusting, that there the religion of hate was revealed which they have preserved up to our days, that satanic hatred towards all other peoples which found its most extreme manifestation in the tortures and bloodbaths that have been perpetrated by international communism, the Kabbalah, which is reserved for the high initiates of Jewry and not the plebs, carried out the division between Jews and Gentiles, among whom Christians were included, to the most disgusting and extreme limits, while on the one side the Gentiles are denigrated to the category of simple beasts, the Jews on the other are elevated to the category of gods, by placing them equal to the Godhead himself. To such a degree have the Jews falsified the meaning of the Pentateuch and the Old Testament in general. The blasphemous passage, which is quoted in the following, is highly enlightening in this connection. God places himself for display upon earth in the likeness of the Jew, Judas, Jehovah or Jehovah are the same and unique being. The Hebrew is the living God, the God become flesh, the heavenly man, the Adam Kadman. The other men are earthly and of inferior race, and only exist to serve the Hebrew, they are little beasts. 8. It is therefore natural that this mode of thought has led the Jews to the conclusion that everything that exists upon earth belongs to them, including the beasts, among whom they include us, the rest of mankind, and also everything which belongs to these beasts. The falsifiers of the Holy Scriptures attempted, both in the Talmud as in the Kabbalah, to strengthen the Jewish striving for power, by their giving these steps the feature of a divine dispensation. The following passages prove it. The All-Highest spoke thus to the Israelites, You have recognized me as the sole ruler of the world and therefore I will make you into the sole rulers of the world. Wherever the Hebrews settle, they must become the Lords, until they possess absolute rulership, they must regard themselves as banished and captives. Even if they are successful in ruling peoples, they may not, until they rule all, cease to cry, What torture! What indignity! This false divine revelation, which is found in the Talmud, is one of the theological principles of the politics of modern Jewry, which in fact believes it is following the will of God through the literal translation into deeds. As soon as the Christian and Gentile peoples in magnanimous manner opened their frontiers to the immigrant Jews, they could never have imagined that, in comparison with the migrations of other peoples, they granted shelter to eternal conspirators, who are always ready to work in the shadows and restlessly until they rule the naive people that kindly opened its gates to them. The Talmud remarks, however, that the Jews will not be able to rest, until their rule is unrestricted. The Hebrews have grasped that democracy and capitalism, which have allowed them to rule the peoples, have not obtained for them that unrestricted rulership commanded to them by God of which the Talmud speaks. Therefore the Jews Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels invented a totalitarian system which guaranteed to them to take from the Christians and Gentiles all their wealth, all their freedoms, and in general all their human rights, in order to place them on the level of the beasts. The dictatorship of communist socialism of Marx allows the Jew to attain this tyranny, and therefore, since its introduction in Russia, they have worked ceaselessly to destroy the capitalist form of government, which admittedly they themselves had created but which was incapable of allowing them to arrive at the desired goal. As the Talmud reveals, it does not satisfy the Jews to rule over some peoples, but they must control them all, and as long as they are not successful, they must cry out, what torture, what an indignity. This also explains the circumstance why the Jewish communist hunger for power is insatiable, and reveals how absurd it is to believe in an upright and peaceful coexistence or in the possibility that communism will abandon its demand to conquer all the peoples of earth. The Jews believe that God has commanded them to lay upon all peoples their absolute tyranny, and that this absolute tyranny can only be successful for them through the unrestrained socialist dictatorship of communism, as this tyranny must extend to all peoples. They do not rest until they have laid communist slavery upon all peoples of earth. It is unavoidably necessary that the Christians and Gentiles should fully grasp this giant tragedy. The existence of an imperialistic and cruel totalitarianism, which is spurred on by a group of mystics, fanatics and madmen, 
and which will perform all its crimes and all its perversions in the firm belief that they fulfill faithfully the commands of God, is an unhealthy reality. Their wickedness extends to such a degree that they hold it to be morally permissible to allow denial of God and for communist materialism to triumph in the whole world, while they, the pious and faithful, are successful in destroying hated Christianity and the other false religions, for the purpose of permitting the present religion of Israel to rule on the ruins of all others, who recognize the right of the Jews to control the world and recognize through divine right their character as the chosen race to rule over mankind in the coming times. On the other hand, the Talmud says that it gives the Jews the truthful version of the biblical promises about the Messiah. The Messiah will give the Hebrews rulership over the world and to them all peoples will be subject. One could quote passages from the different parts of the Talmud and the Jewish Kabbalah, which are equally as informative as these, which allow us to understand the extent and importance of the present religion of the Jews and the danger which it signifies for Christianity and the rest of mankind. The deeper one penetrates into this material, all the clearer will one recognize the abyss that has opened between the original and true religion, which was revealed by God to the Hebrews through Abraham, Moses and the prophets, and the false religion, which these Jews, who crucified our Lord Jesus Christ, have worked out, as well as their descendants, on grounds of the consciously false interpretation of the Holy Bible, above all with the appearance of the Talmud of Jerusalem and Babylon and of the latter completion of the Kabbalistic books. Sefer HaZohar, and Sefer Yetzirah, holy books, which are the foundations for the religion of modern Jews. If an abyss exists between the religion of Abraham and Moses and of modern Jewry, then the same is unfathomable between Christianity and modern Jewry. One could say of the latter that it is the contrast and the denial even of the Christian religion, against which it desires hatred and urges its destruction in the holy books and in its secret rites. The centuries-long struggle of Holy Church against the Jewish religion and its rites had not, as is falsely said, the religious intolerance of Catholicism as the cause, but the enormous infamy of the Jewish religion, which represents a deadly threat for Christianity. This compelled the Church, which at first was so tolerant, to adopt a positive attitude for defense of the truth of Christianity and of the entire human race. Erroneous and deceitful is consequently the view of some clergy who call themselves Christians but work together with the Jews in a thoroughly suspicious way, asserting that it is not admissible to fight against Jewry, for the true Jews, the believing Jews have a religion related and similar to Christianity. What the Jews strive for in reality, when they put before Catholics this thesis of unlawfulness of struggle against the criminal Jewish sect, is the obtaining of a new permit for freebooting, which allows them, without exposing themselves to direct counterattacks, to continue in their Freemasonic or Communist revolutionary movements until they are successful in the destruction of Christianity and the enslavement of mankind. The Hebrews and their accomplices within Christianity wish to secure in a comfortable manner the victory of the Jewish hunger for power, for if the Christians abandon attacking and conquering the head of the whole conspiracy, by restricting themselves only to attacking the Freemasonic, anarchistic, communist or any other branch, the head, which is free of attacks, that is Jewry, preserves its whole power, while its Freemasonic and Communist tentacles devote themselves with all their branches in a merciless manner, as they have done previously, to the attack upon the religious, political and social institutions of Christianity over the whole world. Chapter 2. More Concerning the Jewish Religion in the present chapter something will be learned concerning the teachings of belief of the so-called honorable Jews, in order to be able to prove with all the greater clarity that no relationship or kinship exists between the latter and the religion of the Christians. The first thing which one must bear in mind with the studying of modern Jewish religion is the fact that it is a question of a secret religion, in contrast to the remaining religions, whose dogma, teachings and customs have a clear character and therefore could be learned by anyone at choice, even those standing to one side. After the crucifying of the Lord, the Jews kept concealed over centuries from the Christians and the Gentiles all those teachings and customs which, because they represented a threatening of other men, had to be concealed. They rightly feared that, if people knew their teachings, they would answer with violence against the Jews. In the text of the Talmud one can read the following. 
to communicate anything of our law to a Gentile means the death of all Hebrews, for if the Goyim, Gentiles, knew what we teach about them, they would exterminate us without mercy. The lie has been the most principal weapon of those whom Christ, the Lord, already in his time called the synagogue of Satan. With lies and deceit they have controlled the peoples with their Freemasonic revolutions, and with lies and deceit they lead the latter to the communist revolutions. It may suffice to mention that they even make use of lies for matters not concerned with their own religion. They cheated the Christians and Gentiles in that they made the latter believe that the present Jewish religion is exactly the same as all the others. That they have restricted themselves to worship God, our Lord, to establish norms for morality and to defend spiritual values. But at the same time they pay very great attention to concealing from the world that their religion is in reality a secret sect, which pursues the purpose of destroying Christianity which in addition hates Christ and his church to the death, and which attempts at first to control the remaining peoples of the earth and then to enslave them. It is therefore not to be wondered at that, in their holy hook, the Talmud, they confirm that, if the Gentiles, among whom they number the Christians, knew what we teach about them, they would exterminate us without mercy. History shows us how clever this caution of the Talmud is. When Holy Church discovered what the masters or rabbis taught their believers in secret, they ordered upon various occasions the confiscation and destruction of the books of the Talmud. In view of the danger that their teachings signified for the Jews, namely for those who in very violent religious manner accept unconditionally and with zeal of belief the teachings of the Talmud and of the Kabbalah. A further Jewish deceit was useless, which consisted in preparing false texts of the Talmud, which were then brought before the civil and church authorities without the passages whose reading was regarded as dangerous for the Christians. For frequently both Holy Church as well as the civil government also discovered the authentic texts and the general indignation was often revealed in violent reactions against the religious sects of Jewry, whose authentic holy books already contained the plans for the conspiracy, which they have developed against the whole of mankind. The Jewish writer Cecil Roth speaks abundantly in his work, Storia del Popolo Ebraico, of the condemnation of the Talmud by Pope Gregory IX and his successors up to that of Pope Leo X in the 16th century which had its origin in an intimation to Cardinal Carafa, according to which the work was destructive and blasphemous. This revelation was made by the Jew Vittorio Eliano, who was the nephew of the Jewish scholar Elia Levita, and had as its consequence the public burning of the work in the autumn of 1553 on the Campo di Fiore of Rome. In the trials of the Inquisition, which were conducted against the concealed Jews, whom Holy Church called Jewish heretics, can be found another richly informative source about the secret and factual religious doctrines of belief of the Jews. Those who would like to penetrate deeper into this study should use for this purpose the archives of the Inquisition of this capital of the Catholic world that of Carcassonne and Narbonne and other cities of France, those of Simancas in Spain and those of La Tour du Tomb in Portugal, for those of Mexico, trials of Luis de Carvalhal, El Mozo, from which one can appreciate the mode of thought of the Jews and obtain knowledge of certain very informative religious doctrines. Relative to this is an addition by the government of Mexico from the main archive of the nation, of the year 1935, which was an official publication. In it are found the original handwriting with the corresponding signatures of the accused Jews, the inquisitors, witnesses, etc. The validity of the document is beyond doubt and the contemporary Jews themselves have not been able to deny it. The content of this document is something most horrible dash monstrous blasphemies against our Lord Jesus Christ and the Most Holy Virgin Mary, a satanic hatred against Christianity a hatred that has nothing to do with the law given to the real Moses by God on Mount Sinai, but which represents the nature of the secret religion of modern Jewry itself, a religion of hatred, of wild hatred, which calls for a bloodbath of the Christians and persecutions of Holy Church, and which has been unleashed as an unbridled and disastrous evil explosive in all places where the Jewish Freemasonic and Jewish Communist revolutions have been victorious. From the second trial against Luis de Carvalhal, which began towards the end of the 16th century, in the year 1595, we will, with true regret, take leave of same. 
for it is urgently necessary that we again conciliate our Lord Jesus Christ and the Most Holy Virgin Mary for the blasphemies uttered by the Jews, and further it is urgently necessary to prove the untruthfulness of this strange thesis, which at the present time is represented by some clergy. The latter assert that it is improper to fight against Jewry, since a relationship nevertheless exists with the Christian's religion, an assertion which borders on insanity and which can only prosper among those who, in ignorance of the problem, have fallen into the trap as victims of Jewish lies. Chapter 3. Curses of God Against the Jews, Jewish Freemasonry, Communism, and the various political forces that control both, have brought countless attacks against the temporal policy of the Holy Catholic Church. One of the most frequent attacks is made with reference to the inquisitional court and the publicly made judgment of the religious court, which some clergy, out of lack of knowledge of history or as a result of propagandistic, Freemasonic liberal influence, have been duped to the degree that they think that Holy Church has erred in its inquisitorial policy, and things have come to such a pass that they attempt to avoid this question with verbal disputes or with an unconscious feeling of guilt. This shameful conduct stands in contrast to the personal behavior of some Jewish historians, who, as believers in truth, approve some positive points of the inquisitorial system, like Cecil Roth, who in his work Storia del Popolo Ebraico says. Dot. One must admit that, from its standpoint, the Inquisition was just. Only rarely did it take steps without a reliable foundation, and when a matter was in progress, the ultimate purpose consisted in obtaining a complete admission, which, united with the feeling of repentance would redeem the victims from the terrors of eternal torment. The punishments laid down were never regarded as such, more as a redeeming sacrifice. In this much disputed matter, which the enemies of Catholicism have regarded as the Achilles heel of the Church, one must not lose sight of reality in the midst of the host of lies, falsification and historical deceit which conceal the truth as if with a dense undergrowth, which was intentionally woven for this purpose by the Jews and their accomplices. The inquisitorial policy of Holy Church, far from being something punitive or anything of which the Church should be ashamed, was not only theologically justified, but of the greatest value for mankind, which, thanks to the Holy Inquisition, described by the popes, councils, theologians and saints of the Church as holy then saw itself freed of the catastrophe that now threatened them, and which would already have occurred several centuries ago. We are not of the opinion that in the present one should attempt to force religion upon anyone by violence, nor that anyone should be persecuted on account of his ideas, for the truth will be able to establish itself without the necessity of resorting to compulsory methods. In fact we know that Holy Church, tolerant and good-willed in its early times, had to adjust itself in the face of an extraordinary situation. There was the deadly threat that international Jewry had planned for all Christianity in the 12th century. This threat and its gravity can only be compared with that which at present is represented for free mankind by Jewish communism. In order to save Christianity from this danger, Holy Church had to take refuge in the most extreme methods whose justification is already proven solely through the circumstance that the misfortune which now threatens mankind, was delayed by several centuries. In their thousand-year-long struggle against the Church of Christ the Jews used, as their principal weapon of battle, the fifth column, which arose as thousands and thousands of Jews all over the world were converted in a hypocritical manner to Christianity. The already mentioned Jewish historian Cecil Roth confirms in his previously quoted work Storia del Popolo Ebraico, page 229, Milan 1962, that naturally the conversions were for the most part a pretense. They were baptized and remain nevertheless just as much Jews in secret as before, although they have given themselves Christian names, went to Mass and frivolously received the sacraments. They then used their new position as seeming Christians to set up false teachings, which developed into underground movements. This would have brought about the dissolution of Christianity and secured the rule by Jewry over all peoples, as will be elaborated on later with irrefutable proofs. It was soon seen that the whole of Christianity was threatened by death, unless the necessary measures were seized upon to command a halt to the secret organizations of Jewry and the secret societies which the concealed Jews formed among the true Christians. 
the conclusion was reached that Holy Church could only defend itself and mankind from destruction by setting up a similar secret organization. There remain no other choice than to oppose the secret anti-Christian organizations with equally secret counterbodies. So arose the very effective organization of the Inquisition Court. An often alluded to fact of the Inquisition is the burning of the secret Jews or their execution through the Garot, in which respect it is difficult to establish the exact number of those executed who were Judaized heretics, as the Church described those who in appearance were Christians but in secrecy practiced Judaism. Many estimate at thousands, and others at tens of thousands, the number of underground Jews who were killed by the Inquisition. However, whatever number it may be, the enemies of the Church have directed unjustified attacks against it on account of this procedure. The mitigation of responsibility that has been granted the Church, on the grounds that it did not directly execute those found guilty but handed them over to the worldly authority, is easily refuted by the enemies of Catholicism. They say that, although the Church did not directly condemn and kill them, then nevertheless it gave its approval to the inquisitorial procedures and to the laws that punished the backsliding Jewish heretics with death. In addition it had given its agreement for six centuries to these executions. Another weak proof of the defenders of the Church has been the assertion made that the Spanish and Portuguese inquisitions were devices of the state and were not directed by the Church, but this thought process is powerless for one cannot apply it to the Papal Inquisition, which was in progress over three centuries in the whole of Christian Europe, and which was directed by none other than His Holiness the Pope, who personally appointed the Grand Inquisitor. The remaining Franciscan or Dominican Inquisitors exercised their functions as Papal Delegates with full Papal authority. It is certain that the Papal Inquisition sent thousands of secret Jews to be burned at the stake, who, although they were executed through the world the arm of authority, died with the approval of Holy Church. The latter for its part had itself approved the procedures used to judge them, the laws which condemned them and the executions. If the Church had not been in agreement with the death sentences against the Jews, it would have prevented the same through a command. Even with the Spanish and Portuguese Inquisitions, which were state institutions and where the Grand Inquisitor was as appointed by the King and not by the Pope, Holy Church authorized the Dominican order in the setting up of Inquisition courts, to prosecute and seek out the Jews, to imprison them and to conduct the whole process up to the handing over of them to the worldly power of authority. Also in these cases the Church had given its agreement to the laws that empowered the worldly arm of authority to burn these malefactors or to strangle them with the garot. In order to establish an effective and convincing defense of Holy Church and the Inquisition, one much possessed the courage to take refuge in the truth and only in the truth. Holy Church will never need to fear it, for its actions are always determined by justice and fairness. Therefore with the truth, which always wins in the end, and which is expressly elaborated in the book with the title The Jewish Fifth Column and the Clergy, a truthful defense of the Holy Catholic Church is asserted in relation to its inquisitorial policy. First we will begin with the proof that the Jews are not untouchable people by virtue of the fact that at one time they were the chosen people of God, but, on the contrary, God predicted to them that, in the event of their not keeping His commandments, they would be very severely punished. From this consideration, the policy of the Church towards the Jews with regard to the Inquisition has a broad theological foundation. The Jews still boast at present of being the chosen people of God which they tend to substantiate based upon certain passages of the Holy Bible, of which they give a false and ambitious interpretation. However, in so doing, they are very careful to avoid other Bible passages, in which God clearly and unequivocally linked this privilege to the condition that they faithfully fulfilled the commandments and other commands of God under the threat that, if they would not do so, the distinction of being the chosen people would be withdrawn and they would be transformed into an accursed people who would encounter diverse punishments, which were expressly indicated to Moses by God. However, the Jews attempted to conceal this position of things, just as certain Christian clergy attempt to do, whose apparently inexplicable conduct more favors Jewry and its revolutionary plans than the Holy Church of Christ. In Deuteronomy of the Holy Bible, Chapter 28, Verses 1 and 2, Moses, who conveys the divine will to the Hebrews, describes quite clearly this situation. 1. And it shall come to pass, 
If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. 2. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. From the foregoing it is perfectly clear that the distinction of Israel, as a people chosen and blessed of the Lord, is clearly linked to the fact that it keeps all his commandments and obeys the voice of the Lord. It is therefore completely false to assert that God regards it in a final and unconditional manner as a chosen people. He gave it the possibility of retaining this privilege, however, since the Jewish people had neither kept nor keeps the commandments, nor listens to the voice of the Lord, it trampled upon the obligation that was laid upon it in order to preserve this exceptional position, and drew the divine imprecations upon itself. One must recall that after Moses mentions all the blessings that God would grant to the Israelites, if they kept all his commandments and would listen to the voice of the Lord, he records the terrible curses that would strike them, if they did the opposite. Whoever wishes to learn these completely, can take the Bible, for proof, in Deuteronomy, chapter 28, and Leviticus 26. Here we will only restrict ourselves to quoting some of the most important passages. In the chapter of Deuteronomy mentioned, Moses says in conveying the commandments of God. 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee, and overtake thee. 16. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. 17. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. 18. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kine, and the flocks of thy sheep. 19. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. 20. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke in all that thou settest thine hand unto for to do, until thou be destroyed, and until thou perish quickly, because of the wickedness of thy doings whereby thou hast forsaken me. 21. The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee, until he have consumed thee from off the land, whither thou goest to possess it. 22. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption, and with a fever, and with an inflammation, and with an extreme burning, and with the sword, and with blasting, and with mildew, and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. 24. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust, from heaven shall it come down upon thee, until thou be destroyed. 25. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies, thou shalt go out one way against them, and flee seven ways before them, and shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. 43. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. 45. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee, till thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. 48. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies which the Lord shall send against thee, in hunger and in thirst, and in nakedness, and in want of all things, and he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck, until he have destroyed thee. First a fearful prophecy of enslaving and then of destruction of the Jews, through foes which God himself will lay as punishment and curse over them. 54. So that the man that is tender among you, and very delicate, his eye shall be evil toward his brother, and toward the wife of his bosom, and toward the remnant of his children, which he shall leave. 55. So that he will not give to any of them of the flesh of his children whom he shall eat, because he hath nothing left him in the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee in all thy gates. 62. And ye shall be left few in number, whereas ye were as the stars of heaven for a multitude, because thou wilt just not obey the voices of the Lord thy God. In chapter 26 of Leviticus the reward is likewise mentioned, which is offered by God to the Jewish people, whereby he promises that it will be his chosen and blessed people, if it observes his commandments, and will be cursed if it does not keep them. In addition, he prophesies the punishments with which he will punish its bad behavior. Of the curses, 
which God in this last case casts directly against the Israelites, we quote only those which we regard as of the highest importance. Those who wish to learn them all, we refer to the Holy Bible, which served as source in this matter. 14. But if ye hearken not unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, here God the Lord plays upon the fact that the Jews with their sins have broken and made invalid the agreement of bond which God has concluded with the said people. I also will do this unto you, I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and a burning ague, that shall consume the eyes, and cause sorrow of heart, and ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you, and ye shall be slain before your enemies, they that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. A further prediction of destruction. It is of import to establish how the collective persecution mania from which the Jewish people suffers at present, agrees in surprising manner with this divine curse. And if ye will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. And ye shall perish among the heathen, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. And they that are left of you shall pine away in your enemies' lands, and also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. The word of God speaks for itself. God gave Israel a very great privilege, but not in order to use it as a common law, which could allow it to commit unpunished every kind of sins and crime and to violate the divine commandments and statutes. For this very reason God, who is justice itself, linked the existence of this privilege and this blessing to very strict conditions, which were intended to secure the good use of the same by the Jews. As a condition he laid upon them that they should not only heed a few, but expressly all the commandments, as is stated very clearly in various verses of Deuteronomy and of Leviticus. He also commanded that they hear the divine ordinations, treasure the wisdom contained in them, and observe the laws made by God. Leviticus, chapter 26, verses 14 and 15. Otherwise the agreement or alliance which God had granted the people in question would become invalid. What have the Jews in fact done over three thousand years? Instead of fulfilling the commandments and other conditions made by God, they killed the greater part of the prophets, denied God's Son, slandered and killed Him. They sent against the first commandment which commands us to love God above all things, against the fifth which commands us not to kill, and against the eighth which forbids bearing of false witness and lying. In addition, they murdered various disciples of Christ soiled their hands in bloody revolutions, during which opportunity they killed millions of human creatures, plundered the wealth of Christians by first robbing the latter through usury, afterwards through communism, and thereby in terrible manner blasphemed the name of God in the communist lands, without there being any foundation to the claim, which they make in their secret assemblies, that they would do this only transitorily for some centuries until the destructive machine of communist socialism had destroyed all false religions, in order to erect on the ruins of the same the completely distorted religion of the God of Israel and his chosen people, who would be the future family of mankind. It must be remarked that the blasphemies and the denial of God through materialistic communism are not directed against this or that religion regarded as false, but against God, against all universal spiritual values. Neither the insanity of the synagogue of the devil nor its demonic lust for power will ever be able to justify the monstrous blasphemies that are cast against God in the states subjected to the socialist dictatorship of communism, even if one may say that we are concerned with a purely passing situation of a few hundred years. To put it briefly, instead of observing the commandments and everything which God made as a condition of their being his chosen people, they have violated all this systematically in the most far-reaching form, above all through committing murder of God, that terrible crime, which consists in the killing of the Son of God, and which represents the horrible peak of many crimes and violations of the commandments, which they have in addition carried out for two thousand years and even up to our days. So they have deserved all the curses and punishments with which God threatened them, when they, instead of observing the commandments, refused to obey them. The curses and punishments prophesied by God the Lord they have fulfilled to the letter, even the most terrible, which consist in mass destruction and murder. 
If one reads once again the aforementioned verses from the Bible, which speak of this destruction, and one compares them with the bloodbaths carried out among Jews in Europe when occupied by the Nazis, it will be proved that yet once again in history the curses and punishments predicted by our Lord God centuries ago have been fulfilled. Clearly the Creator has even used the pagan peoples, such as the Chaldeans, the Romans and others as implements of divine providence, in order to punish the misdeeds and sins of the Jewish people, and to fulfill the curses prophesied by God Himself. If the Hebrews or their agents within Christianity, in the reading of these lines, feel themselves afflicted, they must nevertheless recognize that we neither may nor can alter the divine order. In the following chapter we will see how the biblical prophets in conveying the will of God were even clearer than Moses in reference to the punishments that would scourge the Jews by reason of their sins and crimes. Chapter 4. Massacres of Jews Ordered by God as Punishment. Bible. The terrible punishments ordered by God against the Jews are also continually spoken of by the prophets in the Holy Bible. In the prophecy of Isaiah, God predicts through the mouth of the former various punishments against the Israelites, which would be too involved to describe. Therefore we will limit ourselves only to these two verses of chapter 65 of said prophecy, while referring those who wish to delve deeper into this theme to the Holy Scriptures. 11. But ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop and that furnish the drink offering unto that number. Therefore will I number you to the sword, and ye shall all bow down to the slaughter, because, when I called, ye did not answer, when I spoke, ye did not hear, but did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. The prophet Ezekiel relates that the Lord, angered at the worship of idols by the Jews, how will he not now be angered at the new kind of idolatry of the socialist states and other fetishes that the Jews have set up again in the communist hells? Had revealed to him, chapter 8, verse 18. Therefore will I also deal in fury, mine I shall not spare, neither will I have pity, and though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet shall I not hear them. Chapter 9, verse 1. He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite, let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children, and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began with the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain, go ye forth. And they went forth, and slew in the city. And it came to pass, while they were slaying them, and I was left, that I fell upon my face, and cried, and said, Ah, Lord God! Wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness, for they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. And as for me also, mine I shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. The word of God, our Lord, speaks for itself. We cannot, without blaspheming, contradict him or criticize him. This is the divine justice, just as Holy Scripture reveals it to us not in the manner of the enlightened Jews or even those clergy who pretend to be Christians but who act as if they were Jews, falsifying and therefore working together with the synagogue of the devil. In the prophecy of Hosea the crimes of Israel and Judah are spoken of, and the punishments which God will lay upon them. Chapter 4, verse 1. Dot. There is no truth, no mercy, nor knowledge of God, in the land. By swearing, and lying, and killing, and stealing, and committing adultery, they break out, the blood toucheth blood. Chapter 5, verse 2, They will not frame their doings to turn unto their God, for the spirit of whoredoms is in the midst of them, and they have not known the Lord. And the pride of Israel doth testify to its face, therefore shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity, Judah also shall fall with them.
at the same time that God refers to the shameful deeds of Israel, he brings, in the prophecy of Amos, his resolution to expression, that he will not allow the continuation of these misdeeds, chapter 8, verse 2. And he said, Amos, what sest thou? And I said, A basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, The end is come upon my peoples of Israel, I will not again pass by them any more. Chapter 9, verse 1. I saw the Lord standing upon the altar, and he said, Smite the lintel of the door, that the posts may shake, and cut them in the head, all of them, and I will slay the last of them with the sword, he that fleeth of them shall not flee away, and he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. In the prophecy of Daniel the latter mentions what the archangel Saint Gabriel revealed to him concerning the death of Christ. He reported that the people which scorned him would no longer be the chosen people of God, but that devastation would come over Israel and the end of the world. Chapter 9, verse 25, No, therefore, and understand, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, unto the Messiah the Prince, shall be seven weeks, and threescore and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times, and after threescore and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined, that is until the end of the world. It is unbelievable that clergy who regard themselves as good Christians, but who are more concerned with the defense of Jewry than with Holy Church risk asserting in our days that this God-murdering people is still the chosen people of God, in spite of all its crimes and the passages in the Holy Scripture that prove that it is far removed from being the chosen people in the present, such as it was before Jesus Christ, rather is it far more a people cursed by God, because all curses which the Lord has cast against this people, in the event of its not obeying His commandments, have now been fulfilled. These curses have with justice fallen upon the Jews indeed with all the more justice, because they have committed the most revolting and punishable crime of all times, of denying the sons of God in person, martyring and crucifying him. It is very difficult to comprehend the whole truth concerning this event, the naked truth, particularly in a world that has been influenced over generations by a host of lies and Jewish fables, which even words of St. Paul elaborate. These fables have distorted the truth about the Jewish question even in the minds of Catholics. It is therefore urgently necessary that someone dares to speak openly, even if it is unpleasant for all who feel themselves offended in Christianity in their own flesh. Let us recall that Christ, our Lord, said to us clearly himself that only the truth would make us free. On the other hand, the previously quoted word of God proves to us that, just as God was energetic and irreconcilable in his struggle against Satan, so he was also irreconcilable against the forces of Satan upon earth. This leaves without prospect of success the attempts of the enemy to bind the hands of Christians with a destructive and cowardly morality which supports itself upon the ideas of a pretended Christian love of one's neighbor, which they shape according to their women whose application they prescribe, in order to make clear the way for the powers, already alluded to of the devil upon earth, a morality which clearly stands in contradiction with the combating and energetic mode of action of God, our Lord, in these cases. In the preceding passages of the Old Testament, which contain what God revealed to the world through the mediation of Moses and the prophets, the myth is destroyed that the Jewish people is untouchable, that no one can combat its crimes because it is a kind of holy people for we have already seen that God ordained the punishments that he would cause to fall upon them, if, instead of the commandments being kept by this people, they trampled upon them. When Holy Church gave its agreement to the restricting policy of the Inquisition courts, it acted in accordance with what God had foreseen in the Old Testament and defended the whole of mankind, by in this way holding up for several centuries the progress of the bloody conspiracy which is on the point of sinking the world into chaos and into the most monstrous slavery of all times. We are sincere enemies of bloodshed, our greatest longing consists in the hope that wars may vanish from the face of the earth. But the Jews must understand that these terrible bloodbaths, which they have suffered over the centuries, apart from the fact that they are announced in the Old Testament as divine punishment, 
have been to the greatest part the consequence of the criminal conduct which the Israelites have shown in the lands of other peoples, who in magnanimous manner allowed them to immigrate and offered them heartfelt hospitality. If the Hebrews, in every land which receives them with open arms, repay this friendly reception by their beginning a traitorous war of conquest, by their organizing conspiracies, causing revolutions to break out and killing thousands of citizens of that nation, it is only natural that they suffer the consequences of their criminal acts. And if we deeply regret the shedding of Israelite blood, then we do this all the more with shedding of Christian and Gentile blood, which the Jews, with their disturbances or by means of the Red Terror, have caused to flow in torrents. We honestly invite the Jewish youth to reflect impartially concerning this problem and to lay to one side the fake historical texts concerning Jewry, with which the rabbis deceive them by their wishing to make the youth believe that the Hebrews are always innocent victims of the other nations, in order to give the young Jews a diabolic hatred towards mankind and an insane thirst for revenge. Chapter 5 Antisemitism and Christianity. In all their ambitious and revolutionary undertakings, the Jews have always used the same tactics, in order to deceive the peoples. They have used abstract and hazy concepts or playing with words of malleable importance and contents, which can be interpreted in a twofold manner and used in a different way. For example, there appear the ideas of all embracing liberty, equality, and fraternity, and above all that of anti Semitism a word of enormous stretching power. They give this generalization diverse meanings and uses, which have the aim of laying the Christian and Gentile peoples in chains, with the intention of preventing their defending themselves against the Jewish striving for power and the destructive effect of their anti-Christian forces. This deceitful behavior one can summarize as follows. First step, the condemning of anti-Semitism by means of skilled campaigns and to attain persistent influences adjusted to each other and of diverse energy, which are exercised either by socialist forces, which Jewry controls, or which are carried out by their secret agents who have smuggled themselves into the Christian institutions, into their churches or into their governments. In order to be able to do so and attain this first step, so that one after another of the religious and political leaders condemns anti-Semitism, they give this first step its importance. a. As a racial discrimination of the same kind as is carried on by the whites in different lands against the Negroes, and conversely by the Negroes against the whites. Also they represent anti-Semitism as a racial consciousness, which regards other races as inferior, and which therefore resists the instruction and teaching of the martyr of Golgotha, who on his part established and confirmed the equality of men before God. b as pure hatred towards the Jewish people, which stands in contradiction with the highest principle of Christ, love one another. c. As an attack upon or condemnation of the people which gave its blood to Jesus and Mary. The Jews have described this argument as irresistible. By giving these or other such interpretations to anti-Semitism, the Jews or their agents who have penetrated into Christianity have wrong-footed the charity goodness and good faith of many Christian rulers and even highly regarded religious personages, be it those of the Catholic Church or of the Protestant churches and other dissidents. For, when the latter yield to such well-organized, murky and persistent influences, abstract and sweeping criticisms or condemnations of anti-Semitism begin to be formulated which lack any specifics as to what in reality is being condemned and what actually this censured anti-Semitism means. And when the real object of the condemnation is thus left so imprecise and vague, there is every danger that the Jews and their agents within Christianity will become the sole interpreters of such weighty decisions. If the high religious personages who are exposed to indescribable pressure would at least pay heed to describing exactly what they understand by this anti-Semitism which they condemn, the danger is lesser, for in condemnation expressions should be exactly defined, which one condemns. For example, racial discrimination or hatred towards a particular people. If the Jews also possess the boldness to raise a claim for a final all embracing definition of anti Semitism, in order to skillfully enlarge the radius of effect of its condemnation, it is easier to prove the sophistry of their approach. Second step after the Jews or their secret agents have attained these condemnations, they give the words a different meaning than was intended, 
in order to preserve these judgments, then anti-Semites will be described as I those who protect their countries from the attacks of the ambitious Jewish striving for power, in that the former make use of the natural right, which all peoples possess, to defend independence and freedom. 2. Those who exercise criticism of the disintegrating activity of the Jewish forces, which destroy the Christian family and degenerate the youth, and who combat these effects. 3. Those who in any kind of form censure or combat hatred and racial discrimination, but which the Jews believe they have the right to exert against the Christians, although they hypocritically attempt to conceal it, and those who in any kind of form broadcast the misdeeds, offenses and crimes that were committed by the Jews against the Christians, and demand deserved punishment for this. 4. Those who snatch away the mask from Jewry as leader of communism, of Freemasonry and other underground movements, and attempt to attain that necessary measures are put in force to prevent disintegrating activity in the circle of the Christian family. v. Those who in any kind of form resist the Jewish activity that has the aim of destroying Holy Church and Christian civilization in general. This dirty game is apparent, to attain the censure or condemnation of an anti-Semitism which they equate with a racial discrimination or with an outbreak of hatred against peoples, which is exercised against the Jews, both, however, contrary to Christian teaching, in order to afterwards give the word new meanings, and to attempt to bring it about that those who defend Holy Church, their nation, their family or their natural rights against the attacks of Jewish hunger for power, are bound hand and foot and are thus incapable of carrying out such a justifiable defense. In order to attain this, the open and secret Jewish forces set up a loudly resounding apparatus of propaganda and of lamentation, by setting up a complaining outcry about the anti-Semites who make use of the right of self-defense. They cry themselves hoarse with their assertion that the Catholic Church condemns anti-Semitism, and in the name of the Church they condemn such leaders who, so they assure us, no believer may support in this anti-Semitic work of defense of his people his family and of Holy Church against the revolutionary activity of the Jewish striving for power. A clumsy maneuver, but it succeeds in sowing confusion and calling forth disorder and weakening the activity of these estimable leaders in the defense of their peoples and of Christian civilization. This is the securest form which they have conceived, in order to obtain the victory of the Jewish Freemasonic or Jewish Communist revolutions. These procedures have secured the triumph of Jewry in recent time, and called forth the corresponding catastrophe that threatens the Christian world. For this reason, this matter must be studied and thought over fundamentally by us all, who are obligated to defend Holy Church and our country against the anti-Christian striving for power that modern Jewry represents. An example of this incredible maneuver is shown to us by the following case. The highly regarded Catholic writer Vincente Rizco describes to us how certain organizations, which were founded for the conversion of the Jews, are more effective in their defense of the Jewish race than in their conversion. The Lehman brothers, for example, used the devout zeal of Holy Church more for defending the Jewish people than for attaining successful results in conversion. When, therefore, the Catholic writer Drummond revealed in the past century, in his France Jew I've, the Jewish conspiracy that attempts to destroy Christianity and to rule the French people, Peter Lehman answered in defense of his race and hence contributed to the defeat of the Catholics in France and to the victory of Jewish Freemasonry. The same occurs with the Order of Our Virgin of Zion, which was founded by newly converted Jews, and which dedicated itself more to the purpose of defending the Hebrews who are members of the synagogue of the devil, than converting them to the truth. In the present century another association was founded in order to accept the Jews into the church by means of their conversion. Such a devout ideal was very popular, and it was successful in arranging countless demonstrations of confidence by clergy and laymen. The educated historical writer Vicente Rizgo says about this. To it belonged countless influential and rich believers, bishops and even cardinals, they carried on propaganda and published a pamphlet speaking for the Jews under the title, Pax Super Israel. This association began to advocate strange teachings, which stood on the fringe of the unfalsified spirit of the Catholic Church and gradually separated themselves from the tradition of instruction by the popes and from the liturgy, as a Catholic journal says. They said that one might not speak of the conversion of the Jews, 
but of their reception into the church, as if the Jews in fact need not give up their false belief. They rejected the epithet God murdering people, which was applied to the Jews, and God murdering city applied to Jerusalem, as though the Jews had not contributed to the death of Jesus, and as though church language had not called them traitors. They accused the popes, because they had not understood the Jewish people, as though the latter were not guilty of voluntarily remaining in Judaism. Finally they maintained the Jewish nationality of Jesus Christ and alluded to the fact that the Christians, by means of Holy Communion, unite with the Jews and enter into blood relationship with them. Naturally this was going too far. The Church could not tolerate it, and the Inquisition court saw no alternative than to intervene, since among such arrogant friends of Israel there were many honorable believers, bishops and cardinals, the court, in its decree of the year 1928, spoke no formal punishment, but, resolute in this, banned the association and the pamphlet Pact Super Israel which had been the cause of the intervention of the church court. Divine support became evident a further time, when this recent conspiracy was destroyed, which had reached into the highest circles of Holy Church. This example is very actual, for as we have experienced, the Israelites planned far more weighty acts against the Second Vatican Council. 1963, when they used the holy zeal of faith for a Christian unity and talks with the Jews, in order to attempt to attain that decisions were made relating to the Hebrews that would not only contradict the doctrine that has been defended by Holy Church over centuries but would also, in almost imperceptible form for the great majority of the Council Fathers, represent a silent condemnation of the policy that had been maintained over 1,500 years by the earlier popes and councils. It is illuminating and understandable that, with the realization of their satanic intentions, the conspirators would be successful in achieving that Holy Church contradicted itself and from this would result the most unwholesome consequences that one can possibly imagine. But what the Jews and their agents within Christianity do not reckon with is the support of God for His Church, which He allows to triumph a second time against the forces of hell. With reference to the Jew-friendly association, which cardinals, bishops and believers belonged to, and to their pamphlet Pax Super Israel, their condemnation through the Inquisition Court by means of Edict of Dissolution in the year 1928 was no easy matter. There was a bitter struggle in the highest spheres of the Church, as one learns from reliable sources, and when their members saw coming the unavoidable dissolution of the association and the resultant following ban, they prepared a desperate counterattack in which they made renewed use of Christian love of one's neighbor and the true-heartedness of the high personages of the Church, in order to attain that anti-Semitism would also be banned. They regarded it as a manifestation of race hatred, which is in contradiction with the sermons of our Lord Jesus Christ, which are based upon the guiding motive, love one another. In this manner they were so successful that, after exerting all influence and manifold pressure, the Inquisition Court, which dissolved the association friendly to the Jews, passed an order which affirmed as a result, that, just as Holy Church disapproves of all hatred and bitterness between peoples, so it also condemns hatred against the people chosen by God in His time, that hatred which today is generally described with the word anti-Semitism. As usual Jewry was successful, by means of the condemned Pact Super Israel group, in also attaining the condemnation of anti-Semitism in that the latter was equated with hatred towards a definite people, a hatred, which is incompatible with the preachings of love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Later, Jewry attempted to cause this condemnation to fall on Catholics who defend Holy Church, their country and their children from the Jewish conspiracy, by applying to the word anti-Semitism a different meaning from that which served as foundation for its condemnation. If, with this procedure, a Catholic in the United States demands the punishment of Jews, because they have supplied atomic secrets to Russia, to provide communism with the power for subjection of the world, it is said that this is the anti-Semitism condemned by the Church, and that one must keep silent. If someone pillories the Jews as leaders of communism and of Freemasonry and lays bare their intentions, namely that of destroying the Church, then he is likewise condemned as an anti-Semite. The result of these subtleties and intrigues consists in that the Jews are regarded as untouchable, so that they commit every kind of crime against the Christians, 
instigate the most destructive crimes against the church in Christian countries and can carry out the most devastating Freemasonic or community revolutions, without anyone being able to act, punish and still less curb their activity, because otherwise he will be accused of anti-Semitism and hence incur the condemnation of the Inquisition Court. If the leaders of this serviceable institution, which the Jew-friendly organization Pax Super Israel represented, had taken account of what misused Jewry and its agents would exercise with the edict which condemned hatred towards people, and hence also against the Jewish people, they would have been filled with horror. If one wishes to see still clearer the lies spun by Jewry in this connection, it suffices to take a very evident example, which allows the hatefulness of this truly dialectic sophistry to be discerned, which the Hebrews and their accomplices pretend with the word anti-Semitism. What would the Jews have said, if proceeding from the basis that Holy Church condemns hatred between the peoples, one had come to the conviction during the last war that this universal condemnation also includes hatred towards the German people, which analogously was called anti-Germanism, so as accordingly to declare every struggle against the Nazis as impermissible, for the latter were Germans and to fight them is a manifestation of anti-Germanism which was also fundamentally condemned by the church court. Would the Jews have accepted such a mode of thought, which, under protection of such plain with words, allowed Nazi Germany to be declared as untouchable? With such a rational conclusion, the Jews, like their forefather Kaiaphas, would have rent their clothes and have protested against the criminal plain with words, which does not prevent the Hebrews from utilizing the same with all common cynicism, in order to prevent Christians from being able to defend themselves. In reference to the condemning of racial discrimination something similar occurs. First of all the Israelites and their accomplices within the clergy give a restrictive meaning to the word racial discrimination, by equating it with the demand of one specific race to regard the other races as inferior and to rob them of their natural rights, or by equating it with an anti-Semitic racial discrimination which, in blasphemous manner, draws our Lord Jesus Christ the Most Holy Virgin or the Apostles into their critique, so as with such impressive arguments to attain a completely universal condemnation of racial discrimination, which then allows them, as fighters against racial discrimination, to accuse all those who fight for protection of the Church or their nations against the Jewish onslaught, in order to attain their condemnation. In addition we must bring to mind that a condemnation of racial discrimination is very dangerous for the Catholic Church itself for there exist orders of His Holiness Paul IV and other popes that forbid admittance to the honorary offices of the Church to Catholics of Jewish origin, or which confirmed this ban. We will study this order later on. Therefore a condemnation of racial discrimination will be the evil-willed occasion for asserting that Holy Church contradicts itself, and, what is still more weighty, it tacitly condemns several of its most famous popes who recognized and confirmed the natural rules of the purity of blood. Chapter 6. Christ our Lord, the symbol of anti-Semitism, so the Jews assert, so that the well-meaning Catholic clergy can form an idea of how dangerous this affair of anti-Semitism is, they must know that the Hebrews at different periods have regarded our Lord Jesus Christ, the Apostles, various popes the councils and saints of the church as hostile to the Jews. It is natural that they have done this, for they regard everything as hostile to the Jews that blames or combats their crimes or their conspiracies against mankind, and both our Lord Jesus Christ as well as the apostles and the other mentioned Catholic authorities censured and fought on different occasions against the blackmail of the Jews. The New Testament of the Holy Scripture, the church laws of the councils, the bulls and papal dispatches, and the trustworthy testimonies of the saints who were canonized by the Church, as well as the confessions which in part were made by the Jews themselves, prove this in an unmistakable manner. So that Catholics may not have the slightest doubt of the testimonies which are recorded, we translate with special care what the outstanding Zionist writer Joseph Dunner writes in his book The Republic of Israel, in which he asserts the following. For every sect believing in Christ, Jesus is the symbol of everything that is healthy and worthy of love. For the Jews he is from the 4th century onward the symbol of anti-Semitism, of slander, of violence and of violent death. If the Israelites regard our Lord Jesus Christ as a symbol of anti-Semitism, or better expressed, of anti-Judaism, then they are completely right, 
for if they describe as anti-Semites those who blame and combat their disgraceful deeds, then our Divine Redeemer was the first who did this. When our Lord Jesus Christ had a discussion with certain Jews, he began the following dialogue, as the Gospel of John relates. Chapter 8, verse 39, They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication, we have one father, even God. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. He that is of God heareth God's words, ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Then answered the Jews, and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan, and hast a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye do dishonor me. And this passage of the Gospel ended with the following verses, Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself, and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. In the preceding passage of the Gospel of John, one sees how Christ, our Lord, upbraids the Jews for their murderous intentions, and calls them children of the devil. He likewise proves that the Hebrews of that time were unable to carry on discussions in a calm and honorable form, exactly as today, without bringing in insults slanders or violent actions, always according to its suiting them. And if with our Divine Redeemer they used lies and insults and attempted to dishonor Him, as He Himself gives evidence in verse 49, or strove to end the discussion with stone throwing, what could we poor human creatures then expect? In chapter 23 of the Gospel of Matthew, our Lord Jesus, in reference to the Jewish leaders who opposed Him so much, 38 describes the latter as hypocrites v. 13, 14, 15, etc., full of iniquity, verse 28, foolish, blind, verse 17, clean outside, but within full of extortion and excess, verse 25, whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outwards, but within are full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness, verse 27, children of them which killed the prophets, verse 31. The said chapter of the Holy Gospels ends with this express complaint of our Lord Jesus Christ against the Jews, who denied their Messiah and resisted him, and which, because of its importance, we quote completely here. Verse 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers! How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets, and wise men and scribes, some of them ye shall kill and crucify and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues, and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah son of Brashia, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Better than any other, Christ, the Lord, here reveals to us the murderous and cruel instincts of the Jews. This is understandable, because, in the revelation which he made to his favorite disciple, and which the latter has written down in the Apocalypse, he called the Jews, who denied their Messiah, the synagogue of Satan an equally appropriate as well as divine description, which, in the ensuing centuries, was often used by the Holy Catholic Church as a description for criminal and conspiratorial Jewry, which since its murder of the Son of God has not ceased to commit every kind of crime against God and mankind. In the present book we used on our side this expression synagogue of Satan in order to frequently identify modern Jewry, 
for one would with difficulty find a more fitting appellation than this, which was already thought of by Christ, our Lord. Only with difficulty will one find among the leaders who have combated Jewry in the Christian era, someone who has used such hard words against the Jews as Jesus Christ himself. It is therefore not to be wondered at that the Jewish writer Joseph Dunner, in his work mentioned, gives the assurance that the Jews regard Christ as the symbol of anti-Semitism, all the more as many Christians and Gentiles have been accused of anti-Semitism on account of far milder attacks. It is therefore dangerous that good-willed Christian clergy allow themselves to be torn away by those who are not. Dangerous again for them to let loose general and unclear condemnations of anti-Semitism, which exposes them to the danger of condemning even Christ our Redeemer, his apostles, the saints and popes, described by the synagogue of Satan as anti-Semites- because the Jews afterwards attempt to use such condemnations as a new carte blanche that justifies them in furthering every kind of crime, offense and conspiracy against mankind and secures freedom from punishment for themselves, so that the former cannot even effectively defend themselves against them. It is necessary to keep before our eyes that in every land or every institution in which Jewry gains sufficient influence, be it through its open activity or be it in secret manner through its fifth column, it seeks first of all to attain the condemnation of anti-Semitism, which on occasions prevents every attempt at defense. When they have been successful, by means of their cheating, in creating such a situation contrary to order, then any kind of conspiracy, any kind of treachery, any kind of crime or offense can only be punished if it was committed by a Christian or a Gentile, but not if committed by one or more Jews. And should anyone wish to lay punishment upon those responsible, one will at once hear the outcry of the press, of the radio and of letters that are artificially organized, in the form of angry protests against the beginnings of anti-Semitism, which has appeared like a hated plague. This is in every respect unjust, unbelievable and insane, for the Jews have not the right to demand a special privilege that allows them to commit crimes unpunished, to betray peoples who grant refuge to them, and to instigate conspiracies and unrest in order to secure domination over the others. Without discrimination of race or religion, every person or organization that is responsible for the committing of this kind of crime must receive the deserved punishment. This truth cannot be more open or simpler, and, if the Jews do not wish to believe it, the latter is nevertheless fully and completely in force for them also. It very frequently occurs that the Jews, Apart from the fact that they use the condemnation of anti-Semitism in the form already elaborated, also use another kind of cunning for the same purpose. This malice is founded upon the sophistry that is spun by the Jews themselves and is supported by Catholic and Protestant clergy who consciously or unconsciously work together with them, and solemnly assert in dogmatic form, that it is illegal to fight against the Jews, because they are the people which gave its blood to Jesus. Such clumsy quibbling is very easy to refute. One needs only to quote the passage from the Gospels, where Christ, our Redeemer, after he calls the Jews, who fight against him, once again a generation of vipers, 41 clearly and distinctly rejects the consequence of blood relationship and recognizes only the spiritual. In fact one reads in this passage the following. Matthew 12, 47. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother, and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother, and sister, and mother. In spite of the fact that Jesus, on his mother's side, was blood related with the ancient Hebrew people of biblical times. It is evident that for the future he only recognized the spiritual relationship, in that he looked over and beyond the blood-related links with his relatives, and, with even more justice, beyond those with the Jewish people who rejected him as the Messiah, denied him, martyred him and murdered him after a long and cruel torture, committing the most monstrous crime of all time and transforming itself into the God-murdering people. But if Christ called the Jews, who slandered him, children of the devil and generation of vipers, he confirmed that he is God's son and allows it to be discerned that no kind of relationship binds him with the Jews, that indeed none can exist between God's son and the children of Satan, 
nor can a connection exist between good and evil. The thesis that the synagogue of Satan, that is modern Jewry, had given Christ his blood and therefore must not be combated, is therefore completely false and even heretical. If this most disgraceful thesis were true, neither Christ himself, nor his apostles, nor many saints, the councils and the popes, would have combated it. It is foolish to equate with the later Jews the original Hebrew people, in which Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the Most Holy Virgin Mary and the Apostles are included, who received the divine privilege of being the chosen people of the Lord. The later Jews violated the condition laid upon them by God of being the chosen people, and therefore deserved, on account of their crimes, their rebelliousness and misdeeds, the title of Synagogue of Satan. The privilege of the chosen people has been inherited by the Holy Church of Christ, which is the real spiritual successor of the original Hebrew people of biblical times. Into the same confusion, into which those Christian clergy have fallen who cooperate with the synagogue of Satan, fell certain radical circles of Hitlerite Nazism who, in their zeal to combat international Jewry, invented an absurd, nay blasphemous, racial doctrine that identified the chosen people of Abraham, Isaac, Moses, the Most Holy Virgin Mary and the Apostles with the Synagogue of Satan, that is with modern Jewry, and in identical manner rejected the one as the other as members of an undesirable race, thereby maintaining a thesis unacceptable to Christians. The anti-communist Germans, who at present fight in such a heroic manner against the Soviet strivings for power, should calmly reflect about this affair so that those who combat devilish Jewry do not commit anew the errors of the Nazis, which leads to that foolish and anti-Christian confusion of a racist kind, which, apart from the fact that it is unjust, false and blasphemous, would call forth the indignation of Christians at the moment when the unity of all honorable people in the world, all who believe in God and the good cause, is necessary in order to fight the Jewish communist monster, which advances unceasingly and thirsty for blood threatening all mankind equally, without discrimination of race or religion. In order to give a striking proof of how dangerous it is to formulate condemnations of anti-Semitism, we will in conclusion quote an irrefutable document, and in fact one of the official and most important works of contemporary Jewry, the Spanish Jewish Encyclopedia, which was published in 1948 by the Jewish Encyclopedia Publishers, Mexico, D.F and in whose preparation the following collaborated, Ben Zion Uziel, Grand Rabbi of the Holy Land, Max Yogubski, of the Latin American section of the American Jewish Committee of New York, Professor Dr. Hugo Bergman, Professor and former Rector of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Isidore Meyer, Librarian of the American Jewish Historical Society of New York, Haim Nahon Evendi, Grand Rabbi of Egypt, Drive Georg Herlitz, director of the Zionist Central Archive of Jerusalem, and many other leading personalities and men of science of world Jewry. The most important thing is how the said Jewish encyclopedia defines the word anti-Semitism, and what the Hebrews regard as such, asserting among other things the following, in the Middle Ages, with the establishment of the Christian Church as the state religion and its spreading into Europe began the persecution of the Jews, the motives for this were at first of a purely religious nature. The spiritual power of the church was only very imperfectly established. In the measure that heresy raised its head, so the persecution became more intensive and in general fell always upon the Jews as a convenient scapegoat. In the face of the propagandist strivings of the church the Jew was the constant denier. A great part of Christian anti-Semitism is to be attributed to the reforming of the religious rituals which the church had accepted from Jewry and which it transformed into anti-Jewish symbolism. The Jewish feast of the Passover was linked with the crucifixion. And in the sermons the Jews began to be denounced as traitors, as bloodthirsty, etc., and the feelings of the people stirred up against them. They were said to have magical and maleficent powers owing to their alliance with Satan. The Catholic world came to believe that the Jews knew that the Christian teaching was the truthful one, but that they refused to accept this truth and falsify the biblical texts to prevent a Christological interpretation being applied to them. The Jewish alliance with Satan was not some kind of medieval-minded allegory, nor the invention of a fanatical priesthood. The Gospel itself, John 8, verse 44, 
said that the Jews are children of the devil. The servants of the church constantly stressed the Satanism of the Jews and called them disciples and allies of the devil. The constant ecclesiastical accusation of deicide, of their thirst for Christian blood, their symbolic scourging of the crucifix, their lack of reason and their evil instincts produced a too frightening picture for it not to exert the deepest effects upon the human masses. Although the church attempted, by means of papal edicts and encyclicals, to contain the popular hatred, which it itself had produced, the anti-Jewish mentality of the time took effect in excesses of the mob, in bloodbaths among the Jews, in expulsions and compulsory conversions, etc. And after the Hebrew encyclopedists have quoted the Jew hostile laws of certain Christian rulers, of which some were apparently inspired by various church fathers like Ambrose and Chrysostom, they concluded with the assertion. However, the most hostile legislation came from the side of the church itself, from its councils, from papal agreements and from canon law, whose severity constantly increased from the 4th to the 16th century. One of the most recent revelations of Jewish literature that supports the thesis that the Church had been unjust towards the Jews, are the books of Jules Isaac, Jesus at Israel and the recently published L'Enseignement du Mepris, which was praised by the writer and politician Carlo Bo. The lasting pressure of those who serve the interests of Jewry within Holy Church and which has been directed towards attaining ambiguous condemnations of anti-Semitism can have no other disastrous purpose than to seek to attain that the Church in the end passes judgment on itself. For the Jews, who more than anyone else feel themselves authorized to define anti-Semitism, regard Holy Church, as one can see from the preceding, as principally responsible for an unbridled Christian anti-Semitism. Chapter 7. The Deicide People. Let us recall that an association under the name Friends of Israel, to which even cardinals and bishops belonged, was dissolved by His Holiness Pope Pius XI, by means of the Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office, in the year 1928, and that among the assertions condemned, assertions which the said association spread, was that the Jewish people were not the murderers of God, which contradicts what the Church has maintained for nearly twenty centuries. Condemned by the Church, this association was dissolved through the edict mentioned. No one imagined that its adventures would be re-enlivened, until it was established to great astonishment that, after more than thirty years, the Jews had founded the same association again and it was supported by a numerous group of clergy, who nevertheless defiantly contradict the condemnation expressed by the Holy Office and assert that it is completely false that our Lord Jesus Christ was killed by the Jews and that those really responsible for the murder were the Romans. Consequently it is unjustifiable to describe the Jewish people as murderers of God. The audacity of the new friends of Israel verges on the limits of the incomprehensible, for they not only dare to contradict the apostles of the Lord, but Christ himself, as will be proved in what follows by means of texts from the New Testament, which reveal I that Christ accused the Jews and not the Romans of wishing to kill him. 2 that the Jews and not the Romans were those who had the intention of killing Jesus, and who upon different occasions attempted to destroy him before his passion and death. 3. That the Jews and not the Romans were the instigators and truly responsible for the crime. 4. That the apostles accused the Jews and not the Romans of the death of Jesus. First Thesis, Christ accused the Jews and not the Romans of wishing to kill him. Proof. In the Gospel of John, Chapter 8. The Apostle relates that Jesus, in a verbal dispute with some Jews, said to them, verse 37, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. And afterwards, as the Apostle alludes in verse 40 of the same chapter, Jesus Christ, our Lord, says anew to the Jews, But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham and in another chapter of the said Holy Gospel, in the seventh, the favorite disciple points out that Jesus, having gone on a certain day to the temple in order to preach, said to the Jews. 19. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? In no passage of the holy apostles does it appear that Christ, our Lord, said that the Romans wished to kill him, but on the contrary he accused the Jews of wanting to do it. Do then the clergy who represent this new kind of, 
Jew friendly, thesis believe that Christ, our Lord, was wrong and that now, in this century, they have just discovered that our Lord Jesus Christ could not foresee that it was the Romans and not the Jews who wished to kill him? Second thesis, it was the Jews and not the Romans who repeatedly planned and attempted to kill Jesus, even before his passion and death. Proofs, the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 21, relates to us that Christ our Lord. 23. When he had come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? The Apostle then tells further of the discussion which Jesus conducted with such high leaders of the Jewish people, to close the passage with these two verses. 45. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parables, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. This passage shows that the intentions of attack did not emanate from irresponsible Jews, but from the respected leaders of the Jewish people, who were then the chief priest as well as the Pharisees, who had a decisive influence in the government of that nation. In the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 3, one reads the following, 1. And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And when he had looked around about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth, and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. One thus sees that the leading strata of the Jewish people plotted against Jesus to cause his death, and in fact long before he was led before Pilate, without there being in the Gospels one passage which alludes to an intention or a plan of the Romans to do this. John remarks that, because Jesus had healed the lame man on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. In chapter 5, he says, 18. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. In the Gospel according to Luke, the disciple tells us how Christ was in Nazareth and went on the Sabbath into the synagogue, began to preach and aroused opposition in many of those present with his preaching. In verses 28 and 29 of the fourth chapter the evangelist says, 28. And all they in the synagogue when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. And they rose up, and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. If they attempted to kill him in his own city, this means that the intention of murdering him was universal and not only restricted to the Jewish leaders of Jerusalem. St. John further reveals in chapter 7, verse I, after these things Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. This passage cannot be clearer. Throughout the whole of Judea the Jews sought Jesus in order to kill him, but since his hour had not yet come, he preferred not to go into this region. If there were various preceding intentions and conspiracies to kill Jesus, then it was also the Jews and not the Romans who hatched the final conspiracy that was to result in his death. Third Thesis the Jews and not the Romans were the instigators and those really responsible for the crime, proofs. In the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 22, the disciple says, 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him. In chapter 11 of the Gospel according to St. John, for its part, is found the following passages. 47. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council, and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles? And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. Then, from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews. St. Luke says that it was the Jews and not the Romans who bribed Judas to hand Christ over to them, chapter 22. 3. Then entered Satan into Judas surnamed Iscariot, 
being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way, and communed with the chief priests and captains, how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad, and covenanted to give him money. And he promised, and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. Chapter 18, 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Cedron, where was a garden, into the which he entered, and his disciples, and Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus, and bound him, and led him away to Annas first, for he was father in law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas the high priest. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. In chapter 19, he relates further that, after Pilate had had Jesus scourged, as the Bible annotation of so volume v, page 255 explains, and Jesus was seen in a condition which would have moved to pity even the wild beasts and softened their hearts. 4. Pilate therefore went forth again, and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns, and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him, and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus, and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him, and two others with him, on neither side one, and Jesus in the midst. Pilate like others also who did not belong to the generation of vipers, to use the actual words of Christ, could not imagine to what degree the cruelty of the Jews would reach, for it is something extraordinary in the history of mankind. By their denying their God and Lord, they fell into the deepest abyss. If they did even with Jesus what they have done, then we can no longer be surprised at the terrible ritual crimes that the Jews practiced for several centuries concerning whose monstrous occurrences and disputable evidences at hand, even from the saints of the Catholic Church. These ritual crimes consisted, as is known, in capturing an innocent Christian child and, on Good Friday subjecting it to all tortures of the Passion, and causing it to suffer the same cruel death that they had prepared for Christ our Lord. In the unfortunate child they cold-bloodedly repeated the Passion and death of Jesus. The veneration that is shown in Italy to the child-blessed Simon of Trent and the child-blessed Lorenzino de Morostico has in fact its origin and that both were martyred by the Jews. All this would seem incredible to us, if irrefutable proof of their actual execution were not available, not only during the Middle Ages, but also in recent times. Only a generation of vipers, as the Son of God called them, a cold-blooded and merciless race, the murderers of Jesus Christ could arrive at such uttermost limits of insanity, which today we still experience in the communist lands, where they tortured and killed millions of Christians and Gentiles with all application of cruelty. As long as the beast, according to the expression used in the Apocalypse of St. John, lay in chains for a thousand years, that is from the 5th to the 15th century, it limited itself to crucifying defenseless children, to polluting crucifixes and images of the Holy Virgin Mary to degrading sacred objects, to dirtying the holy memory of Jesus and Mary with blasphemies and terrible slanders. 
But when the beast made itself free at the beginning of the 16th century, it finally rolled over the whole world in the 19th and 20th century. Then it no longer restricted itself to only spitting upon and shamefully polluting the crucifixes or the images of the Holy Virgin Mary, or in slandering in horrible manner the memory of the latter. It was no longer necessary, due to a lack of other objects, to concentrate their entire hatred and their entire cruelty upon innocent children, the horrible monster, freed of its chains and free of ecclesiastical and civil laws, which had kept the Jews locked in the ghettos and separated from the Christians free of the ban of occupying leading posts in Christian society, stormed loose in order to now bring everything into its possession, in order to destroy one after another of the Christian institutions and to unleash their diabolic hatred against the whole of Christianity, which is being systematically destroyed in the communist lands. The Jewish writer Salvatore Gianni confirms the foregoing, when he says, once the Hebrews were out of the ghetto. They flung themselves upon the conquest of all those material and spiritual positions which had been forbidden to them in the past centuries. Only the hand that martyred Jesus Christ could be capable of organizing chicas and secret police, in order to commit horrible crimes and frightful number, which have not their like in history, St. Mark reports to us in chapter 14 of his Gospel. 1. After two days was the feast of the Passover, and of unleavened bread and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft, and put him to death. And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priests, to betray him unto them. And when they heard it, they were glad, and promised to give him money. And he sought how he might conveniently betray him. It is necessary to establish that Judas did not attempt to betray him to the Romans, but to the Jews, because they and not the Romans were interested in killing Christ. St. Mark continues with a passage which proves that it was the spiritual and civil leaders of the Jewish peoples, and not the Romans, who had Jesus taken prisoner. And immediately, while he yet spake, cometh Judas, one of the twelve, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves, from the chief priests and the scribes and elders. And he that betrayed him had given them a token, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he, take him, and lead him away safely. And they laid hands on him, and took him. And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes, that is the leaders of the Jewish people, the most far-reaching representatives of Israel. And the chief priests and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death, and found none. For many bear witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. But neither so did their witness agree together. And the high priest stood up in the midst, and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But he held his peace, and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him, and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am, and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, and saith, what need we any further witnesses? Ye have heard the blasphemy, what think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. And some began to spit on him, and to cover his face, and to buffet him, and to say unto him, Prophesy, and the servants did strike him with the palms of their hands. For two thousand years long the whole world has been filled with horror at the cruelty and hardness that has been displayed by the Jews in the torturing of their own God. This cruelty and this sadism has later always revealed itself, where they have intervened, especially in those lands where they were successful in introducing their totalitarian dictatorship, that is in the so-called socialist or communist states. The Holy Gospels show us clearly three of the weapons that have been the favorites of Jewry in its struggle against Christianity and still are, deception, slander and crime, these three were even used mercilessly against our God and Lord. Later they used the same against the whole of mankind, so that it has brought them the name which they bear so rightly as fathers of deceit and calumny. With these despicable weapons they easily discourage even the most resolute defenders of our belief, who are subjected without remedy to the treacherous attacks of the agents of Jewry smuggled into the church. The supreme ruler and leader of Israel, the high priest Kaiaphas, the chief priests, the elders, the judges, scribes, 
Herodians and even the influential Pharisees were responsible for the murder of God, for at first the popular mass followed Christ, and those who planned his death, feared the people. However, gradually the priests and leaders poisoned the climate and led the people against Jesus, until finally they were successful in bringing the masses into opposition with their Messiah, as the following passage of the Gospel according to St. Matthew proves. Chapter 27, 1. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away, and delivered him to Pontius Pilate the governor. Now at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner, whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner, called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you? Barabbas? or Jesus which is called Christ. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why, what evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water, and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, see ye to it. Then answered all the people, and said, His blood be on us, and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. This passage alone already represents a proof of the complete guilt of the Jews for the murder of Jesus Christ, our Lord. It also proves the responsibility that the Jewish people had for this crime, for even if its religious and civil leaders and its legal representatives had previously conceived, prepared and completed it, then nevertheless the mass of the people could have prevented it at the last hour, asking for Jesus instead of Barabbas instead of that it demanded the freeing of the latter and the crucifying of Jesus, even though as a result the blood of the Son of God would descend upon them and their descendants. Chapter 8. The Apostles Condemn the Jews for the Murder of Christ. Fourth Thesis, The Apostles Accused the Jews and not the Romans of the Death of Christ. Proofs. In the Holy Scriptures, in the Acts of the Apostles, Chapter 2, St. Peter, addressing his words to the Jews of different lands who were gathered in Jerusalem, where each, after the descent of the Holy Ghost, heard the words of the Apostle in his mother tongue, said. 14. Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Peter thus clearly lays responsibility for the murder on the entire Jewish people and does not accuse the Romans. Do the clergy, who in such incredible manner assert the contrary, perhaps assume that Peter lied when he said to the Jews who were come from other provinces, men of Israel, ye have crucified and slain him. In the third chapter of the aforementioned work we find the passage relating to the healing of the man lame from birth. 11. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them, in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us? as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk, the God of Abraham and of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up, and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses, in this passage of the New Testament, where the entire people was assembled, St. Peter upbraids the Jews for having killed Christ. In addition we find in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, 
a passage where not only St. Peter, but also the remaining apostles, categorically accuse the Council of Elders of Israel, which was summoned by the priests, of the death of Christ. 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. We have thus here a common evidence of the apostles, which accused the Jews and not the Romans, of having killed Christ. If all this will still not suffice, we will quote in addition the evidence of St. Paul and St. Stephen, the first martyrs of Christianity. St. Paul, in his first epistle to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, says with reference to the Jews. 15. Who both killed the Lord Jesus, and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. In this verse St. Paul describes the Jews in convincing manner as contrary to all men. This is a truth that can be doubted by no one who has thoroughly studied the mode of thought and the legal activities of the Jewish people. However, it is very probable that, if Paul had lived today, he would have been condemned as an enemy of the Jews, since he publicly announced a truth that may never be announced to anyone, owing to the Jews and their accomplices within the clergy. When, on his side, the proto-martyr Saint Stephen turned to the Jews of the synagogue of the freedmen, the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians and then to those of Cilicia and Asia, that is to Jews from different parts of the world, he said to them in the presence of the high priest, the spiritual leader of Israel. 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? and they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. The evidence of St. Stephen thus agrees with that of the apostles and with that of St. Paul, when he regards the Jews in general, that is both those of Jerusalem and the remaining parts of Judea, as well as those who live in other parts of the world, as a people responsible for deicide. All this is recorded in Holy Scripture where one does not find a single verse that accuses the Romans of the murder. In short, the preceding revelations of Christ our Lord, as well as the evidence of the Apostles, including St. Paul, represent an irrefutable proof that Holy Church, far from having erred over nineteen centuries, was completely right to regard the Jewish people as murderers of God, whereas to attribute responsibility for the crime to the Romans lacks any foundation. Since this doctrine, which asserts that the Romans and not the Jews were responsible for the murder of our Divine Redeemer, stands in contradiction to the evidence of Christ and the Apostles. It is proven in clear manner to be false and even heretical. At first sight, it seems absurd and inexplicable that a group of zealous Catholic clergy should be so emboldened to support such an apparent error in our days, which, if it were to prosper, would deny the truth of that which is said in the Holy Gospels, with all its unimaginable consequences. But such godless intrigues are explained, if one bears in mind that the synagogue of Satan, as well as the clergy who stand in its service, are disturbed by the struggle that devout Christians from different parts of the world are conducting against communism and against its father and instigator, the Jewish striving for power, in that they under all circumstances wish to reform the church in such a manner as to allow them to use it henceforth as a serviceable tool of the synagogue, in order to crush Catholics who fight heroically against it for the defense of Christendom and its threatened and oppressed nations. In order to attain this, it must in the first place destroy the Jew hostile teachings of the church fathers, of the popes and councils. In their indescribable insolence they go so far as to demand the setting up of new doctrines, such as those which represent the Romans and not the Jews as responsible for this despicable murder. As long as Christians continue to regard the Jewish people as the murderers of God, every assertion that has the aim of regarding them as good, holy and untouchable, is condemned to failure. However, the Hebrews fight bitterly to force upon Christianity a false doctrine, which declares them as the beloved, sacred and untouchable of God and then allows them to carry out free and without contradiction all their conspiracies and crimes. We will study later, how many other reforms, which the so-called liberals and progressive clergy plan, have no other purpose than to destroy the traditions of the church as sources of our teaching, in order to render easier the destructive plans of communism and of Jewish hunger for power.